Dramatis Personae for The String of Pearls by Unknown. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Dramatis Personae. Narrator. Read by Marianne Spiegel. Narrator. Read by Larry Wilson. Sweeney Todd. Read by Todd. Tobias Rag. Read by Asher Garavi. Mrs. Rag. Read by Beth Thomas. Mrs. Lovett. Read by Lynette Geisel. Jarvis Williams. Read by Carolyn Agee. Johanna. Read by Christine G. Arabella Wilmot. Read by Anna Foss. Mr. Oakley. Read by Jason in Panama. Mr. Oakley. Read by Patrick Seville. Mrs. Oakley. Read by C.J. Plogue. Ben. Read by Mike Harris. One Man. Read by Marianne. Mr. Grant. Read by Mark Crowell Groves. Sam, the Shop Boy. Read by Dylan McFarlane. Captain. Read by Newgate Novelist. Passenger. Read by Marianne. Colonel Jeffrey. Read by Sam Isaacson. The One. Read by Thomas Peter. The Boy, read by Sonia. Sir Richard, read by Anna. Mr. Fogg, read by Mike Harris. Watson, read by Brian Lorney. Dr. Popplejoy, read by Thomas Peter. Young Man, read by Marianne. Dilkey, read by Mike Harris. Mr. Lupin, read by Alan Winterout. Maiden, read by Lian Yao. Companion, read by Marianne. Lapidary, read by Lian Yao. Man, read by Marianne. A Fat Man, read by Nemo. Interrogator, read by Thomas Peter. The Another Man, read by Sam Isaacson. The One Man, read by Trisha G. The Other Man, read by Marianne. Passerby, read by Lydia. First Citizen, read by Sonia. Second Citizen, read by Thomas Peter. Third Citizen, read by Sonia. Fourth Citizen, read by Thomas Peter. Fifth Citizen, read by Newgate Novelist. Mr. Thornhill, read by Nemo. Captain Rathbone, read by Tricia G. Skinner, read by by Nemo. Stranger, read by Lian Yao. Another Stranger, read by Marianne. New Arrival, read by Lynette Geisel. John Mundell, read by Tricia G. Beadle, read by Charlotte Duckett. Beadle, read by Eva Davis. Mr. Batterwick, read by Marianne. Bishop, read by Newgate Novelist. Church Warden, read by Mike Harris. Porter, read by Newgate Novelist. Javery, read by Marianne. Doorkeeper, read by Joseph Tabler. Coachman, read by Joseph Tabler. The Voice, read by Lydia. Stranger, read by Marianne. Girl, read by Newgate Novelist. Mr. Crotchet, read by Nemo. Messenger, read by Lian Yao. Mr. Antrobus, read by Marianne. Mary, read by Sonia. Old Servant, read by Marianne. Mary's Mother, read by Vera Sticker. Mary's Father, read by Thomas Peter. Mary's Fiancé, read by Tricia G. Countryman, read by Lynette Garzel. Grazier, read by Marianne. Officer, read by Sonia. A lad, read by Lydia. One, read by Marianne. The other, read by Tricia G. Old Gentleman, read by Mike Harris. Lucy, read by Newgate Novelist. A lad, read by Newgate Novelist. Mrs. Rankley, read by Marianne. The Elder, read by Marianne. Young Man, read by Mike Harris. Gentleman, read by Lynette Geisel. 
A Customer, read by Newgate Novelist. End of Dramatis Personae. Chapter One of the String of Pearls by Unknown. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter One The Strange Customer at Sweeney Todd's. Before Fleet Street had reached its present importance, and when George the Third was young, and the two figures who used to strike the chimes on old St. Dunstan's church were in all their glory, being a great impediment to errand boys on their progress, and a matter of gaping curiosity to country people, there stood close to the sacred edifice a small barber's shop, which was kept by a man of the name of Sweeney Todd. How it was that he came by the name of Sweeney, as a Christian appellation, we are at a loss to conceive but such was his name as might be seen in extremely corpulent yellow letters over his shop window by any one who chose there to look for it barbers by that time in fleet street had not become fashionable and no more dreamt of calling themselves artists than of taking the tower by storm moreover they were not as they are now constantly slaughtering fine fat bears and yet somehow people had hair on their heads just the same as they have at present, without the aid of the unctuous auxiliary. Moreover, Sweeney Todd, in common with his brethren in those really primitive sorts of times, did not think it at all necessary to have any waxen effigies of humanity in his window. There was no languishing young lady, looking over the left shoulder, in order that a profusion of auburn tresses might repose upon her lily neck and great conquerors and great statesmen were not then as they are now held up to public ridicule with dabs of rouge upon their cheeks a quantity of gunpowder scattered in for a beard and some bristles sticking on end for eyebrows no sweeney todd was a barber of the old school and he never thought of glorifying himself on account of any extraneous circumstance if he had lived in henry the eighth's palace it would have been all the same to him as Henry the Eighth's dog kennel, and he would scarcely have believed human nature to be so green as to pay an extra sixpence to be shaven and shorn in any particular locality. A long pole painted white with red stripe curling spirally round it projected into the street from his doorway, and on one of the panes of glass in his window was presented the following couplet easy shaving for a penny as good as you will find any we do not put these lines forth as a specimen of poetry of the age they may have been the production of some young templar but if they were a little wanting in poetic fire that was amply made up by the clear and precise manner in which they set forth what they intended the barber himself was a long low-jointed ill-put-together sort of fellow with an immense mouth and such huge hands and feet that he was in his way quite a natural curiosity and what was more wonderful considering his trade there never was seen such a head of hair as sweeney todd's we know not what to compare it to probably it came nearest to what one might suppose to be the appearance of a thickest hedge in which a quantity of small wire had got entangled in truth it was a most terrific head of hair and as sweeney todd kept all his combs in it some said his scissors likewise when he put his head out of the shop door to see what sort of weather it was he might have been mistaken for some indian warrior with a very remarkable headdress he had a short disagreeable kind of unmirthful laugh which came in at all sorts of odd times when nobody else saw anything to laugh at at all and which sometimes made people start again especially when they were being shaved and sweeney todd would stop short in that operation to indulge in one of those cachinatory effusions it was evident that the remembrance of some very strange and out-of-the-way joke must occasionally flit across him and then he gave his hyena-like laugh 
but it was so short so sudden striking upon the ear for a moment and then gone that people have been known to look up to the ceiling and on the floor and all around them to know from whence it had come scarcely supposing it possible that it proceeded from mortal lips mr todd squinted a little to add to his charms and so we think that by this time the reader may in his mind's eye see the individual whom we wish to present to him some thought him a careless enough harmless fellow with not much sense in him and at times they almost considered he was a little cracked but there were others again who shook their heads when they spoke of him and while they could say nothing to his prejudice except that they certainly considered he was odd yet when they came to consider what a great crime and misdemeanor it really is in this world to be odd we shall not be surprised at the ill odor in which sweeney todd was held but for all that he did a most thriving business and was considered by his neighbors to be a very well-to-do sort of man and decidedly in city phraseology warm it was so handy for the young students in the temple to pop over to sweeney todd's to get their chins new rasped so that from morning to night he drove a good business and was evidently a thriving man there was only one thing that seemed in any way to detract from the great prudence of sweeney todd's character and that was that he rented a large house of which he occupied nothing but the shop and parlor leaving the upper part entirely useless and obstinately refusing to let it on any terms whatever such was the state of things a d seventeen eighty five as regarded sweeney todd the day is drawing to a close and a small drizzling kind of rain is falling so that there are not many passengers in the streets and sweeney todd is sitting in his shop looking keenly in the face of a boy who stands in an attitude of trembling subjection before him you will remember said sweeney todd and he gave his countenance a most horrible twist as he spoke you will remember tobias Wragg, that you are now my apprentice that you have of me had board washing and lodging with the exception that you don't sleep here that you take your meals at home and that your mother mrs Wragg, does your washing which she may very well do being a laundress in the temple and making no end of money as for lodging you lodge here you know very comfortably in the shop all day now are you not a happy dog yes sir said the boy timidly you will acquire a first-rate profession and quite as good as the law which your mother tells me she would have put you to only that a little weakness of the headpiece unqualified you and now tobias listen to me and treasure up every word i say yes sir i'll cut your throat from ear to ear if you repeat one word of what passes in this shop or dare to make any supposition or draw any conclusion from anything you may see or hear or fancy you see or hear now you understand me i'll cut your throat from ear to ear do you understand me yes sir i won't say nothing i wish sir as maybe i made into veal pies at lovett's and bell yard if i's as much as says a word sweeney todd rose from his seat and opening his huge mouth he looked at the boy for a minute or two in silence as if he fully intended swallowing him but had not quite made up his mind where to begin very good he said at length i am satisfied i am quite satisfied and mark me the shop and the shop only is your place yes sir and if any customer gives you a penny you can keep it so that if you get enough of them you will become a rich man only i will take care of them for you and when i think you want them i will let you have them run out and see what's o'clock by st dunstan's there was a small crowd collected opposite the church for the figures were about to strike three quarters past six and among that crowd was one man who gazed with as much curiosity as anybody at the exhibition now for it he said they are going to begin 
Well, that is ingenious. Look at the fellow lifting up his club. And down it comes bang upon the old bell. The three quarters were struck by the figures, and then the people who had loitered to see it done, many of whom had day by day looked at the same exhibition for years past, walked away with the exception of the man who seemed so deeply interested. He remained, and crouching at his feet was a noble-looking dog, who looked likewise up at the figures, and who, observing his master's attention to be closely fixed upon them, endeavored to show as great an appearance of interest as he possibly could. "'What do you think of that, Hector?' said the man. The dog gave a short low whine, and then his master proceeded. "'There is a barber's shop opposite. So before I go any farther, as I have got to see the ladies, although it's on a very melancholy errand, for I have to go tell them that poor Mark Ingestry is no more, and heaven knows what poor Johanna will say, I think I should know her by his description of her, poor fellow. It grieves me to think now how he used to talk about her in the long night watches, when all was still, and not a breath of air touched a curl upon his cheek. I could almost think I saw her sometimes, as he used to tell me of her soft beaming eyes, her little gentle pouting lips, and the dimples that played about her mouth. Well, well, it's of no use grieving. He is dead and gone, poor fellow, and the salt water washes over as brave a heart as ever beat. His sweetheart, Johanna, though, shall have the string of pearls for all that, and if she cannot be Mark Ingestry's wife in this world, she shall be rich and happy, poor young thing, while she stays in it, that is to say, as happy as she can be. And she must just look forward to meeting him aloft, where there are no squalls or tempests. And so I'll go and get shaved at once. He crossed the road towards Sweeney Todd's shop, and stepping down the low doorway, he stood face to face with the odd-looking barber. The dog gave a low growl and sniffed the air. Why, Hector, said his master, what's the matter down sir down i have a mortal fear of dogs said sweeney todd would you mind him sir sitting outside the door and waiting for you if it's all the same only look at him he is going to fly at me then you are the first person he ever touched without provocation said the man but i suppose he don't like your looks and i must confess i ain't much surprised at that I have seen a few rum-looking guys in my time, but hang me if I ever saw such a figurehead as yours. What the devil noise was that? It was only me, said Sweeney Todd. I laughed. Laughed? Do you call that a laugh? I suppose you caught it of somebody who died of it. If that's your way of laughing, I beg you won't do it any more. Stop the dog! Stop the dog! I can't have dogs running into my back parlor. Here, Hector, here, cried his master. Get out. Most unwillingly, the dog left the shop and crouched down close to the outer door, which the barber took care to close, muttering something about a draft of air coming in, and then turning to the apprentice boy who was screwed up in a corner, he said, Tobias, my lad, go to Leadenhall Street and bring a small bag of the thick biscuits from Mr. Peterson's. Say they are from me. Now, sir, I suppose you want to be shaved, and it is well you have come here, for there ain't a shaving shop, though I say it, in the city of London that ever thinks of polishing anybody off as I do. I tell you what it is, Master Barber. If you come that laugh again, I will get up and go. I don't like it, and there is an end of it. Very good, said Sweeney Todd as he mixed up a lather. Who are you? Where did you come from? And where are you going? That's cool, at all events. Damn it. What do you mean by putting the brush in my mouth? Now, don't laugh. And since you are so fond of asking questions, just answer me one. Oh, yes, of course. What is it, sir? Do you know a Mr. Oakley? 
who lives somewhere in London, and is a spectacle-maker. Yes, to be sure I do. John Oakley, the spectacle-maker in Four Street. And he has got a daughter named Johanna, that the young bloods call the flower of Four Street. Ah, poor thing. Do they? Now confound you, what are you laughing at now? What do you mean by it? Didn't you say, ah, poor thing? Just turn your head a little on one side. That will do. You have been to sea, sir? Yes, I have, and have only now lately come up the river from an Indian voyage. Indeed. Where can my strop be? I had it this minute. I must have laid it down somewhere. What an odd thing that I can't see it. It's very extraordinary. What can have become of it? Oh, I recollect. I took it into the parlor. Sit still, sir. I shall not be gone a moment. Sit still, sir, if you please. By the by, you can amuse yourself with a courier, sir, for a moment. Sweeney Todd walked into the back parlor and closed the door. There was a strange sound suddenly compounded of a rushing noise and then a heavy blow, immediately after which Sweeney Todd emerged from his parlor, and, folding his arms, he looked upon the vacant chair where his customer had been seated. But the customer was gone, leaving not the slightest trace of his presence behind, except his hat, and that Sweeney Todd immediately seized and thrust into a cupboard that was at one corner of the shop. "'What's that?' he said. "'What's that? I thought I heard a noise.' The door was slowly opened, and Tobias made his appearance, saying, "'If you please, sir, I forgot the money, and have run all the way back from St. Paul's churchyard.' In two strides, Todd reached him, and clutching him by the arm, he dragged him into the farthest corner of the shop, and then stood opposite to him, glaring in his face with such a demonic expression that the boy was frightfully terrified. "'Speak!' cried Todd. "'Speak, and speak the truth, or your last hour is come. How long were you peeping through the door before you came in?' "'Peeping, sir.' "'Yes, peeping. Don't repeat my words, but answer me at once. You will find it better for you in the end.' I wasn't peeping, sir, at all. Sweeney Todd drew a long breath, as he then said, in a strange, shrieking sort of manner, which he intended no doubt to be jocose. Well, well, very well. If you did peep, what then? It's no matter. I only wanted to know, that's all. It was quite a joke, wasn't it? Quite funny, though rather odd, eh? Why don't you laugh, you dog? Come, now. There is no harm done. Tell me what you thought about it at once, and we will be merry over it. Very merry. I don't know what you mean, sir, said the boy, who was quite as much alarmed at Mr. Todd's mirth as he was at his anger. I don't know what you mean, sir. I only just come back because I hadn't any money to pay for the biscuits at Peterson's. I mean nothing at all, said Todd, suddenly turning upon his heel. What's that scratching at the door? Tobias opened the shop door, and there stood the dog, who looked wistfully round the place, and then gave a howl that seriously alarmed the barber. "'It's the gentleman's dog, sir,' said Tobias. "'It's the gentleman's dog, sir, that was looking at old St. Dustin's clock, and came in here to be shaved. It's funny, ain't it, sir, that the dog didn't go away with his master?' "'Why don't you laugh if it's funny? Turn out the dog, Tobias. We'll have no dogs here.' I hate the sight of them. Turn him out. Turn him out. I would, sir, in a minute, but I'm afraid he wouldn't let me somehow. Only look, sir, look. See what he is at now? Did you ever see such a violent fellow, sir? Why, he will have down the cupboard door. Stop him! Stop him! The devil is in the animal! Stop him, I say! The dog was certainly getting the door open when Sweeney Todd rushed forward to stop him. But that he was soon admonished of the danger of doing, for the dog gave him a grip of the leg, which made him give such a howl that he precipitately retreated and left the animal to do its pleasure. This consisted in forcing open the cupboard door and seizing upon the hat which Sweeney Todd had thrust therein and dashing out of the shop with it in triumph. The devil's in the beast, muttered Todd. He's off. Tobias? You said you saw the man who owned that fiend of a cur looking at St. Dunstan's church. Yes, sir. I did see him there. 
if you recollect, you sent me to see the time, and the figures were just going to strike three quarters past six, and before I came away, I heard him say that Mark and Jestria was dead, and Joanna should have the string of pearls. Then I came in, and then, if you recollect, sir, he came in, and the odd thing you know, to me, sir, is that he didn't take his dog with him, because, you know, sir? Because what? shouted Todd. Because people generally do take their dogs with them. You know, sir, and may I be made into one of Lovett's pies if I don't? Hush! Someone comes. That's old Mr. Grant from the temple. How do you do, Mr. Grant? Glad to see you looking so well, sir. It does one's heart good to see a gentleman of your years looking so fresh and hearty. Sit down, sir. A little this way, if you please. Shaved, I suppose? Yes, Todd, yes. Any news? No, sir, nothing stirring. Everything very quiet, sir, except the high wind. They say it blew the king's hat off yesterday, sir, and he borrowed Lord North's. Trade is dull, too, sir. I suppose people won't come out to be cleaned and dressed in a mizzling rain. We haven't had anybody in the shop for an hour and a half. Lo, sir, said Tobias. You forgot the seafaring gentleman with the dog, you know, sir. Ah, so I do, said Todd. He went away, and I saw him get into some disturbance, I think, just at the corner of the market. I wonder I didn't meet him, sir, said Tobias. For I came that way, and then it's so very odd leaving his dog behind him. Yes, very, said Todd. Will you excuse me for a moment, Mr. Grant? Tobias, my lad, I just want you to lend me a hand in the parlor. Tobias followed Todd very unsuspectingly into the parlor. But when they got there and the door was closed, the barber sprang upon him like an enraged tiger, and grappling him by the throat he gave his head such a succession of knocks against the wainscot that Mr. Grant must have thought that some carpenter was at work. Then he tore a handful of his hair out, after which he twisted him round and dealt him such a kick that he was flung sprawling into a corner of the room, and then, without a word, the barber walked out again to his customer, and he bolted his parlor door on the outside, leaving Tobias to digest the usage he had received at his leisure, and in the best way he could. When he came back to Mr. Grant, he apologized for keeping him waiting by saying, it became necessary, sir, to teach my new apprentice a little bit of his business. I have left him studying it now. There is nothing like teaching young folks at once. Ah, said Mr. Grant with a sigh. I know what it is to let young folks grow wild, for although I have neither chick nor child of my own, I had a sister's son to look to, a handsome, wild, harem-scarum sort of fellow, as like me as one pea is like another. I tried to make a lawyer of him, but it wouldn't do, and it's now more than two years ago he left me altogether, and yet there were some good traits about Mark. Mark, sir. Did you say Mark? Yes, that was his name. Mark Ingstree. God knows what's become of him. Oh, said Sweeney Todd, and he went on lathering the chin of Mr. Grant. End of chapter one. Chapter Two of the String of Pearls by Unknown. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter Two The Spectacle Maker's Daughter. Joanna, Joanna, my dear, do you know what time it is? Joanna, I say, my dear, are you going to get up? Here's your mother has trotted out to Parson Lupin's, and you know I have to go to Alderman Judd's house in Cripplegate the first thing, and I haven't had a morsel of breakfast yet. Joanna, my dear, do you hear me? These observations were made by Mr. Oakley, the spectacle-maker, at the door of his daughter Johanna's chamber, on the morning after the events we have just recorded at Sweeney Todd's. And presently a soft, sweet voice answered him, saying, I'm coming, father. I'm coming. In a moment, in a moment, father, I shall be down. 
Don't hurry yourself, my darling, I can wait. The little old spectacle maker descended the staircase again and sat down in the parlor at the back of the shop, where in a few moments he was joined by Johanna, his only and much loved child. She was indeed a creature of the rarest grace and beauty. Her age was eighteen, but she looked rather younger, and upon her face she had that sweetness and intelligence of expression which almost bids defiance to the march of time. Her hair was of a glossy blackness, and what was rare in conjunction with such a feature, her eyes were a deep and heavenly blue. There was nothing of the commanding or of the severe style of beauty about her, but the expression of her face was all grace and sweetness. It was one of those countenances which one could look at for a long summer's day, as upon the pages of some deeply interesting volume, which furnished the most abundant food for pleasant and delightful reflection. There was a touch of sadness about her voice, which perhaps only tended to make it more musical, although mournfully so, and which seemed to indicate that at the bottom of her heart there lay some grief which had not yet been spoken, some cherished aspiration of her pure soul, which looked hopeless as regards completion, some remembrance of a former joy which had been turned to bitterness and grief. It was the cloud in the sunny sky, the shadow through which there still gleamed bright and beautiful sunshine, but which still proclaimed its presence. I have kept you waiting, father, she said as she flung her arms about the old man's neck. I have kept you waiting. Never mind, my dear, never mind. Your mother is so taken up with Mr. Lupin that, you know, this being Wednesday morning, she is off to his prayer meeting, and so I have had no breakfast, and really I think I must discharge Sam. Indeed, father? What has he done? Nothing at all, and that's the very reason. I had to take down the shutters myself this morning, and what do you think for? He had the coolness to tell me that he couldn't take down the shutter this morning, or sweep out the shop, because his aunt had the toothache. A poor excuse, father, said Johanna as she bustled about and got the breakfast ready. A very poor excuse. Poor indeed, but his month is up today, and I must get rid of him. But I suppose I shall have no end of bother with your mother, because his aunt belongs to Mr. Lupin's congregation. But as sure as this is the twentieth day of August... It is the twentieth day of August, said Johanna as she sank into a chair and burst into tears. <laughs> it is! It is! I thought I could have controlled this, but I cannot, father, I cannot. It was that which made me late. I knew mother was out. I knew that I ought to be down and attending upon you. And I was praying to heaven for strength to do so, because this was the 20th of August. Johanna spoke these words incoherently and amid sobs, and when she had finished them she leant her sweet face upon her small hands and wept like a child. The astonishment not unmingled with positive dismay of the old spectacle-maker was vividly depicted on his countenance, and for some minutes he sat perfectly aghast, with his hands resting on his knees and looking in the face of his beautiful child, that is to say as much as he could see of it between those little taper fingers that were spread upon it, as if he were newly awakened from some dream. "'Good God, Joanna!' he said at length. "'What is this, my dear child, what has happened? Tell me, my dear, unless you wish to kill me with grief.' "'You shall know, father,' she said. "'I did not think to say a word about it, but considered I had strength enough of mind to keep my sorrows in my own breast. But the effort has been too much for me, and I have been compelled to yield. If you had not looked so kindly on me, if I did not know that you loved me as you do, I should easily have kept my secret. But knowing that much, I cannot.' "'My darling,' said the old man, "'you are right there. I do love you. What would the world be to me now without you? There was a time, twenty years ago, when your mother made up much of my happiness, but of late, what with Mr. Lupin, and psalm-singing, and tea-drinking, I see very little of her, and what little I do see is not very satisfactory. 
Tell me, my darling, what is it that vexes you, and I'll soon put it to rights. I don't belong to the city train bands for nothing. Father, I know that your affection would do all for me that is possible to do. But you cannot recall the dead to life. And if this day passes over and I see him not, or hear not from him, I know that, instead of finding a home for me whom he loved, he has an effort to do so, found a grave for himself. He said he would. He said he would. Here she wrung her hands and wept again, with such a bitterness of anguish that the old spectacle-maker was at his wit's end, and knew not what on earth to do or say. My dear, my dear! He cried. Who is he? I hope you don't mean... Hush, father, hush! I know the name that is hovering on your lips, but something seems even now to whisper to me he is no more. And, being so, speak nothing of him, father, but that which is good. You mean Mark Industry. I do, and if he had a thousand faults, he at least loved me. He loved me truly and most sincerely. My dear, said the old spectacle-maker, you know that I wouldn't for all the world say anything to vex you, nor will I, but tell me what it is that makes this day more than any other so gloomy to you. I will, father. You shall hear. It was on this day two years ago that we last met. It was in the Temple Gardens, and he had just had a stormy interview with his uncle, Mr. Grant, and you will understand, father, that Mark Ingestry was not to blame, because— Well, well, my dear, you needn't say anything more upon that point. Girls very seldom admit their lovers are to blame, but there are two ways, you know, Joanna, of telling a story. Yes, but, father, why should Mr. Grant seek to force him to the study of a profession he disliked? My dear, one would have thought that if Mark Industry really loved you and found that he might make you his wife and acquire an honourable substance for both you and himself, it seems a very wonderful thing to me that he did not do so. You see, my dear, he should have liked you well enough to do something else that he did not like. Yes, but, father, you know it is hard, when disagreements once arise, for a young ardent spirit to give in entirely. And so from one word, poor Mark, in his dispute with his uncle, got to another, when perhaps one touch of kindness or conciliation from Mr. Grant would have made him quite blind in his hands. Yes, that's the way, said Mr. Oakley. There is no end of excuses. But go on, my dear, go on, and tell me exactly how this affair now stands. I will, father. It was this day two years ago that we met, and he told me that he and his uncle had at last quarrelled irreconcilably, and that nothing could possibly now patch up the difference between them. We had a long talk. Ah, no doubt of that. And at length he told me that he must go and seek his fortune, that fortune which he hoped to share with me. He said that he had an opportunity of undertaking a voyage to India, and that if he was successful, he should have sufficient to return with and commence some pursuit in London, more congenial to his thoughts and habits than the law. Ah, oh, well, what next? He told me that he loved me. And you believed him? Father, you would have believed him had you heard him speak. His tones were those of such deep sincerities that no actor that ever charmed an audience with an unreal existence could have matched them. There are times and seasons when we know that we are listening to the majestic voice of truth, and there are tones which sink at once into the heart, carrying with them a conviction of their sincerity, which neither time nor circumstance can alter. And such were the tones in which Mark Ingestry spoke to me. And so you suppose, Joanna, that it is easy for a young man who has not patience or energy enough to be respectable at home to go abroad and make his fortune? Is idleness so much in request in other countries that it receives such a rich reward, my dear? You judge him harshly, father. You do not know him. Heaven forbid that I should judge anyone harshly. <laughs> and I will freely admit that you may know more of his real character than I can, who, of course, have only seen its surface. But go on, my dear, and tell me all. We made an agreement, father, that on that day, two years, he was to come to me, or send me some news of his whereabouts. If I heard nothing of him, I was to conclude he was no more, and I cannot help so concluding now. But the day has not yet passed. I know it has not, 
and yet i rest upon but a slender hope father do you believe that dreams ever really shadow forthcoming events i cannot say my child i am not disposed to yield credence to any supposed fact because i have dreamt it but i confess to having heard some strange instances where these visions of the night have come strictly true heaven knows but this may be one of them i had a dream last night i thought that i was sitting upon the seashore and that all before me was nothing but a fathomless waste of waters i heard the roar and the dash of the waves distinctly and each moment the wind grew more furious and fierce and i saw in the distance a ship it was battling with the waves which at one moment lifted it mountains high and at another plunged it far down into such an abyss that not a vestige of it could be seen but the topmost spars of the tall masts and still the storm increased each moment in its fury and ever and anon there came a strange sullen sound across the waters and i saw a flash of fire and knew that those in the ill-fated vessel were thus endeavouring to attract attention and some friendly aid father from the first to the last i knew that mark ingestry was there my heart told me so i was certain he was there and i was helpless utterly helpless utterly and entirely unable to lend the slightest aid i could only gaze upon what was going forward as a silent and terrified spectator of the scene and at last i heard a cry come over the deep a strange loud wailing cry which proclaimed to me the fate of the vessel i saw its masts shiver for a moment in the blackened air and then all was still for a few seconds until there arose a strange wild shriek that i knew was the despairing cry of those who sank never to rise again in that vessel oh that was a frightful sound it was a sound to linger on the airs and haunt the memory of sleep it was a sound never to be forgotten when once heard but such as might again and again be remembered with horror and affright and all this was in your dream it was father it was and you were helpless i was utterly and entirely helpless it was very sad it was as you shall hear the ship went down and that cry that i had heard was the last despairing one given by those who clung to the wreck with scarce a hope and yet because it was their only refuge for where else are they to look for the smallest ray of consolation where else save in the surging waters were they to hunt for safety nowhere all was lost all was despair i tried to scream i tried to cry aloud to heaven to have mercy upon those brave and gallant souls who had trusted their dearest possession life itself to the mercy of the deep and while i so tried to render the inefficient succour i saw a small speck in the sea and my straining eyes perceived that it was a man floating and clinging to a piece of the wreck and i knew it was mark ingestry but my dear surely you are not annoyed at a dream it saddened me i stretched out my arms to save him i heard him pronounce my name and call upon me for help it was all in vain he baffled with the waves as long as human nature could baffle with them he could do no more and i saw him disappear before my anxious eyes don't say you saw him my dear say you fancy you saw him it was such a fancy as i shall not lose the remembrance of for many a day well well after all my dear it's only a dream and it seems to me without at all adverting to anything that should give you pain as regards mark industry that you made a very foolish bargain for only consider how many difficulties might arise in the way of his keeping faith with you you know i have your happiness so much at heart that if mark had been a worthy man and an industrious one i should not have opposed myself to your union but believe me my dear joanna that a young man with great facilities for spending money and none whatever for earning any is just about the worst husband you could choose and such a man was mark industry but come we will say nothing of this to your mother let the secret if we may call it such rest with me and if you can inform me in what capacity and in what vessel he left england i will not carry my prejudice so far against him as to hesitate about making what enquiry i can concerning his fate i know nothing more father we parted and never met again well well dry your eyes joanna and as i go to alderman judd's i'll think over the matter which after all may not be so bad as you think 
the lad is a good enough looking lad and has i believe a good ability if he would put it to some useful purpose but if he goes scampering about the world in an unsettled manner you are well rid of him and as for his being dead you must not conclude that by any means for somehow or another like a bad penny these fellows always come back there was more consolation in the kindly tone of the spectacle maker than in the words he used but upon the whole johanna was well enough pleased that she had communicated the secret to her father for now at all events she had someone to whom she could mention the name of mark ingestry without the necessity of concealing the sentiment with which she did so and when her father had gone she felt that by the mere relation of it to him some of the terrors of her dream had vanished she sat for some time in a pleasing reverie till she was interrupted by sam the shop-boy who came into the parlour and said please miss joanna suppose i was to go down to the docks and try and find out for you mr park industry i say suppose i was to do that i heard it all and if i do find him i'll soon settle him what do you mean i means that i won't stand it didn't i tell you more than three weeks ago as you was the object of my affections didn't i tell you that when my aunt died i should come in for the soap and candle business and make you my missus the only reply which johanna gave to this was to rise and leave the room for her heart was too full of grief and sad speculation to enable her to do now as she had often been in the habit of doing that is laugh at sam's protestations of affection so he was left to chew the cud of sweet and bitter fancy by himself a thousand dams said he when he entered the shop i always suspected there was some other fellow and now i know it i am ready to gnaw my head off that ever i consented to come here confound him i hope he is at the bottom of the sea and eat up by this time oh i should like to smash everybody if i had my way now i'd just walk into society at large as they calls it and let it know what one two three slap in the eye is and down it would go mr sam in his rage did upset a case of spectacles which went down with a tremendous crash and which however good in imitation of the manner in which society at large was to be knocked down was not likely to be at all pleasing to mr oakley i have done it now he said but never mind i'll try the old dodge whenever i break anything that is i'll place it in old oakley's way and swear he did it i never knew such an old goose you may persuade him into anything the idea now of his pulling down all the shutters this morning because i told him my aunt had the toothache that was a go to be sure but i'll be revenged of that fellow who has took away i consider joanna from me i let him know what a blighted heart is capable of he won't live long enough to want a pair of spectacles i'll be bound or else my name ain't sam bolt end of chapter two Chapter Three of *The String of Pearls* by Unknown. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter Three, The Dog and the Hat. The earliest dawn of morning was glistening upon the masts, the cordage, and the sails of a fleet of vessels lying below Sheerness. The crews were rousing themselves from their night's repose and to make their appearance on the decks of the vessels from which the night watch had just been relieved. A man-of-war, which had been the convoy of the fleet of merchantmen through the charnel, fired a gun as the first glimpse of the morning sun fell upon the tapering mass. Then from a battery in the neighborhood came another booming report, and that was answered by another farther off, and then another, until the whole chain of batteries that girded the coast, for it was a time of war, had proclaimed the dawn of another day. The effect was very fine in the stillness of the early morn, of these successions of reports, and as they died away in the distance like mimic thunder, some order was given on board the man of war, and, in a moment, the masts and cordage seemed perfectly alive with human beings clinging to them in various directions. Then, as if by magic, or as if the ship had been a living thing itself, and had possessed wings, which, at the mere instigation of a wish, could be spread far and wide, there fluttered out such sheets of canvas as was wonderful to see, and, 
as they caught the morning light and the ship moved from the slight breeze that sprang up from the shore she looked indeed as if she walked the waters like a thing of life the various crews of the merchantmen stood upon the decks of their respective vessels gazing after the ship of war as she proceeded upon another mission similar to the one she had just performed in protecting the commerce of the country as she passed one vessel which had been in point of fact actually rescued from the enemy the crew who had been saved from a foreign prison cheered lustily there wanted but such an impulse as this and then every merchant vessel that the man-of-war passed took up the gladsome shout and the crew of the huge vessel were not slow in their answer for three deafening cheers such as had frequently struck terror into the hearts of england's enemies awakened many an echo from the shore it was a proud and a delightful sight such a sight as none but an englishman can thoroughly enjoy to see the vessel so proudly stemming the waste of waters we say none but an englishman can enjoy it because no other nation has ever attempted to achieve a great maritime existence without being most signally defeated and leaving us still as we shall ever be masters of the seas these proceedings were amply sufficient to arouse the crews of all the vessels and over the taffrail of one in particular a large-sized merchantman which had been trading in the indian seas two men were leaning one of them was the captain of the vessel and the other a passenger who intended leaving that morning they were engaged in earnest conversation and the captain as he shaded his eyes with his hand and looked along the surface of the water said in reply to some observation from his companion i'll order my boat the moment lieutenant thornhill comes on board i call him lieutenant although i have no right to do so because he has held that rank in the king's service but when quite a young man was cashiered for fighting a duel with his superior officer the service has lost a good officer said the other it has indeed a braver man never stepped nor a better officer but you see they have certain rules in the service and everything is sacrificed to maintain them i can't think what keeps him he went last night and said he would pull up to the temple stairs because he wanted to call upon somebody by the water-side and after that he was going to the city to transact some business of his own and that would have brought him nearer there you see and there are plenty of things coming down the river he's coming cried the other don't be impatient you will see him in a few minutes what makes you think that because i see his dog there don't you see swimming in the water and coming direct towards the ship i cannot imagine i can see the dog certainly but i can't see thornhill nor is there any boat at hand i know not what to make of it do you know my mind misgives me that something has happened amiss the dog seems exhausted lend a hand there to mr thornhill's dog some of you why it's a hat he has in his mouth the dog made towards the vessel but without the assistance of the seamen with the whole of whom he was an immense favourite he certainly could not have boarded the vessel and when he reached the deck he sank down upon it in a state of complete exhaustion with the hat still in his grasp as the animal lay panting upon the deck the sailors looked at each other in amazement there was but one opinion among them all now and that was that something very serious had unquestionably happened to mr thornhill i dread said the captain an explanation of this occurrence what on earth can it mean that's thornhill's hat and here is hector give the dog some drink and meat directly he seems thoroughly exhausted the dog ate sparingly of some food that was put before him and then seizing the hat again in his mouth he stood by the side of the ship and howled piteously then he put down the hat for a moment and walking up to the captain he pulled him by the skirt of the coat you understand him said the captain to the passenger something has happened to thornhill i'll be bound and you see the object of the dog is to get me to follow him to see what it's about I think you so it is a warning if it be such at all that i should not be inclined to neglect and if you will follow the dog i will accompany you there may be more in it than we think of and we ought not to allow mr thornhill to be in any want of any assistance that we can render him when we consider what great assistance he has been to us look how anxious the poor beast is the captain ordered a boat to be launched at once and manned by four stout rowers he then sprang into it followed by the passenger who was colonel jeffrey of the indian army 
and the dog immediately followed them, testifying by his manner great pleasure at the expedition they were undertaking, and carrying the hat with him, which he evidently showed an immense disinclination to part with. The captain ordered the boat to proceed up the river towards the temple stairs, where Hector's master had expressed his intention of proceeding, and, when the faithful animal saw the direction in which they were going, he lay down in the bottom of the boat perfectly satisfied, and gave himself up to that repose of which he was evidently so much in need. It cannot be said that Colonel Jeffrey suspected that anything of a very serious nature had happened. Indeed, their principal anticipation, when they came to talk it over, consisted of the probability that Thornhill had, with an impetuosity of character they knew very well he possessed, interfered to redress what he considered some street grievance, and had got himself into the custody of the civil power in consequence. "'Of course,' said the captain. "'Master Hector would view that as a very serious affair, and finding himself denied access to his master, see he has come off to us, which was certainly the most prudent thing he could do, and I should not be at all surprised if he takes us to the door of some watch-house, where we shall find our friend snug enough. The tide was running up, and that Thornhill had not saved the turn of it, by dropping down earlier to the vessel, was one of the things that surprised the captain. However, they got up quickly, and as at that hour there was not much on the river to impede their progress, and as at that time the Thames was not a thoroughfare for little stinking steamboats, they soon reached the ancient temple stairs. The dog, who had until then seemed to be asleep, suddenly sprung up, and, seizing the hat again in his mouth, rushed again on shore, and was closely followed by the captain and colonel. He led them through the temple with great rapidity, perusing with admirable tact the precise path his master had taken towards the entrance to the temple in Fleet Street, opposite Chancery Lane. Darting across the road then, he stopped with a low growl at the shop of Sweeney Todd, a proceeding which very much surprised those who followed him, and caused them to pause to hold a consultation ere they proceeded further. While this was proceeding, Todd suddenly opened the door, and aimed a blow at the dog with an iron bar, but the latter dexterously avoided it, and, but that the door was suddenly closed again, he would have made Sweeney Todd regret such an interference. "'We must inquire into this,' said the captain. "'There seems to be mutual ill-will between that man and the dog.' They both tried to enter the barber's shop, but it was fast on the inside, and after repeated knockings, Todd called from within, saying, "'I won't open the door while that dog is there. He is mad, or has a spite against me. I don't know or care which. It's a fact. That's all I'm aware of.' "'I will undertake,' said the captain, "'that the dog shall do you no harm. But open the door, for in we must come, and will.' "'I will take your promise,' said Sweeney Todd. "'But mind you keep it, or I shall protect myself and take the creature's life. "'So, if you value it, you would better hold it fast.' "'The captain pacified Hector as well as he could, "'and likewise tied one end of a silk handkerchief round his neck "'and held the other firmly in his grasp, "'after which Todd, who seemed to have some means from within "'of seeing what was going on, opened his door and admitted his visitors. "'Well, gentlemen, shaved or cut?' or dressed. I am at your service. Which shall I begin with? The dog never took his eye off Todd, but kept up a low growl from the first moment of his entrance. It's rather a remarkable circumstance, said the captain. But this is a very sagacious dog, you see, and he belongs to a friend of ours, who has most unaccountably disappeared. Has he, really? said Todd. Tobias! Tobias! Yes, sir. Run to Mr. Phillips, in Cadeton Street, and get me a sixpenny worth of preserved figs. And don't say that I don't give you the money this time when you go on a message. I think I did it before, but you swallowed it. And when you come back, just remember the insight into business I gave you yesterday. Yes, said the boy, with a shudder, for he had a great horror of Sweeney Todd, as well he might, after the severe discipline he had received at his hands, and away he went. "'Well, gentlemen,' said Todd, "'what is it you require of me?' "'We want to know if anyone having the appearance of an officer in the Navy came to your house?' "'Yes, a rather good-looking man, weather-beaten, with a bright blue eye, 
and rather fair hair yes yes the same oh to be sure he came here and i shaved him and polished him off what do you mean by polishing him off brushing him up a bit and making him tidy he said he had got somewhere to go in the city and asked me the address of a mr oakley a spectacle maker i gave it him and then he went away but as i was standing at my door about five minutes afterwards it seemed to me as well as i could see the distance that he got into some row near the market did this dog come with him a dog came with him but whether it was that dog or not i don't know and that's all you know of him you never spoke a truer word in your life said sweeney todd as he diligently stropped a razor upon his great horny hand this seemed something like a complete fix and the captain looked at colonel jeffrey and the colonel at the captain for some moments in complete silence at length the latter said it's a very extraordinary thing that the dog should come here if he missed his master somewhere else i never heard of such a thing nor i either said todd it is extraordinary so extraordinary that if i had not seen it i would not have believed i dare say you will find him in the next watch-house the dog had watched the countenance of all parties during this brief dialogue and twice or thrice he had interrupted it by a strange howling cry i'll tell you what it is said the barber if that beast stays here i'll be the death of him i hate dogs detest them and as i tell you as i told you before if you value him at all keep him away from me you say you directed the person you described to us where to find a spectacle maker named oakley we happen to know that he was going in search of such a person and as he had property of value about him we will go there and ascertain if he reached his destination it is in the fourth street a little shop with two windows you cannot miss it the dog when he saw that they were about to leave grew furious and it was with the greatest difficulty they succeeded by main force in getting him out of the shop and dragging him some short distance with them but then he contrived to get free of the handkerchief that held him and darting back he sat down at sweeney todd's door howling most piteously they had no resource but to leave him intending fully to call as they came back from mr oakley's and as they looked behind them they saw that hector was collecting a crowd round the barber's door and it was a singular thing to see a number of persons surrounding the dog while he to all appearance appeared to be actually making efforts to explain something to the assemblage they walked on until they reached the spectacle makers and there they paused for they all of a sudden recollected that the mission that mr thornhill had to execute there was of a very delicate nature and one by no means to be lightly executed or even so much as mentioned probably in the hearing of mr oakley himself we must not be so hasty said the colonel but what am i to do i sail to-night at least i have got to go round to liverpool with my vessel do not then call at mr oakley's at all at present but leave me to ascertain the fact quietly and secretly my anxiety for thornhill will scarcely permit me to do so but i suppose i must and if you write me a letter to the royal oak hotel at liverpool it will be sure to reach me that is to say unless you find mr thornhill himself in which case i need not by any means give you so much trouble you may depend upon me my friendship for mr thornhill and gratitude as you know for the great service he has rendered to us all will induce me to do my utmost to discover him and but that i know he set his heart upon performing the message he had to deliver accurately and well i should recommend that we at once go into this house of mr oakley's only that the fear of compromising the young lady who is in this case and who will have quite enough to bear poor thing of her own grief restrains me after some more conversation of a similar nature they decided that this should be the plan adopted they made an unavailing call at the watch-house of the district being informed that no such person nor any one answering to the description of mr thornhill had been engaged in any disturbance or apprehended by any of the constables and this only involved the thing in greater mystery than ever so they went back to try and recover the dog but that was a matter easier to be desired and determined upon than executed for threats and persuasions were alike ineffectual hector would not stir an inch from the barber's door there he sat with the hat by his side a most melancholy and strange-looking spectacle 
and a most efficient guard was he for that hat, and it was evident that while he chose to exhibit the formidable row of teeth he did occasionally, when anybody showed a disposition to touch it, it would remain sacred. Some people, too, had thrown a few copper coins into the hat, so that Hector, if his mind had been that way inclined, was making a very good thing of it. But who shall describe the anger of Sweeney Todd when he found that he was likely to be so beleaguered? He doubted if, upon the arrival of the first customer to his shop, the dog might dart in and take him by storm, but that apprehension went off at last, when a young gallant came from the temple to have his hair dressed, and the dog allowed him to pass in and out unmolested, without making any attempt to follow him. This was something, at all events, but whether or not it ensured Sweeney Todd's personal safety when he should himself come out was quite another matter. It was an experiment, however, which he must try. It was quite out of the question that he should remain a prisoner much longer in his own place, so, after a time, he thought he might try the experiment, and that it would be best done when there were plenty of people there, because, if the dog assaulted him, he would have an excuse for any amount of violence he might think proper to use upon the occasion. It took some time, however, to screw his courage to the sticking place, but, at length, muttering deep curses between his clenched teeth, he made his way to the door, and carried in his hand a long knife, which he thought a more efficient weapon against the dog's teeth than the iron bludgeon he had formerly used. "'I hope he will attack me,' said Todd to himself, as he thought. But Tobias, who had come back from the place where they sold the preserved figs, heard him, and, after devoutly in his own mind wishing that the dog would actually devour Sweeney, said aloud, "'Oh, dear, sir, you don't wish that, I'm sure.' Who told you what I wished, or what I did not? Remember, Tobias, and keep your own counsel, or it will be the worse for you. And your mother, too, remember that. The boy shrunk back. How had Sweeney Todd terrified the boy about his mother? He must have done so, or Tobias would never have shrunk as he did. Then that rascally barber, whom we begin to suspect of more crimes than fall ordinarily to the share of men, went cautiously out of his shop-door. We cannot pretend to account for why it was so, but, as faithful recorders of facts, we have to state that Hector did not fly at him, but with a melancholy and subdued expression of countenance he looked up in the face of Sweeney Todd. Then he whined piteously, as if he would have said, Give me my master, and I will forgive you all that you have done. Give me back my beloved master, and you shall see that I am neither revengeful nor ferocious." This kind of expression was as legibly written in the poor creature's countenance as if he had actually been endowed with speech and uttered the words themselves. This was what Sweeney Todd certainly did not expect, and, to tell the truth, it staggered and astonished him a little. He would have been glad of an excuse to commit some act of violence, but he had none now, and as he looked in the faces of the people who were around, he felt quite convinced that it would not be the most prudent thing in the world to interfere with the dog in any way that savored of violence. "'Where is the dog's master?' said one. "'Ah, where indeed?' said Todd. "'I should not wonder if he had come to some foul end.' "'But I say, old soap suds,' cried a boy. "'The dog says you did it.' There was a general laugh, but the barber was no means disconcerted, and he shortly replied, "'Does he? He is wrong, then.' Sweeney Todd had no desire to enter into anything like a controversy with the people, so he turned again and entered his own shop, in a distant corner of which he sat down, and folding his great, gaunt-looking arms over his chest, he gave himself up to thought, and, if we might judge from the expression of his countenance, those thoughts were of a pleasant, anticipatory character, for now and then he gave such a grim sort of smile as might well have sat upon the features of some ogre. And now we will turn to another scene, of a widely different character." End of chapter 3「Chapter 4 of The String of Pearls by Unknown. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 4 The Pie Shop in Bell Yard. Hark! Twelve o'clock at midday is cheerily proclaimed by St. Dunstan's Church and scarcely have the sounds done echoing throughout the neighbourhood, and scarcely has the clock of Lincoln's Inn done chiming in 
with its announcement of the same hour, when Belliard Temple Bar becomes a scene of commotion. What a scampering of feet is there, what a laughing and talking, what a jostling to be first, and what an immense number of manoeuvres are resorted to by some of the throng to distance others. And mostly from Lincoln's Inn do these persons, young and old, but most certainly a majority of the former, come bustling and striving, although from the neighbouring legal establishments likewise there come not a few. The temple contributes its numbers, and from the more distant Gray's Inn there comes a goodly lot. Now Bell Yard is almost choked up, and a stranger would wonder what could be the matter, and most probably stand in some doorway until the commotion was over. Is it a fire, or a fight, or anything else sufficiently alarming and extraordinary to excite the junior members of the legal profession to such a species of madness? No, it is none of these, nor is there a fat cause to be run for, which, in the hands of some clever practitioner, might become quite a vested interest. No, the enjoyment is purely one of a physical character, and all the pacing and racing, all this turmoil and trouble, all this pushing, jostling, laughing, and shouting, is to see who will get first into Lovett's pie-shop. Yes, on the left-hand side of Bell Yard, going down from Carey Street, was, at the time we write of, one of the most celebrated shops for the sale of veal and pork pies that London ever produced high and low, rich and poor, resorted to it. Its fame had spread far and wide, and it was because the first batch of those pies came up at twelve o'clock that there was such a rush of the legal profession to obtain them. Their fame had spread even to great distances, and many persons carried them to the suburbs of the city as quite a treat to friends and relations there residing. And well did they deserve their reputation, these delicious pies, there was about them a flavor never surpassed, and rarely equaled. The paste was of the most delicate construction, and impregnated with the aroma of a delicious gravy that defies description. Then the small portions of meat which they contained were so tender, and the fat and the lean so artistically mixed up, that to eat one of Lovett's pies was such a provocation to eat another, that many persons who came to lunch stayed to dine, wasting more than an hour, perhaps, of precious time, and endangering who knows to the contrary, the success of some lawsuit thereby. The counter in Lovett's pie-shop was in the shape of a horseshoe, and it was the custom of the young bloods from the Temple and Lincoln's Inn to sit in a row upon its edge while they partook of the delicious pies, and chatted gaily about one concern and another. Many an appointment was made at Lovett's pie-shop, and many a piece of gossiping scandal was there first circulated. The din of tongues was prodigious, the ringing laugh of the boy who looked upon the quarter of an hour he spent at Lovett's as the brightest of the whole twenty-four, mingled gaily with the more boisterous mirth of his seniors, and, oh, with what rapidity the pies disappeared. They were brought up on large trays, each of which contained about a hundred, and from these trays they were so speedily transferred to the mouths of Mrs. Lovett's customers that it looked like a work of magic. And now we have let out some portion of the secret— there was Mistress Lovett, but possibly our readers guessed as much, for what but a female hand, and that female buxom, young and good-looking, could have ventured upon the production of these pies? Yes, Mrs. Lovett was all that, and every enamoured young scion of the law, as he devoured his pie, pleased himself with the idea that the charming Mrs. Lovett had made that pie especially for him, and that fate, or predestination, had placed it in his hands." and it was astonishing to see with what impartiality and with tact the fair pastry-cook bestowed her smiles upon her admirers, so that none could say he was neglected, while it was extremely difficult for any one to say he was preferred. This was pleasant, but at the same time it was provoking to all except Mrs. Lovett, in whose favour it got up a sort of excitement that paid extraordinarily well, because some of the young fellows thought, and thought it with wisdom, too, that he who consumed the most pies, would be in the most likely way to receive the greatest number of smiles from the lady. Acting upon this supposition, some of her more enthusiastic admirers went on consuming the pies until they were almost ready to burst. But there were others again, of a more philosophic turn of mind, who went for the pies only, and did not care one jot for Mrs. Lovett. These declared that her smile was cold and uncomfortable, that it was upon her lips, but had no place in her heart, 
that it was the smile of a ballet dancer which is about one of the most unmirthful things in existence then there were some who went even beyond this and while they admitted the excellence of the pies and went every day to partake of them swore that mrs lovett had quite a sinister aspect and that they could see what a merely superficial affair her blandishments were and that there was a lurking devil in her eye that if once roused would be capable of achieving some serious things and might not be so easily quelled again by five minutes past twelve mrs lovett's counter was full and the savoury steam of the hot pies went out in fragrant clouds into bell-yard being sniffed up by many a poor wretch passing by who lacked the means of making one in the throng that were devouring the dainty morsels within why tobias rag said a young man with his mouth full of pie where have you been since you left mr snow's in paper buildings i have not seen you for some days no said tobias i have gone into another line instead of being a lawyer and helping to shave the clients i am going to shave the lawyers now a two-penny pork if you please mrs lovett ah uh, who would be an emperor if he couldn't get pies like these eh master clift well they are good of course we know that tobias but do you mean to say you are going to be a barber yes i am with sweeney todd the barber of fleet street close to st dustin's the deuce you are well i'm going to a party tonight and I'll drop in and get dressed and shaved and patronize your master. Tobias put his mouth close to the ear of the young lawyer, and, in a fearful sort of whisper, said the one word, Don't. Don't? What for? Tobias made no answer, and throwing down his two pence, scampered out of the shop as fast as he could. He had only been sent a message by Sweeney Todd in the neighborhood, but, as he heard the clock strike twelve, and two penny pieces were lying at the bottom of his pocket it was not in human nature to resist running into lovett's and converting them into a pork pie what an odd thing thought the young lawyer i'll just drop in at sweeney todd's now on purpose and ask tobias what he means i quite forgot too while he was here to ask him what all that riot was about a dog at todd's door a veal said a young man rushing in a two-penny veal mrs lovett when he got it he consumed it with voracity and then noticing an acquaintance in the shop he whispered to him i can't stand it any more i have cut the spectacle maker joanna is faithless and i know not what to do have another pie but what's a pie to joanna oakley you know dilkey that i only went there to be near the charmer damn the shutters and curse the spectacles she loves another and I am a desperate individual. I should like to do some horrible and desperate act. Oh, Johanna, Johanna, you have driven me to the verge of what do you call it? I'll take another veal, if you please, Mrs. Lovett. Well, I was wondering how you got on, said his friend Dilkey. And thinking of calling upon you. Oh, it was all right. It was all right at first. She smiled upon me. You are quite sure she didn't laugh at you? Sir, Mr. Dilkey. I say, are you sure that instead of smiling upon you, she was not laughing at you? Am I sure? Do you wish to insult me, Mr. Dilkey? I look upon you as a puppy, sir, a horrid puppy. Very good. Now I am convinced that the girl has been having a bit of fun at your expense. Are you not aware, Sam, that your nose turns up so much that it's enough to pitch you head over heels? How do you suppose that any girl under forty-five would waste a word upon you? Mind, I don't say this to offend you in any way, but just quietly, by way of asking a question. Sam looked daggers, and probably he might have attempted some desperate act in the pie-shop, if at the moment he had not caught the eye of Mrs. Lovett, and he saw by the expression on that lady's face that anything in the shape of a riot would be speedily suppressed so he darted out of the place at once to carry his sorrows and his bitterness elsewhere. It was only between twelve and one o'clock that such a tremendous rush and influx of visitors came to the pie-shop for, although there was a good custom the whole day, and the concern was a money-making one from morning till night, it was at that hour principally that the great consumption of pies took place. 
Tobias knew from experience that Sweeney Todd was a skillful calculator of the time it ought to take to go to different places, and accordingly, since he had occupied some portion of that most valuable of all commodities at Mrs. Lovett's, he arrived quite breathless at his master's shop. There sat the mysterious dog with the hat, and Tobias lingered for a moment to speak to the animal. Dogs are great physiognomists, and as the creature looked into Tobias's face, he seemed to draw a favorable conclusion regarding him, for he submitted to a caress. "'Poor fellow,' said Tobias. "'I wish I knew what had become of your master, but it made me shake like a leaf to wake up last night and ask myself the question. You shan't starve, though, if I can help it. I haven't much for myself, but you shall have some of it.' As he spoke, Tobias took from his pocket something not very tempting cold meat, which he intended for his own dinner, and which he had wrapped up in not the cleanest of claws. He gave a piece to the dog, who took it with a dejected air, and then crouched down at Sweeney Todd's door again. Just then, as Tobias was about to enter the shop, he thought he heard from within a strange, shrieking sort of sound. On the impulse of the moment he recoiled a step or two, and then— from some other impulse, he dashed forward at once and entered the shop. The first object that presented itself to his attention, lying upon a side table, was a hat with a handsome gold-headed walking cane lying across it. The armchair in which customers usually sat to be shaved was vacant, and Sweeney Todd's face was just projected into the shop from the back parlor and wearing a most singular and hideous expression. "'Well, Tobias,' he said as he advanced, rubbing his great hands together. "'Well, Tobias, so you could not resist the pie-shop? "'How does he know?' thought Tobias. "'Yes, sir, I have been to the pie-shop, but I didn't stay a minute.' "'Hark ye, Tobias, the only thing I can excuse in the way of delay upon an errand is for you to get one of Mrs. Lovett's pies. That I can look over, so think no more about it. Are they not delicious, Tobias?' Yes, sir, they are, but some gentleman seems to have left his hat and stick. Yes, said Sweeney Todd. He has. And lifting the stick, he struck Tobias a blow with it that felled him to the ground. Lesson the second to Tobias Rag, which teaches him to make no remarks about what does not concern him. You may think what you like, Tobias Rag, but you shall say only what I like. "'I won't endure it!' cried the boy. "'I won't be knocked about in this way, I tell you, Sweeney Todd, I won't!' "'You won't? Have you forgotten your mother?' "'You say you have power over my mother, but I don't know what it is, and I cannot and will not believe it. I'll leave you, and come of it what may. I'll go to sea or anywhere rather than stay in such a place as this.' "'Oh, you will, will you? Then, Tobias—' You and I must come to some explanation. I'll tell you what power I have over your mother, and then perhaps you will be satisfied. Last winter, when the frost had continued eighteen weeks, and you and your mother were starving, she was employed to clean out the chambers of a Mr. King in the temple, a cold-hearted, severe man, who never forgave anything in all his life, and never will. I remember, said Tobias. We were starving, and owed a whole guinea for rent, but Mother borrowed it and paid it, and after that got a situation where she is now. Ah, you think so? The rent was paid, but Tobias, my boy, a word in your ear. She took a silver candlestick from Mr. King's chambers to pay it. I know it. I can prove it. Think of that, Tobias, and be discreet. Have mercy upon us, said the boy. They would take her life. Her life? screamed Sweeney Todd. Aye, to be sure they would. They would hang her. Hang her, I say. And now mind, if you force me... By any conduct of your own, to mention this thing, you are your mother's executioner. I had better go and be deputy hangman at once, and turn her off. Horrible, horrible! Oh, you don't like that! 
Indeed, that don't suit you, Master Tobias. Be discreet, then, and you have nothing to fear. Do not force me to show a power which will be as complete as it is terrible. I will say nothing. I will think nothing. Tis well. Now go and put that hat and stick in yonder cupboard. I shall be absent for a short time, and if anyone comes, tell them I am called out, and shall not return for an hour, or perhaps longer. And mind you take good care of the shop. Sweeney Todd took off his apron and put on an immense coat with huge lapels, and then, clapping a three-cornered hat on his head and casting a strange, withering kind of look at Tobias, he sallied forth into the street. End of chapter 4《Chapter Five of the String of Pearls by Unknown. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter Five The Meeting in the Temple. Alas, poor Joanna Oakley! Thy day has passed away and brought with it no tidings of him you love, and oh, what a weary day, full of fearful doubts and anxieties, has it been! tortured by doubts hopes and fears that day was one of the most wretched that poor joanna had ever passed not even two years before when she had parted with her lover had she felt such an exquisite pang of anguish as now filled her heart when she saw the day gliding away and the evening creeping on apace without word or token from mark ingestry she did not herself know until all the agony of disappointment had come across her how much she had counted upon hearing something from him on that occasion and when the evening deepened into night, and hope grew so slender that she could no longer rely upon it for the least support, she was compelled to proceed to her own chamber, and, feigning indisposition to avoid her mother's questions, for Mrs. Oakley was at home, and making herself and everybody else as uncomfortable as possible, she flung herself on her humble couch and gave way to a perfect passion of tears. "'Oh, Mark, Mark,' she said, why do you thus desert me, when I have relied so abundantly upon your true affection? Oh, why have you not sent me some token of your existence, and of your continued love? The merest slightest word would have been sufficient, and I should have been happy. She wept then such bitter tears as only such a heart as hers can know, when it feels the deep and bitter anguish of desertion, and when the rock upon which it supposed it had built its fondest hopes— resolves itself into a mere quicksand, in which becomes engulfed all the good that this world can afford to the just and the beautiful. Oh, it is heart-rending to think that such a one as she, Joanna Oakley, being so full of all those holy and gentle emotions which should constitute the truest felicity, should thus feel that life to her had lost its greatest charms, and that nothing but despair remained. I will wait until midnight she said and even then it will be a mockery to seek repose and to-morrow i must myself make some exertion to discover some tidings of him then she began to ask herself what that exertion could be and it one matter a young and inexperienced girl such as she was could hope to succeed in her inquiries and the midnight hour came at last telling her that giving the utmost latitude to the word day it had gone at last and she was left despairing she lay the whole of that night sobbing, and only at times dropping into an unquiet slumber, during which painful images were presented to her, all, however, having the same tendency and pointing towards the presumed fact that Mark Ingestry was no more. But the weariest night to the weariest waker will pass away, and at length the soft and beautiful dawn stole into the chamber of Joanna Oakley, chasing away some of the more horrible visions of the night, but having little effect in subduing the sadness that had taken possession of her. She felt that it would be better for her to make her appearance below than to hazard the remarks and conjectures that her not doing so would give rise to, so, all unfitted as she was to engage in the most ordinary intercourse, she crept down to the breakfast parlour, looking more like a ghost of her former self than the bright and beautiful being we have represented her to the reader. Her father understood what it was that robbed her cheek of its bloom, and although he saw it with much distress, yet he had fortified himself 
with what he considered were some substantial reasons for future hopefulness. It had become part of his philosophy, it generally is a part of the philosophy of the old, to consider that those sensations of the mind that arise from disappointed affections are of the most evanescent character, and that, although for a time they exhibit themselves with violence, they, like grief for the dead, soon pass away, scarcely leaving a trace behind of their former existence. And perhaps he was right regards the greatest number of those passions, but he was certainly wrong when he applied that sort of worldly-wise knowledge to his daughter Joanna. She was one of those rare beings whose hearts are not won by every gaudy flatterer who may buzz the accents of admiration in their ears. No, she was qualified, eminently qualified, to love once, but only once, and, like the passion flower that blooms into abundant beauty once and never afterwards puts forth a blossom, she allowed her heart to expand to the soft influence of affection which, when crushed by adversity, was gone for ever. "'Really, Johanna,' said Mrs. Oakley, in the true conventicle twang, "'you look so pale and ill that I must positively speak to Mr. Lupin about you.' "'Mr. Lupin, my dear,' said the spectacle-maker, "'may be all very well in his way as a person, but I don't see what he can do with Johanna looking pale.' "'A pious man, Mr. Oakley, has to do with everything and everybody.' "'Then he must be the most intolerable bore in existence.' and I don't wonder at his being kicked out of some people's houses, as I have heard Mr. Lupin has been. And if he has, Mr. Oakley, I can tell you he glories in it. Mr. Lupin likes to suffer for the faith, and if he were to be made a martyr tomorrow, I'm quite certain it would give him a deal of pleasure. My dear, I am quite sure it would not give him half the pleasure it would me. I understand your insinuation, Mr. Oakley, you would like to have him murdered on account of his holiness. But though you say these kind of things at your own breakfast table, you won't say as much when he comes to tea this afternoon. To tea, Mrs. Oakley, haven't I told you over and over again that I will not have that man in my house? And haven't I told you, Mr. Oakley, twice that number of times, that he shall come to tea? And I have asked him now, and it can't be altered. But, Mrs. Oakley... It's of no use, Mr. Oakley, you're talking. Mr. Lupin is coming to tea, and come he shall. And if you don't like it, you can go out. There now, I'm sure you can't complain, now you have actually the liberty of going out. But you are like the dog in the manger, Mr. Oakley. I know that well enough, and nothing will please you. A fine liberty indeed. The liberty of going out of my own house to let somebody else into it that I don't like. Johanna, my dear said mrs oakley i think my old complaint is coming on the beating of the heart and the hysterics i know what produces it it's your father's brutality and just because dr fungus said over and over that i was to be kept perfectly quiet your father seizes upon the opportunity like a wild beast or a raving maniac to try to make me ill mr oakley jumped up stamped his feet upon the floor, and, uttering something about the probability of his becoming a maniac in a very short time, rushed into his shop, and set to polishing spectacles as if he were doing it for a wager. This little affair between her father and her mother certainly had had the effect, for a time, of diverting attention from Joanna, and she was able to assume a cheerfulness she did not feel. But she had something of her father's spirit in her as regards Mr. Lupin, and most decidedly objected to sitting down to any meal whatever with that individual, so that Mrs. Oakley was left in a minority of one upon the occasion, which, perhaps, as she fully expected, was no great matter after all. Joanna went upstairs to her own room, which commanded a view of the street. It was an old-fashioned house, with a balcony in front, and as she looked listlessly out into Fourth Street, which was then far from being the thoroughfare it is now, she saw standing in a doorway on the opposite side of the way a stranger who was looking intently at the house and who when he caught her eye walked instantly across to it and cast something into the balcony of the first floor then he touched his cap and walked rapidly from the street the thought immediately occurred to johanna that this might possibly be some messenger from him concerning whose existence and welfare she was so deeply anxious it is not to be wondered at therefore that with the name of Mark Inglestree upon her lips she should rush down to the balcony in intense anxiety to hear and see if such was really the case. 
when she reached the balcony she found lying in it a scrap of paper in which a stone was wrapped up in order to give it weight so that it might be cast with certainty into the balcony with trembling eagerness she opened the paper and read upon it the following words for news of a mark in gestry come to the temple gardens one hour before sunset and do not fear addressing a man who will be holding a white rose in his hand he lives he lives she cried he lives and joy again becomes an inhabitant of my bosom oh it is daylight now and sunshine compared to the black midnight of despair mark in gestry lives and i shall be happy yet she placed the little scrap of paper in her bosom and then with clasped hands and a delighted expression of countenance she repeated the brief but expressive words it contained adding yes yes i will be there the white rose an emblem of his purity and affection his spotless love and that is why his messenger carries it i will be there one hour before sunset eh, two hours before sunset i will be there joy joy he lives he lives mark in gestry lives perchance too successful in his object he returns to tell me that he can make me his and that no obstacle can now interfere to frustrate our union time time float onwards on your fleetest pinions she went to her own apartment but it was not as she had last gone to it to weep on the contrary it was to smile at her former fears and to admit the philosophy of the assertion that we suffer much more from a dread of those things that never happen than we do for actual calamities which occur in their full force to us oh but this messenger she said had come but yesterday what hours of anguish i should have been spared but i will not complain it shall not be said that i repine at present joy because it did not come before i will be happy when i can and in the consciousness that i shall soon hear blissful tidings of mark in gestry i will banish every fear the impatience which she now felt brought its pains and its penalties with it and yet it was quite a different description of feeling to any she had formerly endured and certainly far more desirable than the absolute anguish that had taken possession of her upon hearing nothing of mark ingestry it was strange very strange that the thought never crossed her mind that the tidings she had to hear in the temple gardens from the stranger might be evil ones but certainly such a thought did not occur to her and she looked forward to a meeting which she certainly had no evidence to know might not be of the most disastrous character she asked herself over and over again if she should tell her father what had occurred but as often as she thought of doing so she shrank from carrying out the mental suggestion and all the natural disposition again to keep to herself the secret of her happiness returned to her with full force but yet she was not so unjust as not to feel that it was treating her father but slightly to throw all her sorrows into his lap as it were and then to keep from him everything of joy appertaining to the same circumstances this was a thing that she was not likely to continue doing and so she made up her mind to relieve her conscience from the pang it would otherwise have had by determining to tell him after the interview in the temple gardens what was its result but she could not make up her mind to do so beforehand it was so pleasant and so delicious to keep the secret all to herself and to feel that she alone knew that her lover had so closely kept faith with her as to be only one day behind his time in sending to her and that day perhaps far from being his fault and so she reasoned to herself and tried to while away the anxious hours sometimes succeeding in forgetting how long it was still to sunset and at others feeling as if each minute was perversely swelling itself out into ten times its usual proportion of time in order to become wearisome to her she had said she would be at the temple gardens two hours before the sunset instead of one and she kept her word for looking happier than she had done for weeks she tripped down the stairs of her father's house and was about to leave it by the private staircase when a strange gaunt-looking figure attracted her attention this was no other than the rev mr lupin he was a long strange-looking man and upon this occasion he came upon what he called horseback that is to say he was mounted upon a very small pony which seemed quite unequal to support his weight and was so short that if the reverend gentleman had not poked out his legs at an angle they must inevitably have touched the ground praise the lord he said i have intercepted the evil one maiden 
I have come here at thy mother's bidding, and thou shalt remain and partake of the mixture called tea. Joanna scarcely condescended to glance at him, but, drawing her mantle close around her, which he actually had the impertinence to endeavour to lay hold of, she walked on, so that the reverend gentleman was left to make the best he could of the matter. Stop! he cried. Stop! I can well perceive that the devil has a strong hold of you. I can well perceive. The Lord have mercy upon me. This animal hath some design against me, as sure as fate. This last ejaculation arose from the fact that the pony had flung up its heels behind in a most mysterious manner. I'm afraid, sir, said a lad, who was no other than our old acquaintance, Sam. I'm afraid, sir, that there's something the matter with the pony. Up went the pony's heels again in the same unaccustomed manner. God bless me, said the reverend gentleman. He never did such a thing before. There he goes again. Murder! Young man! i pray you help me to get down i think i know you you are the nephew of the godly mrs plump truly this animal wishes to be the death of me at this moment the pony gave such a vigorous kick up behind that mr lupin was fairly pitched upon his head and made a complete somersault alighting with his heels in the spectacle maker's passage and it unfortunately happened that mrs oakley at that moment hearing the altercation came rushing out and the first thing she did was to go sprawling over Mr. Lupin's feet. Sam now felt it time to go, and as we dislike useless mysteries, we may as well explain that these extraordinary circumstances arose from the fact that Sam had bought himself from the haberdasher's opposite a halfpenny worth of pins, and had amused himself by making a pincushion of the hindquarters of the Reverend Lupin's pony, which, not being accustomed to that sort of thing, had kicked out vigorously in opposition to the same, and produced the results we have recorded. Joanna Oakley was some distance upon her road before the reverend gentleman was pitched into her father's house in the manner we have described, so that she knew nothing of it, nor would she have cared if she had, for her mind was wholly bent upon the expedition she was proceeding on. As she walked upon that side of the way of Fleet Street, where Sweeney Todd's house and shop were situated, a feeling of curiosity prompted her to stop for a moment and look at the melancholy-looking dog, that stood watching a hat at his door. The appearance of grief upon the creature's face could not be mistaken, and, as she gazed, she saw the shop door gently opened and a piece of meat thrown out. "'Those are kind people,' she said. "'Be they who they may.' But when she saw the dog turn away from the meat with loathing, and herself observed that there was a white powder upon it, the idea that it was poisoned and only intended for the poor creature's destruction came instantly across her mind and when she saw the horrible-looking face of sweeney todd glaring at her from the partially opened door she could not doubt any further the fact for that face was quite enough to give a warrant for any amount of villainy whatever she passed on with a shudder little suspecting however that the dog had anything to do with her fate or the circumstances which made up the sum of her destiny it wanted a full hour to the appointed time of meeting when she reached the temple gardens and partly blaming herself that she was so soon while at the same time she would not for worlds have been away she sat down on one of the garden seats to think over the past and to recall to her memory with all the vivid freshness of young love's devotion the many gentle words which from time to time had been spoken to her two summers since by him whose faith she had never doubted and whose image was enshrined at the bottom of her heart. End of chapter 5。Chapter 6 of The String of Pearls by Unknown。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter Six: The Conference and the Fearful Narration in the Garden. The temple clock struck the hour of meeting, and Johanna looked anxiously around her for any one who should seem to bear the appearance of being such a person as she might suppose Mark and Jestry would choose for his messenger. She turned her eyes towards the gate, for she thought she heard it close, and then she saw a gentlemanly-looking man attired in a cloak and who was looking about him apparently in search of someone. When his eye fell upon her, 
he immediately produced from beneath his cloak a white rose and in another minute they met i have the honour he said of speaking to miss joanna oakley yes sir and you are mark injustry's messenger i am that is to say i am he who comes to bring you news of mark ingustry although i grieve to say i am not the messenger that was expressly deputed by him to do so oh sir your looks are sad and serious you seem as if you would announce that some misfortune had occurred tell me that it is not so speak to me at once or my heart will break compose yourself lady i pray you i cannot dare not do so unless you tell me he lives tell me that mark in jestry lives and then i shall be all patience tell me that and you shall not hear a murmur from me speak the word at once at once it is cruel believe me to keep me in this suspense this is one of the saddest errands i ever came upon said the stranger as he led johanna to a seat recollect lady what creatures of accident and chance we are recollect how the slightest circumstances will affect us in driving us to the confines of despair and remember by how frail a tenure the best of us hold existence no more no more shrieked johanna as she clasped her hands i know all now and i'm desolate she let her face drop upon her hands and shook as with a convulsion of grief mark mark she cried you have gone from me i thought not this i thought not this oh heaven why have i lived so long as to have the capacity to listen to such fearful tidings lost lost all lost god of heaven what a wildness the world is now to me let me pray you lady to subdue this passion of grief and listen truly to what i shall unfold to you there is much to hear and much to speculate upon and if from all that i have learnt i cannot dare not tell you that mark ingestry lives i likewise shrink from telling you he is no more speak again say those words again there is a hope then oh there is a hope there is a hope and better it is that your mind should receive the first shock of the probability of the death of him whom you have so anxiously expected and then afterwards from what i shall relate to you gather hope that it may not be so then that from the first you should expect too much and then have those expectations rudely destroyed it is so it is so this is kind of you and if i cannot thank you as i ought you will know that it is because i am in a state of too great affliction so to do and not from want of a will you will understand that i am sure you will understand that make no excuses to me believe me i can fully appreciate all that you would say and all that you must feel i ought to tell you who i am that you may have confidence in what i have to relate to you my name is geoffrey and i am a colonel in the india army i am much beholden to you sir but you bring with you a passport to my confidence in the name of mark in Jestry, which is at once sufficient i live again in the hope that you have given me of his continued existence and in that hope i will maintain a cheerful resignation that shall enable me to bear up against all you have to tell me be that what it may and with a feeling that through much suffering there may come joy at last you shall find me very patient i extremely patient so patient that you shall scarcely see the havoc that the grief has already made here she pressed her hands on her breast as she spoke and looked in his face with such an expression of tearful melancholy that it was quite heart-rending to witness it and he although not used to the melting mood was compelled to pause for a few moments ere he could proceed in the task which he had set himself i will be as brief he said as possible consistent with stating all that is requisite for me to state and i must commence by asking you if you are aware under what circumstances mark industry went abroad i am aware of so much that a quarrel with his uncle mr grant was the great cause and that his main endeavour was to better his fortunes so that we might be happy and independent of those who looked not with an eye of favour on our projected union yes 
But what I meant was, were you aware of the sort of adventure he embarked in to the Indian seas? No, I know nothing further. We met out on this spot, we parted at yonder gate, and we have never met again. Then I have something to tell you, in order to make the narrative clear and explicit. I shall listen to you with an attention so profound that you shall see how my whole soul is wrapped up in what you say. They both sat upon the garden seat, and while Johanna fixed her eyes upon her companion's face, expressive as it was of the most generous emotions and noble feelings, he commenced relating to her the incidents which never left her memory and in which she took so deep an interest. You must know he said, that what it was which so much inflamed the imagination of Mark Ingestry consisted in this. There came to London a man with a well-authenticated and extremely well-put-together report that there had been discovered in one of the small islands near the Indian seas a river which deposited an enormous quantity of gold dust in its progress to the ocean. He told his story so well, and seemed to be such a perfect master of all the circumstances connected with it, that there was scarcely room for a doubt upon the subject. The thing was kept quiet and secret, and a meeting was held of some influential men, influential on account of the money they possessed, among whom was one who had towards Mark Ingestry most friendly feelings. So Mark attended the meeting with this friend of his, although he felt his utter incapacity from want of resources to take any part in the affair. But he was not aware of what his friend's generous intentions were in the matter until they were explained to him, and they consisted in this. He, the friend, was to provide the necessary means for embarking in the adventure, so far as regarded taking a share in it, and he told Mark Ingestry that, if he would go personally on to the expedition, he would share in the proceeds with him, be they what they might. Now, to a young man like Ingestry, totally destitute of personal resources, but of ardent and enthusiastic temperament, you can imagine how extremely tempting such an offer was likely to be. He embraced it at once with the greatest pleasure, and from that moment he took an interest in the affair of the closest and most powerful description. It seized completely hold of his imagination, presenting itself to him in the most tempting colours, and from the description that has been given me of his enthusiastic disposition, I can well imagine with what kindness and impetuosity he would enter into such an affair. You know him well, said Johanna gently. No, I never saw him. All that I say concerning him is from the description of another who did know him well, and who sailed with him in the vessel that ultimately left the port of London on the vague and wild adventure I have mentioned. That one, be he who he may, must have known Mark in gesture well, and have enjoyed much of his confidence to be able to describe him so accurately. I believe that such was the case and it is from the lips of that one instead of mine that you ought to have heard what i am now relating that gentleman whose name was thornhill ought to have made to you this communication but by some strange accident it seems he has been prevented or you would not be here listening to me upon a subject which would have come better from his lips and he was to have come yesterday to me he was then mark in gesture kept his word and but for the adverse circumstances which delayed his messenger, I should have heard yesterday what you are now relating to me. I pray you, go on, sir, and pardon the interruption. I need not trouble you with all the negotiations, the trouble and the difficulty that arose after the expedition could be stated fairly. Suffice it to say that at length, after much annoyance and trouble, it was started, and a vessel was duly chartered and mannered for the purpose of proceeding to the Indian seas in search of the treasure, which was reported to be there for the first adventurer who had the boldness to seek it. It was a gallant vessel. I saw it sail many a mile from England ere it sunk beneath the waves, never to rise again. Sunk? Yes, it was an ill-fated ship, and it did sink, but I must not anticipate. Let me proceed in my narrative with regularity. The ship was called the Star and if those who went with it looked upon it as the star of their destiny, they were correct enough, and it might be considered an evil star for them, inasmuch as nothing but disappointment and bitterness became their ultimate portion. And Mark Ingestry, I am told, was the most hopeful man on board, 
Already in imagination he could fancy himself homeward bound with the vessel, ballasted and crammed with the rich produce of that shining river. Already he fancied what he could do with his abundant wealth, and I have not a doubt but that in common with many who went on that adventure, he enjoyed to the full the spending of the wealth he should obtain in imagination, perhaps, indeed, more than if he had obtained it in reality. Among the adventurers was one Thornhill, who had been a lieutenant in the Royal Navy, and between him and young Ingestry there arose a remarkable friendship, a friendship so strong and powerful that there can be no doubt they communicated to each other all their hopes and fears, and if anything could materially tend to beguile the tedium of such a weary voyage as those adventurers had undertaken, it certainly would be the free communication and confidential intercourse between two such kindred spirits as Thornhill and Mark Ingestry. You will bear in mind, Miss Oakley, that in making this communication to you I am putting together what I myself heard at different times, so as to make it for you a distinct narrative, which you can have no difficulty in comprehending, because, as I before stated, I never saw Mark Ingestry, and it was only once, for about five minutes, that I saw the vessel in which he went upon his perilous adventure, for perilous it turned out to be, to the Indian seas. It was from Thornhill I got my information during the many weary and monotonous hours consumed in a homeward voyage from India. It appears that without accident or cross of any description, the star reached the Indian Ocean and the supposed immediate locality of the spot where the treasure was to be found, and there she was spoken with by a vessel homeward bound from India called the Neptune. It was evening, and the sun had sunk in the horizon with some appearance that betokened a storm. I was on board that Indian vessel. We did not expect anything serious, although we made every preparation for rough weather, and as it turned out it was well indeed we did, for never within the memory of the oldest seaman had such a storm ravished the coast. A furious gale, which it was impossible to withstand, drove us southward, and but for the utmost precautions aided by the courage and temerity on the part of the seamen, such as I have never before witnessed in the merchant service, we escaped with trifling damage, but we were driven at least two hundred miles out of our course, and instead of getting, as we ought to have done, to the Cape by a certain time, we were an immense distance east of it. It was just as the storm, which lasted three nights and two days, began to abate, that towards the horizon we saw a dull red light, and as it was not in a quarter of the sky where any such appearance might be imagined, nor were we in a latitude where electric phenomena might be expected, we steered towards it, surmising what turned out afterwards to be fully correct. It was a ship on fire, said Johanna. It was. Alas, alas, I guessed it. A frightful suspicion from the first crossed my mind. It was a ship on fire, and the ship was... The star, still bound upon its adventurous course, although driven far out of it by adverse winds and waves, after about half an hour's sailing, we came within sight distinctly of a blazing vessel. We could hear the roar of the flames, and through our glasses we could see them curling up the cordage and dancing from mast to mast like fiery serpents, exulting in the destruction they were making. We made all sail and strained every inch of canvas to reach the ill-fated vessel, for distances out to sea that look small are in reality very great, and an hour's hard sailing in a fair wind with every stitch of canvas set would not do more than enable us to reach that ill-fated bark. But fancy in an hour what ravages the flames might make. Oh, the vessel was doomed. The fiat had gone forth that it was to be among the things that had been, and long before we could reach the spot upon which it floated idly on the now comparatively calm waters, we saw a bright shower of sparks rush up into the air. Then came a loud roaring sound over the surface of the deep, and all was still. The ship had disappeared, and the water had closed over her forever. But how knew you? said Johanna as she clasped her hands, and the pallid expression of her countenance betrayed the deep interest she took in the narration. How knew you that ship was the star? Might it not have been some other ill-fated vessel that met with so dreadful a fate? I will tell you. Although we had seen the ship go down, 
we kept on our course, straining every effort to reach the spot with the hope of picking up some of the crew who surely had made an effort by the boats to leave the burning vessel. The captain of the Indiamen kept his glass at his eye, and presently he said to me, There is a floating piece of wreck and something clinging to it. I know not if there be a man, but what I can perceive seems to me to be the head of a dog. I looked through the glass myself and saw the same object, but as we neared it we found that it was a large piece of the wreck with a dog and a man supported by it, who were clinging with all the energy of desperation. In ten minutes more we had them on board the vessel. The man was the Lieutenant Thornhill I have before mentioned, and the dog belonged to him. He related to us that the ship we had seen burning was the star, that it had never reached its destination, and that he believed all had perished but himself and the dog, for, although one of the boats had been launched, so desperate a rush was made into it by the crew that it had swamped and all perished. Such was his own state of exhaustion, that, after he had made to us this short statement, it was some days before he left his hammock. But when he did, and began to mingle with us, we found an intelligent, cheerful companion, such a one indeed as we were glad to have on board, and in confidence he related to the captain and myself the object of the voyage of the star, and the previous particulars with which I have made you acquainted. And then, during a night watch, when the soft and beautiful moonlight was more than usually inviting, and he and I were on the deck enjoying the coolness of the night after the intense heat of the day in the tropics, he said to me, I have a very sad mission to perform when I get to London. On board our vessel was a young man named Mark Ingestry, and some time before the vessel in which we were went down, he begged of me to call upon a young lady named Joanna Oakley, the daughter of a spectacle-maker in London, providing I should be saved and he perish. And of the latter event, he felt so strong a presentiment that he gave to me a string of pearls which I was to present to her in his name. But where he got them I have not the least idea, for they are of immense value." Mr. Thornhill showed me the pearls which are of different sizes, roughly strung together, but of great value, and when we reached the River Thames, which was only three days since, he left us with his dog, carrying his string of pearls with him, to find out where you reside. Alas! He never came! No. From all the inquiries we can make, and all the information we can learn, it seems that he disappeared somewhere about Fleet Street. Disappeared? Yes. We can trace him to the temple stairs, and from thence to a barber's shop, kept by a man named Sweeney Todd. But beyond there no information of him can be obtained. Sweeney Todd? Yes. And what makes the affair more extraordinary is that neither force nor persuasion will induce Thornhill's dog to leave the place. I saw it. I saw the creature, and it looked imploringly, but kindly in my face. But little did I think, when I paused a moment, to look upon that melancholy but faithful animal that it held a part in my destiny. Oh, mark in gestry, mark in gestry, dare I hope, that you live when all else have perished. I have told you all that I can tell you, and according as your own judgment may dictate to you, you can encourage hope, or extinguish it for ever. I have kept back nothing from you which can make the affair worse or better. I have added nothing, but you have it simply as it was told to me. He is lost. He is lost. I am one lady who always thinks certainty of any sort preferable to suspense, and although while there is no positive news of death, the continuance of life ought fairly to be assumed, yet you must perceive from a review of all the circumstances upon how very slender a foundation all your hopes must rest. I have no hope. I have no hope. He is lost to me for ever. It were madness to think he lived. Oh, Mark, Mark, and is this the end of all our fond affection? Did I indeed look my last upon that face, when on this spot we parted? The uncertainty, said Colonel Geoffrey, wishing to withdraw as much as possible from a consideration of her own sorrows. The uncertainty, too, that prevails with the regard to the fate of poor Mr. Thornhill is a sad thing. I much fear that those precious pearls he had have been seen by someone who has not scrupled to obtain possession of them by his death. Yes, it would seem so indeed, but what are pearls to me? 
Oh, would that they had sunk to the bottom of the Indian Sea, from whence they had been plucked. Alas, alas, it has been their thirst for gain that has produced all these evils. We might have been poor here, but we should have been happy. Rich we ought to have been, in contentment, but now all is lost, and the world to me can present nothing that is to be desired, but one small spot large enough to be my grave. She leant upon the arm of the garden seat, and gave herself up to such a passion of tears that Colonel Geoffrey felt he dared not interrupt her. There is something exceedingly sacred about real grief which awes the beholder and it was with an involuntary feeling of respect that colonel jeffrey stepped a few paces off and waited until that burst of agony had passed away it was during those few brief moments that he overheard some words uttered by one who seemed likewise to be suffering from that prolific source of all affliction disappointed affection seated at some short distance was a maiden and one not young enough to be called a youth but still not far enough advanced in existence to have had all his better feelings crushed by an admixture with the cold world and he was listening while the maiden spoke it is the neglect she said which touched me to the heart but one word spoken or written one message of affectation to tell me that the memory of a love i thought would be eternal still lingered in your heart would have been a world of consolation but it came not and all was despair listen to me said her companion if ever in this world you can believe that one who truly loves can be cruel to be kind believe that i am that one i yielded for a time to the fascination of a passion which should never have found a home within my heart. But yet it was far more of a sentiment than a passion, inasmuch as never for one moment did an evil thought mingle with its pure aspirations. It was a dream of joy, which for a time obliterated a remembrance that ought never to have been forgotten. But when I was rudely awakened to the fact that those whose opinions were of more importance to your welfare and your happiness knew nothing of love but in its grossest aspect, it became necessary at once to crush a feeling which, in its continuance, could shadow forth nothing but evil. You may not imagine, and you may never know, for I cannot tell the heart pangs it has cost me to persevere in a line of conduct which I felt was due to you, whatever heart pangs it might cost me. I have been content to imagine that your affection would turn to indifference, perchance to hatred, that a consciousness of being slighted would arouse in your defense all a woman's pride, and that thus you would be lifted above regret." Farewell for ever. I dare not love you honestly and truly, and better it is thus to part than to persevere in a delusive dream that can but terminate in degradation and sadness. Do you hear those words? whispered Colonel Jeffrey to Johanna. You perceive that others suffer, and from the same cause the perils of affection. I do. I will go home and pray for strength to maintain my heart against this sad affliction. The course of true love never yet ran smooth. Wonder not, therefore, Joanna Oakley, that yours has suffered such a blight. It is the great curse of the highest and noblest feelings of which humanity is capable, that while, under felicitous circumstances, they produce an extraordinary amount of happiness when anything adverse occurs they are most prolific sources of misery. Shall I accompany you? Johanna felt grateful for the support of the colonel's arm towards her own home, and as they passed the barber's shop, they were surprised to see that the dog and the hat were gone. End of chapter 6 Chapter 7 of The String of Pearls by Unknown. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Chapter 7 The Barber and the Lapidary It is night, and a man, one of the most celebrated lapidaries in London, but yet a man frugal withal, although rich, is putting up the shutters of his shop. This lapidary is an old man. His scanty hair is white, and his hands shake as he secures the fastenings, and then, over and over again, feels and shakes each shutter to be assured that his shop is well secured. This shop of his is in Moorfields, then a place very much frequented by dealers in bullion and precious stones. He was about entering his door, just having cast a satisfied look upon the fastenings of his shop, when a tall, ungainly-looking man stepped up to him. This man had a three-cornered hat, much too small for him, perched upon the top of his great hideous-looking head, while the coat he wore had ample skirts enough to have made another of ordinary dimensions. Our readers will have no difficulty in recognizing Sweeney Todd, and well might the little old lapidary start as such a very unprepossessing-looking personage addressed him. "'You deal?' he said. "'In precious stones?' "'Yes, I do.' was the reply but it's rather late do you want to buy or sell to sell <laughs> uh, i dare say it's something not in my line the only order i get is for pearls and they are not in the market and i have nothing but pearls to sell said uh, sweeney todd i mean to keep all my diamonds my garnets topazes brilliants emeralds and rubies <laughs> the deuce you do why, you don't mean to say you have any of them? Be off with you. I am too old to joke with, and I'm waiting for my supper. Will you look at the pearls I have? Little seed pearls, I suppose. They are of no value, and I don't want them. We have plenty of those. It's real, genuine, large pearls we want. Pearls worth thousands. Will you look at mine? No. Good night. Very good. Then I will take them to Mr. Coventry up the street. He will, perhaps, deal with me for them, if you cannot. The lapidary hesitated. Stop, he said. What's the use of going to Mr. Coventry? He has not the means of purchasing what I can present cash for. Come in, come in. I will, at all events, look at what you have for sale. Thus encouraged, Sweeney Todd entered the little, low, dusky shop, and the lapidary, having procured a light, and taking care to keep his customer outside the counter, put on his spectacles and said, Now, sir, where are your pearls? There, said Sweeney Todd as he laid a string of twenty-four pearls before the lapidary. The old man's eyes opened to an enormous width and he pushed his spectacles right up upon his forehead as he glared in the face of Sweeney Todd with undisguised astonishment. Then down he pulled his spectacles again, and taking up the string of pearls, he rapidly examined every one of them, after which he exclaimed, Real! Real! By heaven! All real! Then he pushed his spectacles up again to the top of his head, and took another long stare at Sweeney Todd. I know they are real, said the latter. Will you deal with me, or will you not? Will I deal with you? Yes, I am quite sure that they are real. Let me look again. Oh, I see. Counterfeits. But so well done, that really, for the curiosity of the thing, I will give fifty pounds for them. I am fond of curiosities, said Sweeney Todd. And, as they are not real, I'll keep them. They will do for a present to some child or other. <laughs> what? Give those to a child? You must be mad. That is to say, not mad, but certainly indiscreet. Come, now, at a word, I'll give you a hundred pounds for them. Hark ye, said Sweeney Todd. It neither suits my inclination nor my time to stand here chaffing with you. I know the value of the pearls, and, as a matter of ordinary and everyday business, I will sell them to you so that you may get a handsome profit. What do you call handsome profit? 
the pearls are worth twelve thousand pounds and i will let you have them for ten what do you think of that for an offer <laughs> what odd noise was that oh it was only i who laughed come what do you say at once are we to do business or are we not hark ye my friend since you do know the value of your pearls and this is to be a downright business transaction i think i can find a customer who will give eleven thousand pounds for them and if so i have no objection to give you eight thousand pounds give me the eight thousand pounds said sweeney todd and let me go i hate bargaining stop a bit there are some rather important things to consider you must know my friend that a string of pearls of this value are not to be bought like a few ounces of old silver of anybody who might come with it such a string of pearls as these are like a house or an estate and when they change hands the vendor of them must give every satisfaction as to how he came by them and prove how he can give to the purchaser a good right and title to them Pshaw! said sweeney todd who will question you who are well known to be in the trade and to be continually dealing in such things that's all very fine but i don't see why i should give you the full value of an article without evidence as to how you came by it in other words you mean you don't care how i came by them provided i sell them to you at a thief's price but if i want their value you mean to be particular <laughs> my good sir you may conclude what you like show me you have a right to dispose of the pearls and you need to go no further than my shop for a customer i am not disposed to take that trouble so i shall bid you good night and when you want any pearls again i would certainly advise you not to be so wonderfully particular where you get them sweeney todd strode towards the door but the lapidary was not going to part with him so easy for springing over his counter with an agility one would not have expected from so old a man he was at the door in a moment and shouted at the top of his lungs stop thief stop thief stop him there he goes the big fellow with the three-cornered hat stop thief stop thief these cries uttered with great vehemence as they were could not be totally ineffective but they roused the whole neighbourhood and before sweeney todd had proceeded many yards a man made an attempt to collar him but was repulsed by such a terrific blow in his face that another person who had run half-way across the road with a similar object turned and went back again thinking it scarcely prudent to risk his own safety in apprehending a criminal for the good of the public having thus got rid of one of his foes sweeney todd with an inward determination to come back some day and be the death of the old lapidary looked anxiously about for some court down which he could plunge and so get out of sight of the many pursuers who were sure to attack him in the public streets his ignorance of the locality however was a great bar to such a proceeding for the great dread he had was that he might get down some blind alley and so be completely caged and at the mercy of those who followed him he pelted on at a tremendous speed but it was quite astonishing to see how the little old lapidary ran after him falling down every now and then and never stopping to pick himself up as people say but rolling on and getting on his feet in some miraculous manner that was quite wonderful to behold particularly in one so aged and so apparently unable to undertake any active exertion there was one thing however he could not continue doing and that was to cry stop thief for he had lost his wind and was quite incapable of uttering a word how long he would have continued to chase is doubtful but his career was suddenly put to an end as regards that by tripping his foot over a projecting stone in the pavement and shooting headlong down a cellar which was open but abler persons than the little old lapidary had taken up the chase and sweeney todd was hard pressed and although he ran very fast the provoking thing was that in consequence of the cries and shouts of his pursuers new people took up the chase who were fresh and vigorous and close to him there is something awful in seeing a human being thus hunted down by his fellows and although we can have no sympathy with a man such as sweeney todd 
because from all that has happened we begin to have some very horrible suspicion concerning him still as a general principle it does not decrease the fact that it is a dreadful thing to see a human being hunted through the streets on he flew at the top of his speed striking down whoever opposed him until at last many who could have outrun him gave up the chase not liking to encounter the knock-down blow which such a hand as his seemed capable of inflicting his teeth were set and his breathing came short and laborious just as a man sprung out at a shop door and succeeded in laying hold of him <laughs> i have got you have i he said sweeney todd uttered not a word but puffing forth an amount of strength that was perfectly prodigious he seized the man by a great handful of his hair and by his clothes behind and flung him through the shop window smashing glass framework and everything in his progress the man gave a shriek for it was his own shop and he was a dealer in fancy goods of the most flimsy texture so that the smash with which he came down among his stock and trade produced at once what the haberdashers are so delighted with in the present day a ruinous sacrifice this occurrence had a great effect upon sweeney todd's pursuers it taught them the practical wisdom of not interfering with a man possessed evidently of such tremendous powers of mischief and consequently as just about this period of defeat the little lapidary took place he got considerably the start of his pursuers but he was by no means yet safe the cry of stop thief still sounded in his ears and on he flew panting with the exertion he made until he heard a man behind him say turn into the second court on your right and you will be safe i'll follow you they shan't nab you if i can help it sweeney todd had not much confidence in human nature it was not likely he would but panting and exhausted as he was the voice of anyone speaking in friendly accents was welcome and rather impulsively than from reflection he darted down the second court to his right end of chapter seven chapter eight of the string of pearls by unknown this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information, or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 8. The Thieves' Home In a very few minutes, Sweeney Todd found that this court had no thoroughfare, and therefore there was no outlet or escape, but he immediately concluded that something more was to be found than was at first sight to be seen, and, casting a furtive glance beside him in the direction in which he had come, rested his hand upon a door which stood close by. The door gave way, and Sweeney Todd hearing, as he imagined, a noise in the street, dashed in and closed the door, and then he, heedless of all consequences, walked to the end of a long, dirty passage, and, pushing open a door, descended a short flight of steps, to the bottom of which he had scarcely got, when the door which faced him at the bottom of the stairs opened by some hand, and he suddenly found himself in the presence of a number of men seated round a large table. In an instant all eyes were turned towards Sweeney Todd, who was quite unprepared for such a scene, and for a minute he knew not what to say, but, as indecision was not Sweeney Todd's characteristic, he at once advanced to the table and sat down. There was some surprise evinced by the persons who were seated in that room, of whom there were many more than a score, and much talking was going on among them, which did not appear to cease on his entrance. Those who were near him looked hard at him, but nothing was said for some minutes, and Sweeney Todd looked about to understand, if he could, how he was placed, though it could not be much of a matter of doubt as to the character of the individuals present. Their looks were often an index to their vocations, for all grades of the worst characters were there, and some of them were by no means complimentary to human nature, for there were some of the most desperate characters that were to be found in London. They were dressed in various fashions, some after the manner of the city, some more gay, some half-military, while not a few wore the garb of countrymen, 
but there was in all that an air of scampish, off-hand behavior, not unmixed with brutality. "'Friend,' said one, who sat near him, "'how came you here? Are you known here?' "'I came here because I found the door open, and I was told by someone to come here as I was pursued.' "'Pursued? Aye, someone running after me, you know.' "'I know what being pursued is,' replied the man. "'And yet I know nothing of you.' "'That is not at all astonishing,' said Sweeney, "'seeing that I never saw you before, nor you me. "'But that makes no difference. "'I'm in difficulties, and I suppose a man may do his best to escape the consequences.' "'Yes, he may. "'Yet there is no reason why he should come here. "'This is a place for free friends, who know and aid one another.' "'And such I am willing to be. "'But at the same time I must have a beginning.' I cannot be initiated without someone introducing me. I have sought protection, and I have found it. If there be any objection to my remaining here any longer, I will leave. No, no, said a tall man on the other side of the table. I have heard what you said, and we do not usually allow any such things. You have come here unasked, and now we must have a little explanation. Our own safety may demand it. At all events, we have our customs, and they must be complied with. And what are your customs? demanded Todd. This. You must answer the questions which we shall propound unto you. Now answer truly what we shall ask of you. Speak, said Todd. And I will answer all that you propose to me, if possible. We will not tax you too hardly, depend upon it. Who are you? Candidly, then, said Todd. That's a question I do not like to answer, nor do I think it is one that you ought to ask. It is an inconvenient thing to name oneself. You must pass by that inquiry. Shall we do so? inquired the interrogator of those around him, and, gathering his cue from their looks, he, after a brief pause, continued. Well, we will pass over that, seeing it is not necessary. But you must tell us what you are. Cut purse, foot pad, or what not? I am neither. Then tell us in your own words, said the man, and be candid with us. What are you? I am an artificial pearl maker, or a sham pearl maker, whichever way you please to call it. A sham pearl maker? That may be an honest trade for all we know, and that will hardly be your passport to our house, friend sham pearl maker. That may be as you say, replied Todd but I will challenge any man to equal me in my calling. I have made pearls that would pass with almost a lapidary, and which would pass with nearly all the nobility. I begin to understand you, friend, but I would wish to have some proof of what you say. We may hear a very good tale, and yet none of it shall be true. We are not the men to be made dupes of. Besides, there are enough to take vengeance if we desire it. Aye, to be sure there is said a gruff voice from the other end of the table, which was echoed from one to the other till it came to the top of the table. Proof, proof, proof now resounded from one end of the room to the other. "'My friends,' said Sweeney Todd, rising up and advancing to the table, and thrusting his hand into his bosom, and drawing out the string of twenty-four pearls. "'I challenge you, or any one, to make a set of artificial pearls equal to these. They are my make, and I'll stand to it in any reasonable sum that you cannot bring a man who shall beat me in my calling. Just hand them to me, said the man who had made himself interrogator. Sweeney Todd threw the pearls on the table carelessly and then said, There, look at them well. They'll bear it. And I reckon, though there may be some good judges amongst you, that you cannot any of you tell them from real pearls, if you had not been told so. Oh, yes, we know pretty well, said the man, what these things are. We have now and then a good string in our possession, and that helps us to judge of them. Well, this is certainly a good imitation. Let me see it, said a fat man. I was bred a jeweller, and I might say born, only I couldn't stick to it. Nobody likes working for years upon little pay. No fun with the gals. I say, hand it here. Well, said Todd, if you or anybody ever produced as good an imitation, 
I'll swallow the whole string. And, knowing there's poison in the composition, it would certainly not be a comfortable thing to think of. Certainly not, said the big man. Certainly not. But hand them over, and I'll tell you all about it. The pearls were given into his hands, and Sweeney Todd felt some misgivings about his precious charge, yet he showed it not, for he turned to the man who sat beside him, saying, If he can tell two pearls from them, he knows more than I think he does, for I am a maker, and have often had the true pearl in my hand. And I suppose, said the man, you have tried your hand at puffing the one for the other, so doing your confiding customers. Yes. Yes, that is the dodge. I can see very well, said another man, winking at the first. And a good one, too. I have known them do so with diamonds. Yes, but never with pearls. However, there are some trades that it is desirable to know. You're right. The fat man now carefully examined the pearls and set them down on the table and looked hard at them. There now, I told you I could bother you. You are not so good a judge that you would not have known, if you had not been told they were sham pearls, but what they were real. I must say, you have produced the best imitations I have ever seen. Why, you ought to make your fortune in a few years, a handsome fortune. So I should, but for one thing. And what is that? The difficulty, said Todd, of getting rid of them. If you ask anything below their value, you are suspected, and you run the chance of being stopped and losing them at the least, and perhaps entail a prosecution. Very true, but there is risk in everything. We all run risks, but then the harvest. That may be, said Todd. But this is peculiarly dangerous. I have not the means of getting introductions to the nobility themselves, and if I had I should be doubted for they would say, a workman cannot come honestly by such valuable things. And then I must concoct a tale to escape the mayor of London. Ha, ha, ha. Well, then, you can take them to a goldsmith. There are not so many of them who would do so. They would not deal in them, and moreover, I have been to one or two of them. As for a lapidary, why, he is not so easily cheated. Have you tried? I did and had to make the best of my way out, pursued as quickly as they could run, and I thought at one time I must have been stopped. But a few lucky turns brought me clear, when I was told to turn up this court, and I came in here. Well, said one man, who had been examining the pearls. Did the lapidary find out they were not real? Yes, he did, and he wanted to stop me and the string altogether for trying to impose upon him. However, I made a rush at the door, which he tried to shut, but I was the stronger man, and here I am. It has been a close chance for you, said one. Yes, it just has, replied Sweeney, taking up the string of pearls which he replaced in his clothes and continued to converse with some of those around him. Things now subsided into their general course, and little notice was taken of Sweeney. There was some drink on the board, of which all partook. Sweeney had some, too, and took the precaution of emptying his pockets before them all, and gave a share of his money to pay their footing. This was policy, and they all drank to his success, and were very good companions. Sweeney, however, was desirous of getting out as soon as he could, and more than once cast his eyes towards the door, but he saw there were eyes upon him, and dared not excite suspicion, for he might undo all that he had done. To lose the precious treasure he possessed would be maddening, he had succeeded to admiration in inducing the belief that what he showed them was merely a counterfeit, but he knew so well that they were real, and that a latent feeling that they were humbugged might be hanging about, and that at the first suspicious movement he would be watched, and some desperate attempt would be made to make him give them up. It was with no small violence to his own feelings that he listened to their conversation, and appeared to take an interest in their proceedings. Well said one, who sat next him. I'm just off for the north road. Any fortune there? Not much, and yet I mustn't complain. These last three weeks, the best I have had has been two sixties. Well, that would do very well. Yes, the last man I stopped was a regular Luby Londoner. 
he appeared like a don complete tip-top man of fashion but lord when i came to look over him he hadn't as much as would carry me twenty-four miles on the road indeed don't you think he had any hidden about him they do so now ah oh, ah oh. returned another well said old fellow tis a true remark we can't always judge a man from appearances lord bless me now who'd have thought your swell cove proved to be out of luck well i'm sorry for you but you notice a long lane that has no turning as mr somebody says so perhaps you'll be more fortunate another time but come cheer up whilst i relate an adventure that occurred a little time ago twas a slice of good luck i assure you for i had no difficulty in bouncing my victim out of a good swag of tin for you know farmers returning from market are not always too wary and careful especially as the lots of wine they take at the market dinners make the cosy old boys ripe and mellow for sleep well i met one of these jolly gentlemen mounted on horseback who declared he had nothing but a few paltry guineas about him however that would not do i searched him and found a hundred and four pounds secreted about his person where did you find it about him i tore his clothes to ribbons a pretty figure he looked upon horseback i assure you by jove i could hardly help laughing at him in fact i did laugh at him which so enraged him that he immediately threatened to horsewhip me and yet he dared not defend his money but i threatened to shoot him and that soon brought him to his senses i should imagine so did you ever have a fight for it inquired sweeney todd yes several times ah it's by no means an easy life you may depend it is free but dangerous i've been fired at six or seven times so many yes i was near york once when i stopped a gentleman i thought him an easy conquest but not so he turned out for he was a regular devil resisted you yes he did i was coming along when i met him and i demanded his money i can keep it myself he said and do not want any assistance to take care of it but i want it said i your money or your life you must have both for we are not to be parted he said presenting his pistol at me and then i had only time to escape from the effect of the shot i struck the pistol up with my riding whip and the bullet passed by my temples and almost stunned me i cocked and fired he did the same but i hit him and he fell he fired however but missed me i was down upon him he begged hard for life did you give it him yes i dragged him to one side of the road and then left him having done so much i mounted my horse and came away as fast as i could and then i made for london and spent a merry day or two there i can imagine you must enjoy your trips into the country and then you must have still greater relish for the change when you come to london the change is so great and so entire so it is but have you never any run of luck in your line i should think you must at times succeed in tricking the public yes yes said todd now and then we but i tell you it is only now and then and i have been afraid of doing too much to small sums i have been a gainer but i want to do something grand i tried it on but at the same time i have failed that is bad but you may have more opportunities by and by luck is all chance yes replied todd that is true but the sooner the better for i am growing impatient conversation now went on each man speaking of his exploits which were always some species of rascality and robbery accompanied by violence generally some were midnight robbers and breakers into people's houses in fact all the crimes that could be imagined this place was in fact a complete home or rendezvous for thieves cut purses highwaymen footpads and burglars of every grade and description a formidable set of men of the most determined and desperate appearance sweeney todd hardly knew how to rise and leave the place though it was now growing very late and he was most anxious to get safe out of the den he was in but how to do that was a problem yet to be solved what is the time he muttered to the man next to him past midnight was the reply then i must leave here he answered for i have work that i must be at in a very short time and i shall not have too much time so saying he watched his opportunity and rising walked up to the door which he opened and went out after that he walked up the five steps that led to the passage and this latter had hardly been gained when the street door opened and another man came in at the same moment and met him face to face what do you here i am going out said sweeney todd 
You are going back. Come back with me. I will not, said Todd. You must be a better man than I am if you make me do my best to resist your attack, if you intend to make one. That I do, replied the man, and he made a determined rush upon Sweeney, who was scarcely prepared for such a sudden onslaught, and was pushed back till he came to the head of the stairs, where a struggle took place, and both rolled down the steps. The door was immediately thrown open, and every one rushed out to see what was the matter, but it was some moments before they could make it out. "'What does he do here?' said the first, as soon as he could speak, and pointing to Sweeney Todd. "'It's all right.' "'All wrong, I say.' "'He's a shampoo maker, and has shown us a string of shampoos that are beautiful. <laughs> I will insist on seeing them. Give them to me,' he said. Why you do not leave this place? I will not, said Sweeney. You must. Here, help me. But I don't want help. I can do it by myself. As he spoke, he made a desperate attempt to collar Sweeney and put him to the earth, but he had miscalculated his strength when he imagined that he was superior to Todd, who was by far the more powerful man of the two, and resisted the attack with success. Suddenly, by a Herculean effort, he caught his adversary below the waist, and lifting him up, threw him upon the floor with great force, and then, not wishing to see how the gang would take this, whether they would take the part of their companion, or of himself, he knew not. He thought he had an advantage in the distance, and he rushed upstairs as fast as he could, and reached the door before they could overtake him to prevent him. Indeed, for more than a minute they were irresolute what to do, but they were somehow prejudiced in favor of their companion, and they rushed up after Sweeney just as he got to the door. He would have had time to escape them, but by some means the door became fast, and he could not open it, exert himself how he would. There was no time to lose. They were coming to the head of the stairs, and Sweeney had hardly time to reach the stairs to fly upwards when he felt himself grasped by the throat. This he soon released himself from, for he struck the man who seized him a heavy blow, and he fell backwards, and Todd found his way up to the first floor, but he was closely pursued. Here was another struggle, and again Sweeney Todd was the victor, but he was hard-pressed by those who followed him. Fortunately for him there was a mop left in a pail of water. This he seized hold of, and, swinging it over his head, he brought it full on the head of the first man who came near him. Dab it came, soft and wet, and splashed over some others who were close at hand. It is astonishing what an effect a new weapon will sometimes have. There was not a man among them who would not have faced danger in more ways than one, that would not have rushed headlong upon deadly and destructive weapons, but who were quite awed when a heavy wet mop was dashed into their faces. They were completely paralyzed for a moment. Indeed, they began to look upon it something between a joke and a serious matter, and either would have been taken just as they might be termed. "'Get the pearls!' shouted the man who had first stopped him. "'Seize this boy! Seize him! Secure him! Rush at him! You are men enough to hold one man!' Sweeney Todd saw matters were growing serious, and he plied his mop most vigorously upon those who were ascending, but they had become somewhat used to the mop, and it had lost much of its novelty, and was by no means a dangerous weapon. They rushed on, despite the heavy blows showered by Sweeney, and he was compelled to give way stair after stair. The head of the mop came off, and then there remained but the handle, which formed an efficient weapon, and which made a fearful havoc on the heads of the assailants. And despite all that their slouched hats could do in the way of protecting them, yet the staff came with a crushing effect. The best fight in the world cannot last for ever, and Sweeney again found numbers were not to be resisted for long, Indeed, he could not have physical energy enough to sustain his own efforts, supposing he had received no blows in return. He turned and fled, as he was forced back to the landing, and then came to the next stairhead, and again he made a desperate stand. This went on for stair after stair, and continued for more than two or three hours. There were moments of cessation when they all stood and looked at each other. "'Fire upon him,' said one. "'No, no, we shall have the authorities down upon us.' and then all will go wrong. I think we had much better have let it alone in the first place, as he was in, for you may be sure this won't make him keep a secret. We shall all be split upon as sure as fate. Well, then rush upon him and down with him. Never let him out. On to him. Hurrah! 
Away they went, but they were resolutely met by the staff of Sweeney Todd, who had gained new strength by the short rest he had had. Down with the spy! This was shouted out by the men, but as each of them approached, they were struck down and at length finding himself on the second floor landing, and being fearful that someone was descending from above, he rushed into one of the inner rooms. In an instant he had locked the doors, which were strong and powerful. Now, he muttered, for means to escape. He waited a moment to wipe the sweat from his brow, and then he crossed the floor to the windows, which were open. They were the old-fashioned bag windows, with the heavy ornamental work which some houses possessed, and overhung the low doorways and protected them from the weather. This will do, he said, as he looked down to the pavement. This will do. I will try this descent if I fall. The people on the other side of the door were exerting all their force to break it open, and it had already given one or two ominous creaks, and a few minutes more would probably let them into the room. The streets were clear, no human being was moving about, and there were faint signs of the approaching morning. He paused a moment to inhale the fresh air, and then he got outside the window. By means of the sound oaken ornaments, he contrived to get down to the drawing-room balcony, and then he soon got down to the street. As he walked away he could hear the crash of the door, and a slight cheer, as they entered the room, and he could imagine to himself the appearance of the faces of those who entered, when they found the bird had flown, and the room was empty. Sweeney Todd had not far to go. He soon turned into Fleet Street, and made for his own house. He looked about him, but there was none near him. He was tired and exhausted, and right glad was he when he found himself at his own door. Then stealthily he put the key into the door, and slowly entered the house. End of chapter 8 Chapter 9 of The String of Pearls by Unknown. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 9 Joanna at Home and the Resolution. Joanna Oakley would not allow Colonel Jeffrey to accompany her all the way home, and he, appreciating the scruples of the young girl, did not press his attention on her, but left her at the corner of Fourth Street, after getting a half-promise that she would meet him again on that day week, at the same hour, in the Temple Gardens. "'I ask this of you, Joanna Oakley,' he said, "'because I have resolved to make all the exertion in my power to discover what has become of Mr. Thornhill.' in whose fate I am sure I have succeeded in interesting you, although you care so little for the string of pearls which he has in trust for you. I do indeed care little for them, said Joanna, so little that it might be said to amount to nothing. But still they are yours, and you ought to have the option of disposing of them as you please. It is not well to despise such gifts of fortune, for if you can yourself do nothing with them, there are surely some others whom you may know upon whom they would bestow great happiness. A string of pearls, great happiness, said Joanna, inquiringly. Your mind is so occupied by your grief that you quite forget such strings are of great value. I have seen those pearls, Joanna, and can assure you that they are in themselves a fortune. I suppose, she said sadly, it is too much for human nature to expect two blessings at once. I had the fond warm heart that loved me without a fortune, that would have enabled us to live in comfort and affluence. And now, when well, that is perchance within my grasp, the heart that was by far the most costly possession, and the richest jewel of them all, lies beneath the wave, with its bright influences, and its glorious and romantic aspirations, quenched for ever. You will meet me, then, as I request of you, to hear if I have any news for you? I will endeavour to do so. I have all the will, but heaven knows if I may have the power. What mean you, Joanna? I cannot tell what a week's anxiety may do. I know not, but that a sick bed may be my resting place, until I exchange it for the tomb. I feel even now my strength fail me, and I am scarcely able to totter to my home. Farewell, sir. I owe you my best thanks, as well for the trouble you have taken, as for the kindly manner in which you have detailed to me what has passed. Remember, said Colonel Jeffrey, that I bid you adieu with the hope of meeting you again. It was thus they parted, 
and Joanna proceeded to her father's house. Who now that had met her, and chanced not to see that sweet face, which could never be forgotten, would have supposed her to be the once gay and sprightly Joanna Oakley. Her steps were sad and solemn, and all the juvenile elasticity of her frame seemed to be gone. She seemed like one prepared for death and she hoped that she would be able to glide, silently and unobserved, to her own little bedchamber, that chamber where she had slept since she was a little child, and on the little couch, on which she had so often laid down to sleep, that holy and calm slumber which such hearts as hers can only know. But she was doomed to be disappointed, for the Reverend Mr. Lupin was still there, and as Mrs. Oakley had placed before that pious individual a great assortment of creature comforts, and among the rest some mulled wine, which seemed particularly to agree with him, he showed no disposition to depart. It unfortunately happened that this wine, of which the reverend gentleman partook, with such a holy relish, was kept in a cellar, and Mrs. Oakley had had occasion twice to go down to procure a fresh supply, and it was on a third journey for the same purpose that she encountered poor Joanna, who had just let herself in at the private door. "'Oh, you've come home, have you?' said Mrs. Oakley. I wonder where you've been to, gallivanting. But I suppose I may wonder long enough before you will tell me. Go into the parlour. I want to speak with you. Now poor Joanna had quite forgotten the very existence of Mr. Lupin. So, rather than explain to her mother, which would beget more questions, she wished to go to bed at once, notwithstanding it was an hour before the usual time for so doing. She walked unsuspectingly into the parlour, and as Mr. Lupin was sitting, the slightest movement of his chair closed the door, so she could not escape. Under any other circumstances probably Joanna would have insisted upon leaving the apartment, but a glance at the countenance of the pious individual was quite sufficient to convince her he had been sacrificing sufficiently to Bacchus to be capable of any amount of effrontery, so that she dreaded passing him, more especially as he swayed his arms about like the sails of a windmill." She thought, at least, that when her mother returned she would rescue her, but in that hope she was mistaken, and Joanna had no more idea of the extent to which religious fanaticism will carry its victim than she had of the manners and customs of the inhabitants of the moon. When Mrs. Oakley did return, she had some difficulty in getting into the apartment, inasmuch as Mr. Lupin's chair occupied so large a portion of it, but when she did obtain admission, and Joanna said, Mother! I beg of you to protect me against this man, and allow me a free passage from the apartment. Mrs. Oakley affected to lift up her hands in amazement, as she said, How dare you speak so disrespectfully of a chosen vessel? How dare you? I say do such a thing. It's enough to drive anyone mad to see young girls nowadays. Don't snub her. Don't snub the virgin, said Mr. Lupin. She don't know the honor yet that's intended her. She don't deserve it, said Mrs. Oakley. She don't deserve it. Never mind, madam. Never mind. We, we, we don't get all what we deserve in this world. Take a drop of something, Mr. Lupin. You've got the hiccups. Yes, I, I rather think I have a little. Isn't it a shame that anybody so intimate with the Lord should have the hiccups? What a lot of lights you have got burning, Mrs. Oakley. A lot of lights, Mr. Lupin. Why, there's only one. But perhaps you allude to the lights of the gospel. No, I I don't, just at present. Damn the lights of the gospel. That is, I mean, damn all backsliders. But there is a lot of lights, and no mistake, Mrs. Oakley. Give us a drop of something. I am as dry as dust. There is some more mulled wine, Mr. Lupin, but I am surprised that you think there is more than one light. It is a miracle, madam, in consequence of my great faith. I have faith in six lights, and here they are. Do you see that, Johanna? exclaimed Mrs. Oakley. Are you not convinced now of the holiness of Mr. Lupin? I am convinced of his drunkenness, mother, and entreat of you to let me leave the room at once. Tell her of the honour, said Mr. Lupin. Tell her of the honour. I don't know, Mr. Lupin, but don't you think it would be better to take some other opportunity? Very well, then. This is the opportunity. If it is your pleasure, Mr. Lupin, I will. You must know, then, Johanna, that Mr. Lupin has been kind enough to consent to save my soul on condition that you marry him. 
and I am quite sure you can have no reasonable objection. Indeed, I think it's the least you can do, whether you have any objection or not. Well put, said Mr. Lupin. Excellently well put. Mother, said Joanna, if you are so far gone in superstition as to believe this miserable drunkard ought to come between you and heaven, I am not so lost as not to be able to reject the offer, with more scorn and contempt than ever I thought I could have entertained for any human being. But hypocrisy never, to my mind, wears so disgusting a garb as when it attires itself in the outward show of religion. This conduct is unbearable, cried Mrs. Oakley. Am I to have one of the Lord's saints insulted under my own roof? If he were ten times a saint, mother, instead of being nothing but a miserable drunken profligate, it would be better that he should be insulted ten times over than that you should permit your own child to have passed through the indignity of having to reject such a proposition as that which has just been made. I must claim the protection of my father. He will not suffer one, towards whom he has ever shown his affection, the remembrance of a which sinks deep into my heart, to meet with so cruel an insult beneath his roof. That's right, my dear, said Mr. Oakley, at that moment pushing open the parlour door. That's right, my dear. You never spoke truer words in your life. A faint scream came from Mrs. Oakley, and the Reverend Mr. Lupin immediately seized upon the fresh jug of mulled wine and finished it at a draught. Get behind me, Satan, he said. Mr. Oakley, you'll be damned if you say a word to me. It's all the same, then, said Mr. Oakley, for I'll be damned if I don't. Then, Ben, Ben, come. Come in, Ben. I'm coming said a deep voice, and a man about six feet four inches in height, and nearly two-thirds of that amount in width, entered the parlour. I'm a coming, Oakley, my boy. Put on your blessed spectacles, and tell me which is the fellow. I could have sworn, said Mrs. Oakley, as she gave the table a knock with her fist. I could have sworn, sworn, when you came in, Oakley. I could have sworn, you little snivelling, shrivelled-up wretch, You'd no more have dared to come into this parlour as never was with those words in your mouth than you'd have dared to have flown if you hadn't had your cousin Big Ben the beef eater from the tower with you. Take it easy, ma'am, said Ben, as he sat down in a chair, which immediately broke all to pieces with his weight. Take it easy, ma'am. The devil. What's this? Never mind, Ben, said Mr. Oakley. It's only a chair. Get up. A cheer? said Ben. Do you call that a cheer? But never mind. Take it easy. Why, you big bully and idle swillin' and guttlin' ruffian. Go on, ma'am. Go on. You good-for-nothing lump of carrion. A dog wears his own coat, but you wear your master's, you great, stupid, overgrown, lurking hound. You perish brought-up wild beast. Go and mind your lions and elephants in the tower. And don't come into honest people's houses, you cut-throat bully and pickpocketing wretch. Go on, ma'am, go on. This was a kind of dialogue that could not last, and Mrs. Oakley sat down exhausted, and then Ben said, I tell you what, ma'am, I considers you, I looks upon you, ma'am, as a female variety of that ere animal, as is very useful and sagacious, ma'am. There was no mistake in this allusion, and Mrs. Oakley was about to make some reply, when the Reverend Mr. Lupin rose from his chair, saying, Bless you all, I think I'll go home. Not yet, Mr. Tulip, said Ben. You had better sit down again. We've got something to say to you. Young man, young man, let me pass. If you do not, you will endanger your soul. I ain't got none, said Ben. I'm only a beef eater, and I don't pretend to such luxuries. The heathen, exclaimed Mrs. Oakley. The horrid heathen. But there's one consolation, and that is, that he will be fried in his own fat for everlasting. Oh, that's nothing, said Ben. I think I shall like it, especially if it's any pleasure to you. I suppose that's what you call a Christian consolation. Will you sit down, Mr. Chitlip? My name ain't Tulip, but Lupin. But if you wish it, I don't mind sitting down, of course. The beef-eater, with a movement of his foot, kicked away the reverend gentleman's chair and down he sat with a dab upon the floor. "'My dear,' said Mr. Oakley to Joanna, "'you go to bed, and then your mother can't say you have anything to do with this affair. I intend to rid my house of this man. Good night, my dear, good night.' 
Joanna kissed her father on the cheek, and then left the room, not at all sorry that so vigorous a movement was being made for the suppression of Mr. Lupin. When she was gone, Mrs. Oakley spoke, saying, "'Mr. Lupin, I bid you good night, and of course after the rough treatment of these wretches, I can hardly expect you to come again. Good night, Mr. Lupin, good night.' "'That's all very well, ma'am,' said Ben. "'But before this here wild beast of a parson goes away, I want to admonish him. He doesn't seem to be wide awake, and I must rouse him up.' Ben took hold of the reverend gentleman's nose, and gave it such an awful pinch, that when he took his finger and thumb away, it was perfectly blue. "'Murder! Oh, murder! My nose! My nose!' shrieked Mr. Lupin, and at that moment Mrs. Oakley, who was afraid to attack Ben, gave her husband such an open-handed whack on the side of his head that the little man reeled again, and saw a great many more lights than the reverend Mr. Lupin had done under the influence of the mulled wine." "'Very good,' said Ben. "'Now we're getting into the thick of it.' With this Ben took from his pocket a coil of rope, one end of which was a noose, and that he dexterously threw over Mrs. Oakley's head. "'Murder!' she shrieked. "'Oakley, are you going to see me murdered before your eyes?' "'There is such a singing in my ears,' said Mr. Oakley, "'that I can't see anything.' "'This is the way,' said Ben." We manages the wild beastesses when they shut their ears to all sorts of argument. Now, ma'am, if you please, a little this way. Ben looked about until he found a strong hook in the wall, over which, in consequence of his great height, he was enabled to draw the rope, and the other end of it he tied securely to the leg of a heavy secretaire that was in the room, so that Mrs. Oakley was well secured. Murder! she cried. Oakley! Are you a man that you stand by and see me treated in this way by a big brute? I can't see anything, said Mr. Oakley. There is such a singing in my ears. I told you so before. I can't see anything. Now, ma'am, you may just say what you like, said Ben. It won't matter a bit, any more than the grumbling of a bear with a sore head. And as for your Mr. Tulip, you'll just get down on your knees and beg Mr. Oakley's pardon for coming and drinking his tea without his leave, and having the infernal impudence to speak to his daughter. Don't do it, Mr. Lupin, cried Mrs. Oakley. Don't do it. You hear, said Ben, what the lady advises. Now I am quite different. I advise you to do it, for if you don't, I shan't hurt you. But it strikes me I'll be obliged to fall on you and crush you. I think I will, said Mr. Lupin. The saints were always forced to yield to the Philistines. If you call me any names, said Ben, I'll just wring your neck. Young man, young man, let me exhort you. Allow me to go, and I will put up prayers for your conversion. Confound your imprudence. What do you suppose the beast in the tower would do if I was converted? Why, that here tiger we have had lately would eat his own tail to think I'd turned out such an ass. Come, I can't waste any more of my precious time. And if you don't get down on your knees directly, we'll see what we can do. I must, said Mr. Lupin. I must, I suppose. And down he flopped on his knees. Very good. Now repeat after me. I am a wolf that stole sheep's clothing. Yes, I am a wolf that stole sheep's clothing. The Lord forgive me. Perhaps he may, and perhaps he mayn't. Now go on. All that's virtuous is my loathing. Oh, dear, yes. All that's virtuous is my loathing. Mr. Oakley, I have offended. Yes, I am a miserable sinner, Mr. Oakley. I have offended. And ask his pardon on my bended. Oh, dear, yes. I ask his pardon on my bended. The Lord have mercy on us miserable sinners. Knees, I won't do so more. Yes, knees. I won't do so more. As sure as I lies on this floor. Yes, as sure as I lies on this floor. Death and the devil, you've killed me. Ben took hold of the reverend gentleman by the back of the neck and pressed his head down upon the floor until his nose, which had before been such a sufferer, was nearly completely flattened with his face. Now you may go, said Ben. Mr. Lupin scrambled to his feet, but Ben followed him into the passage, 
and did not yet let him go until he had accelerated his movements by two hearty kicks, and then the victorious beef-eater returned to the parlor. "'Why, Ben?' said Mr. Oakley. "'You are quite a poet.' "'I believe you, Oakley, my boy,' said Ben. "'And now, let us be off and have a pint round the corner.' "'What?' exclaimed Mrs. Oakley. "'And leave me here, you wretches?' yes said ben unless you promises never to be a female variety of the useful animal again and begs pardon of mr oakley for giving him all this trouble as for me i'll let you off cheap you shall only have to give me a kiss and say you loves me if i do may i be damned you mean no i don't choked i was going to say then you may be choked for you have nothing to do but let your legs go from under you and you will be young as comfortable as possible. Come along, Oakley. Mr. Oakley, stop! Stop! Don't leave me here. I am sorry. That's enough, said Mr. Oakley. And now, my dear, bear in mind one thing from me. I intend, from this time forward, to be master in my own house. If you and I are to live together, you must do so on very different terms to what we have been living, and if you won't make yourself agreeable, lawyer hutchins tells me that i can turn you out and give you a maintenance and in that case i'll have home my sister rachel to mind house for me so now you know my determination and what you have to expect if you wish to begin we'll do so at once by getting something nice and tasty for ben's supper mrs oakley made the required promise and being released she set about preparations for the supper in real earnest but whether she was really subdued or not, we shall, in due time, see. End of chapter 9「Chapter 10 of The String of Pearls by Unknown. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 10 The Colonel and His Friend Colonel Jeffrey was not at all satisfied with the state of affairs, as regarded the disappearance of Mr. Thornhill, for whom he entertained a very sincere regard, both on the account of the private estimation in which he held him, and on account of actual services rendered by Thornhill to him. Not to detain Joanna Oakley in the Temple Gardens, he had stopped his narrative, completely at the point when what concerned her had ceased, and had said nothing of much danger which the ship Neptune and its crew and passengers had gone through, after Mr. Thornhill had been taken on board with his dog. The fact is, the storm which he had mentioned was only the first of a series of gales of wind that buffeted the ship for some weeks, doing it much damage, and enforcing almost the necessity of puffing in somewhere for repairs. But a glance at the map will be sufficient to show that, situated as the Neptune was, the nearest port at which they could at all expect assistance was the British colony at the Cape of Good Hope but such was the contrary nature of the winds and waves, that just upon the evening of a tempestuous day they found themselves bearing down close to shore on the eastern coast of Madagascar. There was much apprehension that the vessel would strike on a rocky shore, but the water was deep and the vessel rode well. There was a squall, and they let go both anchors to secure the vessel, as they were so close in shore, lest they should be driven in and stranded. It was fortunate they had so secured themselves, for the gale, while it lasted, blew half a hurricane, and the ship lost some of her masts, and some other trifling damage, which, however, entailed upon them the necessity of remaining there a few days, to cut timber to repair their masts, and to obtain a few supplies. There is but little to interest a general reader in the description of a gale. Order after order was given until the masts and spars went one by one, and then the orders for clearing the wreck were given. There was much work to be done, and but little pleasure in doing it, for it was wet and miserable while it lasted, and there was the danger of being driven upon a lee shore, and knocked to pieces upon the rocks. This danger was averted, and they anchored safe at a very short distance from the shore, in comparative safety and security. "'We are safe now,' remarked the captain, as he gave his second-in-command charge of the deck, and approached Mr. Thornhill and Colonel Jeffrey. "'I am happy it is so.' replied Geoffrey. "'Well, Captain,' said Mr. Thornhill, "'I'm glad we have done with being knocked about. We are anchored, and the water here appears smooth enough.' 
it is so and i dare say it will remain so it is a beautiful basin of deep water deep and good anchorage but you see it is not large enough to make a fine harbour true but it is rocky it is and that may make it sometimes dangerous but i don't know that it would be so in some gales the sea may beat in at the opening which is deep enough for anything to enter even noah's ark could enter there easily enough what will you do now stay here for a day or so and send boats ashore to cut some pine trees to refit the ship with masts you have no staves then not enough for such a purpose and we never do go out stored with such things you obtain them wherever you may go to yes any part of the world will furnish them in some shape or other when you send ashore will you permit me to accompany the boat's crew said geoffrey certainly but the natives of this country are violent and intractable and should you get into any row with them there is every possibility of your being captured or some bodily injury done you but i will take care to avoid that very well colonel you shall be welcome to go i must beg the same permission said mr thornhill for i should much like to see the country as well as to have some acquaintance with the natives themselves by no means trust yourself alone with them said the captain for if you live you will have cause to repent it depend upon what i say i will said thornhill i will go nowhere but where the boat's company goes you will be safe then but do you apprehend any hostile attack from the natives inquired colonel jeffrey no i do not expect it but such things have happened before to-day and i have seen them when least expected though i have been on this coast before and yet i have never met with any ill treatment but there have been many who have touched on this coast who have had a brush with the natives and come off second best the natives generally retiring when the ship's company muster strong in number and calling out the chiefs who come down in great force that we may not conquer them the next morning the boats were ordered out to go ashore with crews prepared for the cutting of timber and obtaining such staves as the ship was in want of with these boats mr thornhill and colonel jeffrey went both of them on board and after a short ride they reached the shore of madagascar it was a beautiful country and one in which vegetables appeared abundant and luxuriant and the party in search of timber for shipbuilding purposes soon came to some lordly monarchs of the forest which would have made vessels of themselves but this was not what was wanted but where the trees grew thicker and taller they began to cut some tall pine trees down this was the wood they most desired in fact it was exactly what they wanted but they hardly got through a few such trees when the natives came down upon them apparently to reconnoitre at first they are quiet and tractable enough but anxious to see and inspect everything being very inquisitive and curious however that was easily borne but at length they became more numerous and began to pilfer all they could lay their hands upon which of course brought resentment and after some time a blow or two was exchanged colonel jeffrey was forward and endeavouring to prevent some violence being offered to one of the woodcutters in fact he was interposing himself between the two contending parties and tried to restore order and peace but several armed natives rushed suddenly upon him secured him and were hurrying him away to death before any one could stir in his behalf his doom appeared certain for had they succeeded they would have cruelly and brutally murdered him however just at that moment aid was at hand and mr thornhill seeing how matters stood seized a musket from one of the sailors and rushed after the natives who had colonel jeffrey there were three of them two others had gone on to a prize it was presumed the chiefs when mr thornhill arrived they had thrown a blanket over the head of jeffrey but mr thornhill in an instant hurled one with a blow from the butt end of his musket and the second met the same fate as he turned to see what was the matter the third seeing the colonel free and the musket levelled at his own head immediately ran after the other two to avoid any serious consequences to himself thornhill you have saved my life said colonel jeffrey excitedly come away don't stop here to the ship to the ship and as he spoke they hurried after the crew and they succeeded in reaching the boats and the ship in safety 
congratulating themselves not a little upon so lucky an escape from a people quite warlike enough to do mischief but not civilized enough to distinguish when to do it when men are far away from home and in foreign lands with the skies of other climes above them their hearts become more closely knit together in those ties of brotherhood which certainly ought to actuate the whole universe but which as certainly do not do so except in very narrow circumstances one of these instances, however, would probably be found in the conduct of Colonel Jeffrey and Mr. Thornhill, even under any circumstances, for they were most emphatically what might be termed kindred spirits. But when we come to unite to that fact the remarkable manner in which they had been thrown together, and the mutual services that they had had it in their power to render each other, we should not be surprised at the almost romantic friendship that arose between them. It was then that Thornhill made the Colonel's breast, the repository of all his thoughts and all his wishes, and a freedom of intercourse and a community of feeling ensued between them, which, when it does take place between persons of really congenial dispositions, produces the most delightful results of human companionship. No one who has not endured the tedium of a sea voyage can at all be aware of what a pleasant thing it is to have someone on board in the rich stores of whose intellect and fancy one can find a never-ending amusement. The winds might now whistle through the cordage, and the waves toss the great ship on their foaming crests. Still Thornhill and Geoffrey were together, finding, in the midst of danger, solace in each other's society, and each animating the other to the performance of deeds of daring that astonished the crew. The whole voyage was one of the greatest peril, and some of the oldest seamen on board did not scruple, during the continuance of their night watches, to intimate to their companions that the ship, in their opinion, would never reach England, and that she would founder somewhere along the long stretch of the African coast. The captain, of course, made every possible exertion to put a stop to such prophetic sayings, but when once they commenced, in short time there was no such thing as completely eradicating them, and they, of course, produced the most injurious effect, paralyzing the exertions of the crew in times of danger, and making them believe that they are in a doomed ship, and, consequently, all they can do is useless. Sailors are extremely superstitious on such matters, and there cannot be any reasonable doubt but that some of the disasters that befell the Neptune on her homeward voyage from India may be attributable to this feeling of fatality getting hold of the seamen and inducing them to think that, let them try what they might, they could not save the ship. It happened that after they had rounded the Cape, a dense fog came on, such as had not been known on that coast for many a year, although the western shore of Africa, at some seasons of the year, is subject to such a species of vaporous exhalation. Every object was wrapped in the most profound gloom, and yet there was a strong eddy or current of the ocean, flowing parallel with the land, and as the captain hoped, rather off than on the shore. In consequence of this fear, the greatest anxiety prevailed on board the vessel, and lights were left burning on all parts of the deck, while two men were continually engaged making soundings. It was about half an hour after midnight, as the chronometer indicated a storm, that suddenly the men, who were on watch on the deck, raised a loud cry of alarm. They had suddenly seen, close to the larboard bow, lights which must belong to some vessel that, like the Neptune, was encompassed in the fog, and a collision was quite inevitable, for neither ship had time to put about. The only doubt, which was a fearful and agonizing one to have solved, was whether the stronger vessel was of sufficient bulk and power to run them down, or they it, and that fearful question was one which a few moments must settle. In fact, almost before the echo of that cry of horror which had come from the men had died away the vessels met. There was a hideous crash, one shriek of dismay and horror, and then all was still. The Neptune, with considerable damage, and some of the bulwarks stove in, sailed on, but the other ship went with a surging sound to the bottom of the sea. Alas, nothing could be done. The fog was so dense that, coupled, too, with the darkness of the night, there could be no hope of rescuing one of the ill-fated crew of the ship, and the officers and seamen of the Neptune, although they shouted for some time and then listened to hear if any of the survivors of the ship that had been run down were swimming, no answer came from them, and when, in about six hours more, they sailed out of the fog into a clear sunshine, where there was not so much as a cloud to be seen, they looked at each other like men newly awakened from some strange and fearful dream. 
They never discovered the name of the ship they had run down, and the whole affair remained a profound mystery. When the Neptune reached the port of London, the affair was repeated, and every exertion made to obtain some information concerning the ill-fitted ship that had met with so fearful a doom. Such were the circumstances which awakened all the liveliest feelings of gratitude on the part of Colonel Jeffrey towards Mr. Thornhill, and hence it was that he was in London, and had the necessary leisure to do so, to leave no stone unturned to discover what had become of him. After deep and anxious thought, and feeling convinced that there was some mystery which it was beyond his power to discover, he resolved upon asking the opinion of a friend, likewise in the army, a Captain Rathbone, concerning the whole of the facts. This gentleman, and a gentleman he was, in the fullest acceptation of the term, was in London. In fact, he had retired from active service, and inhabited a small but pleasant house in the outskirts of the metropolis. It was one of those old-fashioned cottage residents, with all sorts of odd places and corners about it, and a thriving garden full of fine old wood, such as are rather rare near to London, and which are daily becoming more rare, in consequence of the value of the land immediately contiguous to the metropolis not permitting large pieces to remain attached to small residences. Captain Rathbone had an amiable family about him, such as he was and might well be proud of, and was living in as great a state of domestic felicity as this world could very well afford him. It was to this gentleman, then, that Colonel Jeffrey resolved upon going to lay all the circumstances before him concerning the possible and probable fate of poor Thornhill. The distance was not so great, but that he could walk it conveniently, and he did so, arriving towards the dusk of the evening, on the day following that which had witnessed his deeply interesting interview with Joanna Oakley in the Temple Gardens. There is nothing on earth so delightfully refreshing, after a dusty and rather long country walk, as to suddenly enter a well-kept and extremely verdant garden, and this was the case especially to the feelings of Colonel Jeffrey when he arrived at Lime Tree Lodge, the residence of Captain Rathbourne. He was met with a most cordial and frank welcome, a welcome which he expected, but which was none the less delightful on that account, and after sitting a while with the family in the house, he and the captain strolled into the garden, and then Colonel Jeffrey commenced with his revelation. The captain, with very few interruptions, heard him to the end, and when he concluded by saying, And now I have come to ask your advice upon all these matters, the captain immediately replied, in his warm, off-hand manner, I'm afraid you won't find my advice of much importance, but I offer you my active cooperation in anything you think ought to be done or can be done in this affair, which, I assure you, deeply interests me, and gives me the greatest possible impulse to exertion. You have but to command me in the matter, and I am completely at your disposal. I was quite certain you would say as much, but notwithstanding the manner in which you shrink from giving an opinion, I am anxious to know what you really think with regard to what are you will allow most extraordinary circumstances. The most natural thing in the world, said Captain Rathbone, at the first flush of the affair, seemed to be that we ought to look for your friend Thornhill at the point where he disappeared. At the barber's in Fleet Street? Precisely. Did he leave or did he not? Sweeney Todd says that he left him and proceeded down the street towards the city, in pursuance of a direction he had given to Mr. Oakley, the spectacle-maker, and that he saw him get into some sort of disturbance at the end of the market. But to put against that, we have the fact of the dog remaining by the barber's door, and his refusing to leave it on any amount of solicitation. Now the very fact that a dog could act in such a way proclaims an amount of sagacity that seems to tell loudly against the presumption that such a creature could make any mistake. It does. What say you now to going into town tomorrow morning, and making a call at the barber's, without proclaiming we have any special errand except to be shaved and dressed? Do you think he would know you again? Scarcely in plain clothes. I was in my undress uniform when I called with the captain of the Neptune, so that his impression of me must be decidedly of a military character, and the probability is that he would not know me at all in the clothes of a civilian. I like the idea of giving a call at the barber's. Do you think your friend Thornhill was a man likely to talk about the valuable pearls he had in his possession? Certainly not. I merely ask you, because they might have offered a great temptation, and if he has experienced any foul play at the hands of the barber, 
the idea of becoming possessed of such a valuable treasure might have been the inducement. I do not think it probable, but it has struck me that if we obtain any information whatever of Thornhill, it will be in consequence of these very pearls. They are of great value and not likely to be overlooked, and yet, unless a customer be found for them, they are of no value at all, and nobody buys jewels of that character but from the personal vanity of making, of course, some public display of them. That is true. And so, from hand to hand, we might trace those pearls until we come to the individual who must have had them from Thornhill himself, and who might be forced to account most strictly for the manner in which they came into his possession. After some more desultory conversation upon the subject, it was agreed that Colonel Jeffrey should take a bed there for the night at Lime Tree Lodge, and that in the morning they should both start for London, and, disguising themselves as respectable citizens, make some attempts, by talking about jewels and precious stones, to draw out the barber into a confession that he had something of the sort to dispose of, and, moreover, they fully intended to take away the dog, with the care of which Captain Rathbone charged himself. We may pass over the pleasant social evening which the colonel passed with the amiable family of the Rathbones, and skipping likewise a conversation of some strange and confused dreams which Geoffrey had during the night concerning his friend Thornhill, we will presume that both the colonel and the captain have breakfast, and that they have proceeded to London and are at the shop of a clothier in the neighbourhood of the Strand, in order to procure coats, wigs, and hats, that should disguise them for their visit to Sweeney Todd. Then, arm in arm, they walked towards Fleet Street, and soon arrived opposite the little shop, within which there appears to be so much mystery. "'The dog you perceive is not here,' said the colonel. "'I had my suspicions, however, when I passed with Joanna Oakley that something was amiss with him, and I have no doubt but that the rascally barber has fairly compassed his destruction.' "'If the barber be innocent,' said Captain Rathbone, "'you must admit that it would be one of the most confoundedly annoying things in the world to have a dog continually at his door, assuming such an aspect of accusation, and in that case I can scarcely wonder at his putting the creature out of the way.' "'No, presuming upon his innocence, certainly. But we will say nothing about all that. And remember, we must come in as perfect strangers.' knowing nothing whatever of the affair of the dog, and presuming nothing about the disappearance of anyone in this locality. Agreed. Come on. If he should see us through the window, hanging about at all, or hesitating, his suspicions will be at once awakened, and we shall do no good. They both entered the shop, and found Sweeney Todd wearing an extraordinarily singular appearance, for there was a black patch over one of his eyes, which was kept in place by a green ribbon that went round his head so that he looked more fierce and diabolical than ever, and having shaved off a small whisker that he used to wear, his countenance, although to the full as hideous as ever, certainly had a different character of ugliness to that which had before characterized it, and attracted the attention of the colonel. That gentleman would hardly have known him again anywhere but in his own shop, and when we come to consider Sweeney's adventures of the preceding evening, we shall not feel surprised that he saw the necessity of endeavouring to make as much change in his appearance as possible, for fear he should come across any of the parties who had chased him, and who, for all he knew to the contrary, might, quite unsuspectingly, drop in to be shaved in the course of the morning, perhaps to retail at that acknowledged mart for all sorts of gossip, a barber's shop, some of the very incidents which he was so well qualified himself to relate. "'Shaved and dressed, gentlemen?' said Sweeney Todd, as his customers made their appearance. "'Shaved only,' said Captain Rathbone, who had agreed to be the principal spokesman in case Sweeney Todd should have any remembrance of the colonel's voice, and so suspect him. "'Pray, be seated,' said Sweeney Todd to Colonel Jeffrey. "'I'll soon polish off your friends, sir, and then I'll begin upon you. "'Would you like to see the morning paper, sir?' I was just looking myself, sir, at a most mysterious circumstance, if it's true. But you can't believe, you know, all that is put in the papers. Thank you. Thank you, said the colonel. Captain Rathbone sat down to be shaved, for he had purposely omitted that operation at home, in order that it should not appear a mere excuse to get into Sweeney Todd's shop. Why, sir, continued Sweeney Todd, as I was saying, it is a most remarkable circumstance. Indeed. Yes, sir. 
an old gentleman of the name of fiddler had been to receive a sum of money at the west end of the town and has never been heard of since that was only yesterday sir and there is a description of him in the papers of to-day a snuff coloured coat and velvet smalls black velvet i should have said silk stockings and silver shoe buckles and a golden-headed cane with w d f upon it meaning william dumpledown fiddler a most mysterious affair gentlemen a sort of groan came from the corner of the shop and on the impulse of the moment colonel jeffrey sprang to his feet exclaiming what's that what's that oh it's only my apprentice tobias rag he has got a pain in his stomach from eating too many of lovett's pork pies ain't that it tobias my bud yes sir said tobias with another groan oh indeed said the colonel it ought to make him more careful for the future it's to be hoped it will sir tobias do you hear what the gentleman says it ought to make you more careful in future i am too indulgent to you that's the fact now sir i believe you are as clean shaved as ever you were in your life why yes said captain rathbone i think that will do very well and now mr green addressing the colonel by that assumed name and now mr green be quick or we shall be too late for the duke and so lose the sale of some of our jewels we shall indeed said the colonel if we don't mind we sat too long over our breakfast at the inn and his grace is too rich and too good a customer to lose he don't mind what price he gives for things that take his fancy or the fancy of his duchess jewel merchants gentlemen i presume said sweeney todd yes we have been in that line for some time and by one of us trading in one direction and the other in another we manage extremely well because we exchange what suits our different customers and keep up two distinct connections a very good plan said sweeney todd i'll be as quick as i can with you sir dealing in jewels is better than shaving i dare say it is of course it is sir here have i been slaving for some years in this shop and not done much good that is to say when i talk of not having done much good i admit i have made enough to retire upon quietly and comfortably and i mean to do so very shortly there you are sir shaved with celerity you seldom meet with and as clean as possible for the small charge of one penny thank you gentlemen there's your change good morning they had no resource but to leave the shop and when they had gone sweeney todd as he stropped the razor he had been using upon his hand gave a most diabolical grin muttering clever very ingenious but it wouldn't do oh dear no not at all i am not so easily taken in time and merchants ha ha and no objection of course to deal in pearls a good jest that truly a capital jest if i had been accustomed to being so defeated i had not now been here a living man tobias tobias i say yes sir said the lad dejectedly have you forgotten your mother's danger in case you breathe a syllable of anything that has occurred here or that you think has occurred here or so much as dream of no said the boy indeed i have not i can never forget it if i were to live a hundred years that's well prudent excellent tobias go out now and if those two persons who were here last waylay you in the street let them say what they will and do you reply to them as shortly as possible but be sure you come back to me quickly and report what they do say they turn to the left toward the city now I'll be off with you it's of no use said colonel jeffrey to the captain the barber is either too cunning for me or he is really innocent of all participation in the disappearance of thornhill and yet there are suspicious circumstances i watched his countenance when the subject of jewels was mentioned and i saw a sudden change come over it it was but momentary but it still gave me a suspicion that he knew something which caution alone kept within the recesses of his breast 
the conduct of the boy too was strange and then again if he has the string of pearls their value would give him all the power to do what he says he is about to do that is to retire from business with an independence hush there did you see the lad yes why it's the barber's boy it is the same lad he called tobias shall we speak to him let's make a bolder push and offer him an ample reward for any information he may give us agreed agreed they both walked up to tobias who was listlessly walking along the streets and when they reached him they were both struck with the appearance of care and sadness that was upon the boy's face he looked perfectly haggard and careworn an expression sad to see upon the face of one so young and when the colonel accosted him in a kindly tone he seemed so unnerved that tears immediately darted to his eyes although at the same time he shrank back as if alarmed my lad said the colonel you reside i think with sweeney todd the barber is he not a kind master to you that you seem so unhappy no no that is i mean yes i have nothing to tell let me pass on what is the meaning of this confusion nothing nothing i say my lad here is a guinea for you if you will tell us what became of the man of a seafaring appearance who came with a dog to your master's house some days since to be shaved i cannot tell you said the boy i cannot tell you what i do not know but you have some idea probably come we will make it worth your while and thereby protect you from sweeney todd we have the power to do so and all the inclination but you must be quite explicit with us and tell us frankly what you think and what you know concerning the man in whose fate we are interested i know nothing i think nothing said tobias let me go i have nothing to say except that he was shaved and went away but how came he to leave his dog behind him i cannot tell i know nothing it is evident that you do know something but hesitate either from fear or from some other motive to tell it as you are inaccessible to fair means we must resort to others and you shall at once come before a magistrate which will force you to speak out do with me what you will said tobias i cannot help it i have nothing to say to you nothing whatever oh my poor mother if it were not for you what then nothing 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 it was but a threat of the colonel to take the boy before a magistrate for he really had no grounds for so doing and if the boy chose to keep a secret if he had one not all the magistrates in the world could force words from his lips that he felt not inclined to utter and so after one more effort they felt that they must leave him boy said the colonel you are young and cannot well judge of the consequences of particular lines of conduct you ought to weigh well what you are about and hesitate long before you determine keeping dangerous secrets we can convince you that we have the power of completely protecting you from all that sweeney todd could possibly attempt think again for this is an opportunity of saving yourself perhaps from much future misery that may never arise again i have nothing to say said the boy i have nothing to say he uttered these words with such an agonized expression of countenance that they were both convinced he had something to say and that too of the first importance a something which would be valuable to them in the way of information extremely valuable probably and yet which they felt the utter impossibility of wringing from him they were compelled to leave him and likewise with the additional mortification that far from making any advance in the matter they had placed themselves and their cause in a much worse position in so far as they had awakened all sweeney todd's suspicions if he were guilty and yet advanced not one step in the transaction and then to make matters all the more perplexing there was still the possibility that they might be altogether upon a wrong scent and that the barber of fleet street had no more to do with the disappearance of mr thornhill than they had themselves End of chapter ten Chapter eleven of The String of Pearls by Unknown. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter eleven The Stranger at Lovett's. Towards the dusk of the evening on that day, after the last batch of pies at Lovett's had been disposed of, there walked into the shop a man most miserably clad. 
and who stood for a few moments staring with weakness and hunger at the counter before he spoke mrs lovett was there but she had no smile for him and instead of its usual bland expression her countenance wore an aspect of anger as she forestalled what the man had to say by exclaiming go away we never give to beggars there came a flash of colour for a moment across the features of the stranger and then he replied mistress lovett i do not come to ask alms of you but to know if you can recommend me to any employment recommend you recommend a ragged wretch like you i am a ragged wretch and moreover quite destitute in better times i have sat at your counter and paid cheerfully for what i have wanted and then one of your softest smiles has been ever at my disposal i do not say this as a reproach to you because the cause of your smile was well known to be a self-interested one and when that cause has passed away i can no longer expect it but i am so situated that i am willing to do anything for a mere subsistence oh yes and then when you have got into a better case again i have no doubt but you have quite sufficient insolence to make you unbearable besides what employment can we have but pie-making and we have a man already who suits us very well with the exception that he as you would do if you were to exchange with him has grown insolent and fancies himself master of the place well well said the stranger of course there is always sufficient argument against the poor and destitute to keep them so if you will assert that my conduct would be of the nature you describe it it is quite impossible for me to prove the contrary he turned and was about to leave the shop when mrs lovett called after him saying come in again in two hours he paused a moment or two and then turning his emaciated countenance upon her said i will if my strength permits me water from the pumps in the street is but a poor thing for a man to subsist on for twenty-four hours you may take one pie the half-famished miserable-looking man seized upon a pie and devoured it in an instant my name he said is jarvis williams i'll be here never fear mrs lovett in two hours and notwithstanding all you have said you shall find no change in my behaviour because i may be well kept and better clothed but if i should feel dissatisfied with my situation i will leave it and no harm done so saying he walked from the shop and after he was gone a strange expression came across the countenance of mrs lovett and she said in a low tone to herself he might suit for a few months like the rest and it is clear we must get rid of the one we have i must think of it there is a cellar of vast extent and of dim and sepulchral aspect some rough red tiles are laid upon the floor and pieces of flint and large jagged stones have been hammered into the earthen walls to strengthen them while here and there rough huge pillars made by beams of timber rise perpendicularly from the floor and prop large flat pieces of wood against the ceiling to support it here and there gleaming lights seem to be peeping out from furnaces and there is a strange hissing simmering sound going on while the whole air is impregnated with a rich and savoury vapour this is lovett's pie manufactory beneath the pavement of bell yard and at this time a night batch of some thousands is being made for the purpose of being sent by carts the first thing in the morning all over the suburbs of london by the earliest dawn of the day a crowd of itinerant hawkers of pies would make their appearance carrying off a large quantity to regular customers who had them daily and no more thought of being without them than of forbidding the milkman or the baker to call at their residences it will be seen and understood therefore that the retail part of mrs lovett's business which took place principally between the hours of twelve and one was by no means the most important or profitable portion of a concern which was really of immense magnitude and which brought in a large yearly income to stand in the cellar when this immense manufacture of what at first sight would appear such a trivial article was carried on and to look about as far as the eye could reach was by no means to have a sufficient idea of the extent of the place for there were as many doors in different directions and singular low-arched entrances to different vaults which all appeared as black as midnight 
that one might almost suppose the inhabitants of all the surrounding neighbourhood had by common consent given up their cellars to love its pie factory there is but one miserable light except the occasional fitful glare that comes from the ovens where the pies are stewing hissing and sputtering in their own luscious gravy there is but one man too throughout all the place and he is still on a low three-legged stool in one corner with his head resting upon his hands and gently rocking to and fro as he utters scarcely audible moans he is but lightly clad in fact he seems to have but little on him except a shirt and a pair of loose canvas trousers the sleeves of the former are turned up beyond his elbows and on his head he has a white nightcap it seems astonishing that such a man even with the assistance of mrs lovett could make so many pies as are required in a day but the system does wonders and in those cellars there are various mechanical contrivances for kneading the dough chopping up the meat etc which greatly reduce the labour but what a miserable object is this man what a sad and soul-stricken wretch he looks his face is pale and haggard his eyes deeply sunken and as he removes his hands from before his visage and looks about him a more perfect picture of horror could not have been found i must leave to-night he said in coarse accents i must leave to-night i know too much my brain is full of horrors i have not slept now for five nights nor dare i eat anything but the raw flour i will leave to-night if they do not watch me too closely oh if i could but get into the streets if i could but once again breathe the fresh air hush what's that i thought i heard a noise he rose and stood trembling and listening but all was still save the simmering and hissing of the pies and then he resumed his seat with a deep sigh <sighs> all the doors fastened upon me he said what can it mean it's very horrible and my heart dies within me six weeks only have i been here only six weeks i was starving before i came alas alas how much better to have starved i should have been dead before now and spared all this agony skinner cried a voice and it was a female one skinner how long will the ovens be a quarter of an hour he replied a quarter of an hour mrs lovett god help me what is that you say i said god help me surely a man may say that without offence a door slammed shut and the miserable man was alone again how strangely he said on this night my thoughts go back to the early days and to what i once was the pleasant scenes of my youth recur to me i see again the ivy-mantled porch and the pleasant green i hear again the merry ringing laughter of my playmates and there in my mind's eye appears to me the bubbling stream and the ancient mill the old mansion house with its tall turrets and its air of silent grandeur i hear the music of the birds and the winds making rough melody among the trees tis very strange that all these sights and sounds should come back to me at such a time as this as if just to remind me what a wretch i am he was silent for a few moments during which he trembled with emotion then he spoke again saying thus the forms of those whom i once knew and many of whom have gone already to the silent tomb appear to come thronging round me they bend their eyes momentarily upon me and with settled expressions show acutely the sympathy they feel for me i see her too who first in my bosom lit up the flame of soft affection i see her gliding past me like the dim vision of a dream indistinct but beautiful 
no more than a shadow, yet to me most palpable. What am I now? What am I now? He resumed his former position, with his head resting upon his hands. He rocked himself slowly to and fro, uttering those moans of a tortured spirit, which we have before noticed. But see, one of the small arched doors opens, in the gloom of those vaults, and a man, in a stooping posture, creeps in. A half-mask is upon his face, and he wears a cloak, but both his hands are at liberty. In one of them he carries a double-headed hammer with a powerful handle of about ten inches in length. He has probably come out of a darker place than the one into which he now so cautiously creeps, for he shades the light from his eyes, as if it was suddenly rather too much for him, and then he looks cautiously round the vault until he sees the crouched-up figure of the man whose duty it is to attend the ovens. From that moment he looks at nothing else, but advances toward him, steadily and cautiously. It is evident that great secrecy is his object, for he is walking on his stocking soles only, and it is impossible to hear the slightest sound of his footsteps. Nearer and nearer he comes, so slowly, and yet so surely towards him, who still keeps up the low moaning sound, indicative of mental anguish. Now he is close to him, and he bends over for a moment, with a look of fiendish malice. It is a look which, despite his mask, glances full from his eyes, and then, grasping the hammer tightly in both hands, he raises it slowly above his head and gives it a swinging motion through the air. There is no knowing what induced the man that was crouching upon the stool to rise at that moment, but he did so, and paced about with great quickness. A sudden shriek burst from his lips as he beheld so terrific an apparition before him, but, before he could repeat the word, the hammer descended, crushing into his skull, and he fell lifeless without a moan. "'And so, Mr. Jarvis Williams, you have kept your word,' said Mrs. Lovett to the emaciated, careworn stranger who had solicited employment of her. "'And so, Mr. Jarvis Williams, you have kept your word and come for employment?' "'I have, madam, and I hope that you can give it to me. I frankly tell you that I would seek for something better and more congenial to my disposition if I could, but who would employ one presenting such a wretched appearance as I do?' You see that I am all in rags, and I have told you that I have been half-starved, and therefore it is only some common and ordinary employment that I can hope to get, and that made me come to you. Well, I don't see why we should not make a trial of you, at all events, so if you like to go down into the bakehouse, I will follow you and show you what you have to do. You remember that you have to live entirely upon the pies unless you like to purchase for yourself anything else, which you may do if you can get the money. We give none, and you must likewise agree never to leave the bakehouse. Never to leave it? Never, unless you leave it for good, and for all, for upon those conditions you choose to accept the situation. You may, and if not, you can go about your business at once, and leave it alone. Alas, madam, I have no resource, but you spoke of having a man already. Yes, but he has gone to some of his very oldest friends, who will be quite glad to see him, so now say the word. Are you willing, or are you not, to take the situation? My poverty and my destitution consent, if my will be averse, Mrs. Lovett. But, of course, I quite understand that I leave when I please. Oh, of course. We never think of keeping anybody many hours after they begin to feel uncomfortable. If you are ready, follow me. I'm quite ready, and thankful for shelter. All the brightest visions of my early life have long since faded away, and it matters little, or indeed nothing, what now becomes of me. I follow you, madam, freely upon the condition you have mentioned. Mrs. Lovett lifted up a portion of the counter which permitted him to pass behind it, and then he followed her into a small room, which was at the back of the shop. She then took a key from her pocket and opened an old door, which was in the wainscoting, and immediately behind which there was a flight of stairs. These she descended, and Jarvis Williams followed her, to a considerable depth, 
after which she took an iron bar from behind another door and flung it open showing to her new assistant the interior of the vault which we have already very briefly described these she said are the ovens and i will proceed to show you how you can manufacture the pies feed the furnaces and make yourself generally useful flour will be always let down through a trap door from the upper shop as well as everything required for making the pies but the meat and that you will always find ranged upon shelves either in lumps or stakes in a small room through this door but it is only at particular times you will find the door open and whenever you do so you had better always take out what meat you think you will require for the next batch i understand all that madam said williams but how does it get there that's no business of yours so long as you are supplied with it that is sufficient for you and now i will go through the process of making one pie but that you may know how to proceed and you will find with what amazing quickness they can be manufactured if you set about them in the proper manner she then showed how a piece of meat thrown into a machine became finely minced up by merely turning a handle and then how flour and water and lard were mixed up together to make the crusts of the pies by another machine which threw out the paste thus manufactured into small pieces each just large enough for a pie lastly she showed him how a tray which just held a hundred could be filled and by turning a windlass sent up to the shop through a square trap door which went right up to the very counter and now she said i must leave you as long as you are industrious you will get on very well but as soon as you begin to be idle and neglect the orders that are sent to you by me you will get a piece of information which will be useful and which if you are a prudent man will enable you to know what you are about what is that you may as well give it to me now no we but seldom find there is occasion for it at first but after a time you will get well fed you are pretty sure to want it so saying she left the place and he heard the door by which he had entered carefully barred after her suddenly then he heard her voice again and so clearly and distinctly too that he thought she must have come back again but looking up at the door he found that that arose from the fact of her speaking through a small grating at the upper part of it to which her mouth was closely placed remember your duty she said and i warn you that any attempt to leave here will be as futile as it will be dangerous except with your consent when i relinquish the situation oh certainly certainly you are quite right there everybody who relinquishes the situation goes to his old friends whom he has not seen for many years perhaps what a strange manner of talking she has said jarvis williams to himself when he found he was alone there seems to be some singular and hidden meaning in every word she utters what can she mean by a communication being made to me if i neglect my duty it is very strange and what a singular-looking place this is i think it would be quite unbearable if it were not for the delicious odour of the pies and they are indeed delicious perhaps more delicious to me who has been famished for so long and has gone through so much wretchedness there is no one here but myself and i am hungry now frightfully hungry and whether the pies are done or not i'll have half a dozen of them at any rate so here goes he opened one of the ovens and the fragrant steam that came out was perfectly delicious and he sniffed it up with a satisfaction such as he had never felt before as regarded anything that was eatable is it possible that i shall be able to make such delicious pies at all events one can't starve here and if it is a kind of imprisonment it is a pleasant one upon my soul they are nice even half cooked delicious i'll have another half dozen there are lots of them delightful 
I can't keep the gravy from running out of the corners of my mouth. Upon my soul, Mrs. Lovett, I don't know where you get your meat, but it is as tender as young chickens. The fat actually melts away in one's mouth. Ah, oh, these are pies, something like pies. They are positively fit for the gods. Mrs. Lovett's new man ate twelve threepenny pies, and then he thought of leaving off. It was a little drawback not to have anything to wash them down with but cold water, but he reconciled himself to this. For, as he said, After all, it would be a pity to take the flavor of such pies out of one's mouth, Indeed, it would be a thousand pities, so I won't think of it. But just put up with what I have got and not complain. I might have gone further and fared worse with a vengeance, and I cannot help looking upon it as a singular piece of good fortune that made me think of coming here in my distress to try to get something to do. I have no friends and no money, and she whom I loved is faithless. And here I am, master of as many pies as I like, and to all appearance monarch of all I survey, for there really seems to be no one to dispute my supremacy. To be sure, my kingdom is rather a gloomy one, but then I can abdicate it when I like, and when I am tired of those delicious pies, if such a thing be possible, which I really very much doubt. I can give up the situation and think of something else. If I do that, I will leave England forever. It's no place for me after the many disappointments I have had. No friend left me, my girl false. Not a relation, but who would turn his back upon me. I will go somewhere where I am unknown and can form new connections, and perhaps new friendships of a more permanent and stable character than the old ones, which have all proved so false to me. And in the meantime, I'll make and eat pies as fast as I can. End of chapter 11 Chapter 12 of The String of Pearls by Unknown This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter Twelve, The Resolution Came to by Joanna Oakley. The beautiful Joanna, when in obedience to the command of her father, she left him and begged him, the beef eater, to manage matters with the Reverend Mister Lupin, did not proceed directly upstairs to the apartment, but lingered on the staircase to hear what ensued. And if anything in her dejected state of mind could have given her amusement, it would certainly have been the way in which the beef eater exacted a retribution from the Reverend personage who was not likely again to intrude himself into the house of the spectacle-maker. But when he was gone, and she heard that a sort of peace had been patched up with her mother, a peace which, from her knowledge of the high contracting parties, she conjectured would not last long, she returned to her room and locked herself in, so that if any attempt was made to get her down to partake of the supper, it might be supposed she was asleep, for she felt herself totally unwell to the task of making one in any party, however much she might respect the individual members that composed it. And she did respect Ben, the beef-eater, for she had a lively recollection of much kindness from him during her early years, and she knew that he had never come to the house when she was a child without bringing her some token of his regard in the shape of a plaything, or some little article of doll's finery, which at that time was very precious. She was not wrong in her conjecture that Ben would make an attempt to get her downstairs, for her father came up at the beef-eater's request and tapped at her door. She thought the best plan, and indeed it was, would be to make no answer, so that the old spectacle-maker concluded at once what she wished him to conclude, namely that she had gone to sleep, and he walked quietly down the stair again, glad that he had not disturbed her, and told Ben as much. Now feeling herself quite secure from interruption for the night, Joanna did not attempt to seek repose, but set herself seriously to reflect upon what had happened. She almost repeated to herself, word for word, what Colonel Jeffrey had told her, and, as she revolved the matter over and over again in her brain, a strange thought took possession of her, which she could not banish, and which, when once it found a home within her breast, began to gather probability from every slight circumstance 
that was in any way connected to it. This thought, strange as it may appear, was that the Mr. Thornhill, of whom Colonel Jeffrey spoke in terms of such high eulogism, was no other than Mark Ingestry himself. It is astonishing, when once a thought occurs to the mind that makes a strong impression, how, with immense rapidity, a rush of evidence will appear to come to support it, and thus it was with regard to this supposition of Joanna Oakley. She immediately remembered a host of little things which favoured the idea, and among the rest she fully recollected that Mark Ingestry had told her he meant to change his name when he left England, for that he wished her and her only to know anything of him, or what had become of him, and that his intention was to baffle inquiry, in case it should be made, particularly by Mr. Grant, towards whom he had felt a far greater amount of indignation than the circumstances at all warranted him feeling. Then she recollected all that Colonel Jeffrey had said with regard to the gallant and noble conduct of this Mr. Thornhill, and, girl-like, she thought that those high and noble qualities could surely belong to no one but her own lover, to such an extent, and that, therefore, Mr. Thornhill and Mark Ingestry must be one and the same person. Over and over again she regretted she had not asked Colonel Jeffrey for a personal description of Mr. Thornhill, for that would have settled all her doubts at once, and the idea that she had it still in her power to do so, in consequence of the appointment he had made with her for that day week, brought her some consolation. "'It must have been he,' she said. "'His anxiety to leave the ship, and get here by the day he mentions, proves it. Besides, how improbable it is, that at the burning of the ill-fated vessel, Ingestry should place in the hands of another what he intended for me, when that other was quite as likely, and perhaps more so, to meet with death as Mark himself.' Thus she reasoned, forcing herself each moment into a stronger belief of the identity of Thornhill with Mark Ingestry, and so certainly narrowing her anxieties to a consideration of the fate of one person instead of two. "'I will meet Colonel Jeffrey,' she said, "'and ask him if his Mr. Thornhill had fair hair and a soft and pleasing expression about the eyes that could not fail to be remembered. I will ask him how he spoke, and how he looked, and get him, if he can, to describe to me even the very tones of his voice, and then I shall be sure, without the shadow of a doubt, that it is Mark. But then, oh, then comes the anxious question, of what has been his fate? When poor Joanna began to consider the multitude of things which might have happened to her lover during his progress from Sweeney Todd's in Fleet Street to her father's house, she became quite lost in a perfect maze of conjecture, and then her thoughts always painfully reverted back to the barber's shop, where the dog had been stationed, and she trembled to reflect for a moment upon the frightful danger to which that string of pearls might have subjected him. "'Alas! Alas!' she cried. "'I can well conceive that the man whom I saw attempting to poison the dog would be capable of an enormity. I saw his face but for a moment, and yet it was one never again to be forgotten. It was a face in which might be read cruelty and evil passions.' Besides, the man who would put an unoffending animal to a cruel death shows an absence of feeling, and a baseness of mind, which makes him capable of any crime he thinks he can commit with impunity. What can I do? Oh, what can I do to unravel this mystery? No one could have been more tenderly and more gently brought up than Joanna Oakley, but yet, inhabitive of her heart was a spirit and a determination which few indeed could have given her credit for, by merely looking on the gentle and affectionate countenance which she ordinarily presented. But it is no new phenomenon in the history of the human heart to find that some of the most gentle and loveliest of human creatures are capable of the highest efforts of perversion, and when Joanna Oakley told herself, which she did, she was determined to devote her existence to a discovery of the mystery that enveloped the fate of Mark Ingestry, she likewise made up her mind that the most likely means for accomplishing that object should not be rejected by her on the score of danger, and she at once set to work considering what those means should be. This seemed an endless task, but still she thought that if, by any means whatever, she could get admittance to the barber's house, she might be able to come to some conclusion as to whether or not it was there where Thornhill, whom she believed to be Ingestry, had been stayed in his progress. "'Aid me, heaven!' she cried, in the adoption of some means of action on the occasion. Is there any one with whom I dare advise? Alas, I fear not, for the only person in whom I have put my whole heart is my father, and his affection for me would prompt him at once to interpose every possible obstacle to my proceeding, for fair danger should come of it. 
to be sure, there is Arabella Wilmot, my old schoolfellow and bosom friend. She would advise me the best of her ability, but I much fear she is too romantic and full of odd strange notions, that she has taken from books, to be a good adviser. And yet what can I do? I must speak to some one, if it be but in case of any accident happening to me. My father may get news of it, and I know of no one else whom I can trust but Arabella. After some little more consideration, Joanna made up her mind on that following morning she would go immediately to the house of her old school friend, which was in the immediate vicinity, and hold a conversation with her. "'I shall hear something,' she said, "'at least of a kindly and consoling character. For what Arabella may want in calm and steady judgment, she fully compensates for in actual feeling. And what is most of all, I know I can trust her word implicitly, and that my secret will remain as safely locked in her breast.' as if it were my own. It was something to come to a conclusion to ask advice, and she felt that some portion of her anxiety was lifted from her mind by the mere fact that she had made so firm a mental resolution that neither danger nor difficulty should deter her from seeking to know the fate of her lover. She retired to rest now with a greater hope, and while she is courting repose, notwithstanding the chance of the discovered images that fancy may present to her in her slumbers, we will take a glance at the parlour below, and see how mrs oakley is conveying out the pacific intention she has so tacitly expressed and how the supper is going forward which with not the best grace in the world she is preparing for her husband who for the first time in his life had begun to assert his rights and for big ben the beef-eater whom she as cordially disliked as it was possible for any woman to detest any man mrs oakley by no means preserved her taciturn demeanour for after a little while she spoke saying is there nothing tasty in the house? Suppose I run over the way to Wegarge's and get some of those Epping sausages with peculiar flavor. Ah, do, said Mr. Oakley. They are beautiful, Ben, I can assure you. Well, I don't know, said Ben the beef eater. Sausages are all very well in their way, but you need such a plagued lot of em. For if you only eat em one at a time, how soon will you get through a dozen or two? A dozen or two? said mrs oakley why there are only five to a pound then said ben making a mental calculation then i think ma'am you ought not to get more than nine pounds of them and that will be a matter of forty-five mouthfuls each get nine pounds of them said mr oakley if they are wanted i know ben has an appetite indeed said ben but i have fell off lately and don't take to me whittles as i used to you can order, missus, if you please, a gallon of half and half as you go along. One must have a drain of drink of some sort. And mind you don't be going to any expense on my account, and getting anything but the little snack I have mentioned. For ten to one I shall take supper when I get to the tower. All the human nature is weak, you know, missus, and requires something to be continually a holding up of it. Certainly, said Mr. Oakley. Certainly have what you like, Ben. Just say the word before Miss Oakley goes out. Is there anything else? No, no, said Ben. Oh dear, no. Nothing to speak of. But if you should pass the shop where they sells fat bacon, about four or five pounds, cut into rashers, you'll find, missus, will help down the blessed sausages. Gracious providence, said Mrs. Oakley. Who is to cook it? Who is to cook it, ma'am? Why, the kitchen fire, I suppose. But mind ye, if the man ain't got any sausages, there's a shop where they sells biled beef at the corner, and I shall be quite satisfied if you bring in about ten or twelve pounds of that. You can make it up into about half a dozen sandwiches. Go, cool, my dear, go at once, said Mr. Oakley. And get Ben his supper. I'm quite sure he wants it. And be as quick as you can. Ah, said Ben, when Mrs. Oakley was gone. I didn't tell you how I was served last week at Mrs. Harvey's. You know, they're so precious genteel there that they won't speak above their blessed breaths for fear of wearing themselves out. And they sits down in a chair as if it was balanced only on one leg, and a little more one way or t'other would upset them. Then if they sees a crumb laying on the floor, they rings a bell, and a poor half-starved devil of a servant comes and says, Did you ring, ma'am? And then they says, Yes, bring a dust shovel and broom. There's a crumb a-lying there. And then, says I, damn you all, says I, bring a scavenger's cart and a half dozen birch brooms. There's a cinder just fell out of the fire. 
Then in course they get shocked, and looks as blue as possible, and ah to that, when they sees that I ain't a going, one of them says, Mr. Benjamin Blummerguts, would you like to take a glass of wine? I should think so, says I. Then he says, says he, which would you prefer, red or white, says he. White, says I, while you were screwing up your courage to pull out the red. So out they pull it, and as soon as I got hold of the bottle, I knocked the neck of it off, over the top of the fireplace, and then drank it all up. Now damn ye, says I. You thinks us all that this is mighty genteel and fine, but I don't, and consider you to be the blessedest set of humbugs ever I set eyes on, and if you ever catch me here again, I'll be genteel too, and I can't say more than that. Go to the devil, all of you. So out I went. Only I met with a little accident in the hall, for they had got a sort of lamp hang in there, and somehow or another, my head went bang into it, and I carried it out round my neck. But when I did get out, I took it off, and shied it slap at the parlour window. You never heard such a smash in all your life. I dare say they all fainted away for about a week, the blessed humbugs. Well, I should not wonder, said Mr. Oakley. I never go near them, because I don't like their foolish pompacity and pride, which, upon very slender resources, tries to ape what it don't at all understand. But here is Mrs. Oakley with the sausages, and I hope you will make yourself comfortable, Ben. Comfortable? I believe ye. I rather shall. I means it, and no mistake. I have brought three pounds, said Mrs. Oakley, and told the man to call in a quarter of an hour in case there is more wanted. The devil you have! And the bacon, Mrs. Oakley, the bacon! I couldn't get any. The man had nothing but hams. Lord, ma'am, I'd have put up with a ham, cut thick, and never have said a word about it. I'm an angel of a temper, if you did but know it. Hello. Look, is this the fellow with the half and half? Yes, here it is, a pot. A what? A pot, to be sure. Well, I never. You are getting genteel, Mrs. Oakley. Then give us a hold of it. Ben took the pot and emptied it at a draught, and then he gave a tap at the bottom of it with his knuckles to signify he had accomplished that feat, and then he said, I tells you what, ma'am, if you takes me for a baby, it's a great mistake. And anyone would think you did, to see you offering me a pot merely. It's an insult, ma'am. Fiddle-dee-dee, said Mrs. Oakley. It's a much greater insult to drink it all up and give nobody a drop. Is it? I wants to know how you are to stop it, ma'am, when it gets to your mouth. That's what I axes you. How are you to stop it, ma'am? You didn't want me to spew it back again, did you? Eh, ma'am? You low, vile wretch. Come, come, my dear, said Mr. Oakley. You know our cousin Ben don't live among the most refined society, and you ought to be able to look over a little of, of his, I may say, I am sure without offence, roughness, now and then. Come, come, there is no harm done, I am sure. Forget and forgive, I say, that's my maxim, and always has been, and will always be. Well, said the beef eater, it's a good one to get through the world with. And so there's an end of it. I forgives you, Mother Oakley. You forgive? Yes, to be sure. Though I am only a beef eater, I suppose it's as I may forgive people for all that, eh, Cousin Oakley? Of course, Ben, of course. Come, come, wife. You know as well as I that Ben has many good qualities, and that take him for all in all, as the man in the play says, we shan't in a hurry look upon his like again. And I'm sure I don't want to look upon his like again either, said Mrs. Oakley. I'd rather by a good deal keep him a week than a fortnight. He's enough to breed a famine in the land, that he is. Oh, bless you, no, said Ben. That's amongst your little mistakes, ma'am, I can assure you. By the by, what a blessed long time that fellow is coming with the rest of the beer and the other sausages. Why, what's the matter with you, Cousin Oakley? Eh, old chap? You look out of sorts. I don't feel just the thing. Do you know, Ben? Not... The thing? Why, why now you come to mention it, I somehow feel as if my blessed inside was on a turn and twist. The devil! I don't feel comfortable at all, I don't. And I'm getting very ill, gasped Mr. Oakley. And I am getting iller, said the beef eater, manufacturing a word for the occasion. Bless my soul! 
There's something gone wrong in my inside. I know there's murder. There's a go, oh Lord. It's doubling me up it is. I feel as if my last hour had come, said Mr. Oakley. I'm a, a dying man. I am, oh, good gracious. There was a twinge. Mrs. Oakley, with all the coolness in the world, took down her bonnet from behind the parlor door where it hung, and, as she put it on, said, I told you both that some judgment would come over you, and now you see it has. How do you like it? Providence is good, of course, to its own, and I have... What? What? Poisoned the half and half. Ben, the beef-eater, fell off his chair with a deep groan, and poor Mr. Oakley sat glaring at his wife, and shivering with apprehension, quite unable to speak, while she placed a shawl over her shoulder. As she added, in the same tone of calmness, she had made the terrific announcement concerning the poisoning. Now, you wretches, you see what a woman can do when she makes up her mind for vengeance. As long as you all live, you'll recollect me. But if you don't, that won't much matter, for you won't live long, I can tell you. And now I'm going to my sister's, Miss Tittabolo. So saying, Mrs. Oakley turned round and, with an insulting toss of her head, and not at all caring for the pangs and sufferings of her poor victims, she left the place, and proceeded to her sister's house, where she slept as comfortably as if she had not by any means committed two diabolical murders. But has she done so, or shall we, for the honor of human nature, discover that she went to a neighboring chemist, and only purchased some dreadfully powerful medicinal compound, which she placed in the half-and-half, and, half, and which began to give those pangs to Big Ben, the beef-eater, and to Mr. Oakley, concerning which they were so eloquent. This must have been the case, for Mrs. Oakley could not have been such a fiend in human guise as to laugh as she passed the chemist's shop. Oh, no, she might not have felt remorse, but that is a very different thing, indeed, from laughing at the matter, unless it were really laughable and not serious at all. Big Ben and Mr. Oakley must have at length found out how they had been hoaxed, and the most probable thing was that the before-mentioned chemist himself told them, for they sent for him in order to know if anything could be done to save their lives. Ben, from that day forthwith, made a determination that he would not visit Mr. Oakley, and the next time they met, he said, "'I'll tell you what it is. That old hag your wife is one too many for us. That's a fact. She gets the better of me altogether. So whenever you feels a little inclined for a gossip about old times,' Just you come down to the tower. I will, Ben. Do. We can always find you something to drink. And you can amuse yourself, too, by looking at the animals. Remember, feeding time is two o'clock, so now and then I shall expect to see you. And above all, be sure you let me know if that canting parson Lupin comes any more to your house. I will, Ben. Ah, do. And I will give him another lesson if he should. And I'll tell you how I'll do it. I'll get a free admission to the wild beastesses in the tower, and when he comes to see em, for them there sorts of fellows always goes everywhere they can go for nothing, I'll just manage to pop him into a cage with some of the most cantankerous creatures as we have. But would that not be dangerous? Oh dear, no. We has a laughing hyena as would frighten him out of his wits, but I don't think as he'd bite him much, do you know? He's as playful as a kitten and very fond of standing on his head. Well then, Ben, I have, of course, no objection, although I do think that the lesson you have already given the reverend gentleman will and ought to be fully sufficient for all the purposes, and I don't expect we shall see him again. But how does Mrs. Orr behave to you? asked Ben. Well, Ben, I don't think there's much difference. She's a little civil, and sometimes she ain't. It's just as she takes into her head. Ah, all that comes of marrying. I have wondered, though, Ben, that you never married. Ben gave a chuckle as he replied. Have you, though, really? Well, Cousin Oakley, I don't mind telling you. But the real fact is, once I was very near being served out in that sort of way. Indeed. Yes, I'll tell you how it was. There was a girl called Angelina Day, and a nice-looking enough creature she was as you'd wish to see, and didn't seem as if she'd got any clothes at all. Leastways, she kept them in like a cat at mealtimes. Upon my word, Ben, you have a great knowledge of the world. I believe you, I have. Haven't I been brought up among the wild beasts in the tower all my life? That's the place to get a knowledge of the world in, my boy. 
I ought to know a thing or two, and in course I does. Well, but how was it, Ben, that you did not marry this Angelina you speak of? I'll tell you. She thought she had me as safe as a hare in a trap, and she was as amiable as a lump of cotton. You'd have thought, to look at her, that she did nothing but smile, and to hear her, that she said nothing but nice, mild, pleasant things, and I really began to think as I had found the proper sort of animal. But you were mistaken? I believe you. I was. One day I'd been there to see her, I mean at her father's house, and she'd been as amiable as she could be. I got up to go away with a determination that the next time I got there, I would ask her to say yes. And when I'd got a little way out of the garden of the house where they lived, it was out of town some distance, I found I had left my little walking cane behind me, so I goes back to get it, and when I got into the garden I heard a voice. Whose voice? Why, Angelina's, to be sure. She was a-speaking to a poor little dab of a servant they had. And oh my eye, how she did rap out, to be sure. Such a speech as I've never heard in all my life. She went on for a matter of ten minutes without stopping, and every other word was some ill name or another, and her voice, oh gracious, it was like a bundle of wire all of a tangle it was. And what did you do then, upon making such a discovery, as that in so very odd and unexpected a manner? Do? What do you suppose I did? I really cannot say, as you are rather an eccentric fellow. Well then, I'll tell you. I went up to the house and just popped in my head. And, says I, Angelina, I find out that all cats have claws after all. Good evening, and no more from your humble servant, who don't mind the job of taming a wild animal, but a woman. And then off I walked, and I never heard of her afterwards. Ah, uh, Ben, it's true enough. You never know them beforehand. But, after a little time, as you say, then out comes the claws. They does, they does. I suppose you since then made up your mind to be a bachelor for the rest of your life, Ben? Of course I did. After such experience as that, I should have deserved all I got, and no mistake, I can tell you. And if you ever catches me paying attention to a female woman, just put me in mind of Angelina Day, and you'll see how fast I shall be off at once like a shot. Ah, said Mr. Oakley with a sigh. Everybody, Ben, ain't born with your good luck, I can tell you. You are a most fortunate man, Ben, and that's a fact. You must have been born under some lucky planet, I think, Ben, or else you never would have had such a warning as you have had about the claws. I found them out, Ben, but it was a deal too late, so I had to put up with my fate and put the best face I could upon the matter. Yes, that's what learned folks call... What's his name? Phil... Phil something. Philosophy, I suppose you mean, Ben. Ah, that's it. You must put up with what you can't help, it means, I take it. It's a fine name for saying you must grin and bear it. I suppose that is about the truth, Ben. It cannot, however, be exactly said that the little incident connected with Mr. Lupin had no good effect upon Mrs. Oakley, for it certainly shook most alarmingly her confidence in that pious individual. In the first place, it was quite clear that he shrank from the horrors of martyrdom, and, indeed, to escape any bodily inconvenience was perfectly willing to put up with any amount of degradation or humiliation that he could be subjected to, and that was, to the apprehension of Mrs. Oakley, a great departure from what a saint ought to be. Then, again, her faith in the fact that Mr. Lupin was such a chosen morsel as he had represented himself was shaken from the circumstance that no miracle in the shape of a judgment had taken place to save him from the malevolence of Big Ben, the beef-eater, so that, Taking one thing in connection with another, Mrs. Oakley was not near so religious a character after that evening as she had been before it, and that was something gained. Then circumstances soon occurred, of which the reader will very shortly be fully aware, which were calculated to awaken all the feelings of Mrs. Oakley, if she really had any feelings to awaken, and to force her to make common cause with her husband in an affair that touched him to the very soul, and did succeed in awakening some feelings in her heart, that had lain dormant for a long time, but which were still far from being completely destroyed. These circumstances were closely connected with the fate of one in whom we hope that, by this time, the reader has taken a deep and kindly interest. We mean Joanna, that young and beautiful and artless creature, who seemed to have been created to be so very happy, 
and yet whose fate had become so clouded by misfortune and who appears now to be doomed through her best affections to suffer so great an amount of sorrow and to go through so many sad difficulties alas poor joanna oakley better had you loved some one of less aspiring feelings and of less ardent imagination than him to whom you have given your heart's young affections it is true that mark ingestry possessed genius and perhaps it was the glorious light that hovers around that fatal gift which prompted you to love him but genius is not only a blight and a desolation to its possessor but it is so to all who are bound to the gifted being by the ties of fond affection it brings with it that unhappy restlessness of intellect which is ever straining after the unattainable and which is never content to know the end and ultimatum of earthly hopes and wishes no the whole life of such persons is spent in one long struggle for a fancied happiness which like the ignis fatuus of the swamp glitters but to betray those who trust to its delusive and flickering beams End of chapter 12chapter thirteen of the string of pearls by unknown this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org chapter thirteen joanna's interview with isabella wilmot and the advice alas poor joanna thou hast chosen but an indifferent confidant in the person of that young and inexperienced girl to whom it seems good to thee to impart thy griefs not for one moment do we mean to say that the young creature to whom the spectacle-maker's daughter made up her mind to unbosom herself was not all that any one could wish as regards honour goodness and friendship but she was one of those creatures who yet look upon the world as a fresh green garden and have not yet lost that romance of existence which the world and its ways soon banish from the breasts of all she was young almost to girlhood and having been the idol of her family circle she knew just about as little of the great world as a child but while we cannot but to some extent regret that joanna should have chosen such a confidant and admirer we with feelings of great freshness and pleasure proceed to accompany her to that young girl's house now a visit from joanna oakley to the wilmots was not so rare a thing that it should excite any unusual surprise but in this case it did excite unusual pleasure because she had not been there for some time and the reason she had not may well be found in the peculiar circumstances that had for a considerable period environed her she had a secret to keep which although it might not proclaim what it was most legibly upon her countenance yet proclaimed that it had an existence and as she had not made arabella a confidant she dreaded the other's friendly questions it may seem surprising that joanna oakley had kept from one whom she so much esteemed and with whom she had made such a friendship the secret of her affections but that must be accounted for by a difference of ages between them to a sufficient extent in that early period of life to show itself palpably that difference was not quite two years but when we likewise state that arabella was of that small delicate style of beauty which makes her look like a child when even upon the verge of womanhood we shall not be surprised that the girl of seventeen hesitated to confide a secret of the heart to what seemed but a beautiful child the last year however had made a great difference in the appearance of arabella for although she still looked a year or so younger than she really was a more staid and thoughtful expression had come over her face and she no longer presented except at times when she laughed that childlike expression which had been as remarkable in her as it was delightful she was as different looking from johanna as she could be for whereas johanna's hair was of a rich glossy brown so nearly allied to black that it was commonly called such the long waving ringlets that shaded the countenance of arabella wilmot were like amber silk blended to a pale beauty her eyes were really blue and not that pale grey which courtesy calls of that celestial colour and their long fringing lashes hung upon a cheek of the most delicate and exquisite hue that nature could produce she was the young lovable and admirable creature who had made one of those girlish friendships with joanna oakley that when they do endure beyond the period of almost mere childhood endure for ever and become one among the most dear and cherished sensations of the heart 
the acquaintance had commenced at school and might have been of that effervescent character of so many school friendships which in after life are scarcely so much remembered as the most dim visions of a dream but it happened that they were congenial spirits which let them be thrown together under any circumstances whatever would have come together with a perfect and a most endearing confidence in each other's affections that they were school companions was the mere accident that brought them together and not the cause of their friendship such then was the being to whom joanna oakley looked for counsel and assistance and notwithstanding all that we have said respecting the likelihood of that counsel being of an inactive and girlish character we cannot withhold our meed of approbation to joanna that she had selected one so much in every way worthy of her honest esteem the hour at which she called was such as to ensure arabella being within and the pleasure which showed itself upon the countenance of the young girl as she welcomed her old playmate was a feeling of the most delightful and unaffecting character why johanna she said you so seldom call upon me now that i suppose i must esteem it as a very special act of grace and favour to see you arabella said joanna i do not know what you will say to me when i tell you that my present visit to you is because i am in a difficulty and i want your advice then you could not have come to a better person for i've read all the novels in london and know all the difficulties that anybody can possibly get into and what is more important i know all the means of getting out of them let them be what they may and yet arabella scarcely in your novel reading will you find anything so strange and so eventful as the circumstances i grieve to say it is in my power to record to you sit down and listen to me dear arabella and you shall know all you surprise and alarm me by the serious countenance joanna the subject is a serious one i love oh is that all so do i there is young captain desbrook in the king's guards he comes here to buy his gloves and if you did but hear him sigh as he leans over the counter you would be astonished ah but arabella i know you well yours is one of those fleeting passions that like the forked lightning appear for a moment and ere you can say behold is gone again mine is deeper in my heart so deep that to divorce it from it would be to destroy its home for ever but why so serious johanna you do not mean to tell me that it is possible for you to love any man without his loving you in return you are right there arabella i do not come to speak to you of a hopeless passion far from it but you shall hear lend me my dear friend your serious attention and you shall hear of such mysterious matters mysterious then i shall be in my fairy element for know that i quite live in exalted mystery and you could not possibly have come to any one who would more welcomely receive such a commission from you i am all impatience joanna then with great earnestness related to her friend the whole of the particulars connected with her deep and sincere attachment to mark ingestry she told how in spite of all circumstances which appeared to have a tendency to cast a shadow and a blight upon their young affection they had loved and loved truly how industry disliking both from principle and distaste the study of the law had quarrelled with his uncle mr grant and then how as a bold adventurer he had gone to seek his fortunes in the indian seas fortunes which promised to be splendid but which might end in disappointment and defeat and they had ended in such calamities most deeply and truly did she mourn to be compelled to state and now she concluded by saying and now arabella you know all i have to tell you you know how truly i have loved and how after teaching myself to expect happiness i have met with nothing but despair and you may judge for yourself how sadly the fate of mark and Jestry must deeply affect me and how lost my mind must be in all kinds of conjecture concerning him the hilarity of spirits which had characterized arabella in the earlier part of the interview entirely left her as joanna proceeded in her mournful narration and by the time she had concluded tears of the most genuine sympathy stood in her eyes she took the hands of joanna in both her own and said to her why my dear johanna i never expected to hear from your lips so sad a tale this is most mournful indeed very mournful and although i was half inclined before to quarrel with you for this tardy confidence for you must recollect that it is the first i have heard of this whole affair 
but now the misfortunes that oppress you are quite sufficient heaven knows without me adding to them by the shadow of a reproach they are indeed arabella and believe me if the cares of my love ran smoothly instead of being as it has been full of misadventure you should have had nothing to complain of on the score of a want of confidence but i will own i did hesitate to inflict upon you my miseries for miseries they have been and alas miseries they seem destined to remain johanna you could not have used an argument more delusive than that it is not one which should have come from your lips to me but surely it was a good motive to spare you pain and did you think so lightly of my friendship that it was to be entrusted with nothing but what were a pleasant aspect true friendship is surely best shown in the encounter of difficulty and distress i grieve johanna indeed that you have so much mistaken me nay now you do mean injustice it was not that i doubted your friendship for one moment but that i did indeed shrink from casting the shadow of my sorrows over what should be and what i hope is the sunshine of your heart that was the respect which deterred me from making you aware of what i suppose i must call this ill-fated passion no not ill-fated johanna let us believe that the time will come when it will be far otherwise than ill-fated but what do you think of all i have told you can you gather from it any hope abundance of hope johanna you have no certainty of the death of ingestry i certainly have not as far as regards the loss of him in the indian sea but arabella there is one supposition which from the moment it found a home in my breast has been growing stronger and stronger and that supposition is that this mr thornhill was no other than mark ingestry himself indeed think you so that would be a strange supposition have you any special reason for such a thought none further than a something which seems ever to tell my heart from the first moment that such was the case and a consideration of the improbability of the story related by thornhill why should mark in gesture have given him the string of pearls and the message to me trusting to the preservation of this thornhill and assuming for some strange reason that he himself must fall there is a good argument in that joanna and moreover mark in gesture told me he intended altering his name upon the expedition it is strange but now you mention such a supposition it appears do you know joanna each moment more probable to me oh that fatal string of pearls fatal indeed for if mark in gesture and thornhill be one and the same person the possession of those pearls has been the temptation to destroy him there cannot be a doubt upon that point johanna and so you will find in all the tales of love and romance that jealousy and wealth have been the sources of all the abundant evils which fond and attached hearts have from time to time suffered it is so i believe it is so arabella but advise me what to do for truly i am myself incapable of action tell me what you think it is possible to do under these disastrous circumstances for there is nothing which i will not dare attempt why my dear johanna you must perceive that all the evidence you have regarding the thornhill follows him up to that barber shop in fleet street and no farther it does indeed can you not imagine then that there lies the mystery of his fate and from what you have yourself seen of that man tut do you think he is one who would hesitate even at a murder oh horror my own thoughts have taken that dreadful turn but i dreaded to pronounce the word which would embody them if indeed that fearful-looking man fancied that by any deed of blood he could become possessed of such a treasure as that which belonged to mark and gesture unchristian and liberal as it may sound the belief clings to me that he would not hesitate to do it do not however conclude johanna that such is the case it would appear from all you have heard and seen of these circumstances that there is some fearful mystery but do not johanna conclude hastily that that mystery is one of death be it so or not said johanna i must solve it or go distracted heaven have mercy upon me for even now i feel a fever in my brain that precludes almost the possibility of rational thought be calm be calm we will think the matter over calmly and seriously and who knows but that mere girls as we are we may think of some advantageous mode of arriving at a knowledge of the truth and now i am going to tell you something which your narrative has recalled to my mind say on arabella i shall listen to you with deep attention a short time since about six months i think 
an apprentice of my father in the last week of his servitude was sent to the west end of the town to take a considerable sum of money but he never came back with it and from that day to this we have heard nothing of him although from inquiry that my father made he is certain that he received the money and that he met an acquaintance in the strand who parted from him at the corner of milford lane and to whom he said he intended to call at sweeney tart the barbers in fleet street to have his hair dressed because there was to be a regard on the thames and he was determined to go to it whether my father liked or not and he was never heard of never of course my father made every inquiry upon the subject and called upon sweeney todd for the purpose but as he declared that no such person had ever called at his shop the inquiry there terminated it is very strange and most mysterious for the friends of the youth were indefatigable in their searches for him and by subscribing together for the purpose they offered a large reward to any one who could or would give them information regarding his fate and was it all in vain all nothing could be learned whatever not even the remotest clue is obtained and there the affair has rested in the most profound of mysteries joanna shuddered and for some moments the two young girls were silent it was joanna who broke the silence by exclaiming arabella assist me with what advice you can so that i may go about what i propose with the best prospect of success and the least danger not that i shrink on my own account for risk but if any misadventure were to occur to me i might thereby be incapacitated from pursuing that object to which i will now devote the remainder of my life but what can you do my dear johanna it was but a short time since there was a placard in the barber's window to say that he wanted a lad and assistant in his business but it has been removed or we might have procured some one to take the situation for the express purpose of playing the spy upon the barber's proceedings but perchance there still may be an opportunity of accomplishing something in that way if you knew of any one that would undertake the adventure there will be no difficulty johanna in discovering one willing to do so although we might be long in finding one of sufficient capacity that we could trust but i am adventurous johanna as you know and i think i could have got my cousin albert to personate the character only that he's rather a giddy youth and scarcely to be trusted with a mission of so much importance yes and a mission likewise arabella which by a single false step might be made frightfully dangerous it might be indeed then it would be unfair to place it upon any one but those who feel most deeply for its success johanna the enthusiasm with which you speak awakens in me a thought which i shrank from expressing to you and which i fear perhaps more originates from a certain feeling of romance which i believe is a besetting sin than from any other cause name it arabella name it it would be possible for you or i to accomplish the object by going disguised to the barbers and accepting such a situation if it were vacant for a period of about twenty-four hours in order that during that time some opportunity might be taken of searching in his house for some evidence upon the subject nearest to your heart it is a happy thought said joanna and why should i hesitate at encountering any risk or toil or difficulty for him who has risked so much for me what is there to hinder me from carrying out such a resolution at any moment if great danger should beset me i can rush into the street and claim protection from the passers-by and moreover johanna if you went on with such a mission remember you go with my knowledge and that consequently i would bring you assistance if you appeared not in the specified time of your return each moment arabella the plan assumes to my mind a better shape if sweeney todd be innocent of contriving anything against the life and liberty of those who seek his shop i have nothing to fear but if on the contrary he be guilty danger to me would be the proof of such guilt and that is a proof which i am willing to chance encountering for the sake of the great object i have in view but how am i to provide myself with the necessary means be at rest upon that score my cousin albert and you are as nearly of a size as possible he will be staying here shortly and i will secret from his wardrobe a suit of clothes which i am certain will answer your purpose but let me implore you to wait until you have had your second interview with colonel jeffrey that is well thought of i will meet him and question him closely as to the personal appearance of this mr thornhill besides i shall hear if he has had any confirmed suspicions on the subject that is well you will soon meet him for the week is running on and let me implore you, Johanna, to come to me the morning after you have met him. 
and then we will again consult upon this plan of operations which appears to us feasible and desirable some more conversation of a similar character ensued between these young girls and upon the whole joanna oakley felt much comforted by her visit and more able to think calmly as well as seriously upon the subject which engrossed her whole thoughts and feelings and when she returned to her own home she found that much of the excitement of despair which had formerly had possession of her had given way to hope and with that natural feeling of joyousness and that elasticity of mind which belongs to the young she began to build in her imagination some airy fabrics of future happiness certainly these suppositions went upon the fact that mark ingestry was a prisoner and not that his life had been taken by the mysterious barber for although the possibility of his having been murdered had found a home in her imagination still to her pure spirit it seemed by far too hideous to be true and she scarcely could be said really and truly to entertain it as a matter which was likely to be true End of chapter thirteen Chapter fourteen of The String of Pearls by Unknown. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter fourteen Tobias's Threat and Its Consequences. Perhaps one of the most pitiable objects now in our history is poor Tobias, Sweeney Todd's boy, who certainly had his suspicions aroused in the most terrific manner but who was terrified by the threats of what the barber was capable of doing against his mother from making any disclosures. The effect upon his personal appearance and this wear and tear of his intellect was striking and manifest. The hue of youth and health entirely departed from his cheeks, and he looked so sad and careworn that it was quite a terrible thing to look upon a young lad so, as it were, upon the threshold of existence, and in whom anxious thoughts were making such war upon the physical energies his cheeks were pale and sunken his eyes had an unnatural brightness about them and to look upon his lips one would think that they had never parted in a smile for many a day so sadly were they compressed together he seemed ever to be watching likewise for something fearful and even as he walked the streets he would frequently turn and look inquiringly around him with a shudder and in his brief interview with colonel jeffrey and his friend the captain we can have a tolerably good impression of the state of his mind oppressed with fears and all sorts of dreadful thoughts panting to give utterance to what he knew and to what he suspected and yet terrified into silence for his mother's sake we cannot but view him as signally entitled to the sympathy of the reader and as in all respects one sincerely to be pitied for the cruel circumstances in which he was placed the sun is shining brightly and even that busy region of trade and commerce fleet street is looking gay and beautiful but not for that poor spirit-stricken lad are any of the sights and sounds which used to make up the delight of his existence reaching his eyes or ears now with their accustomed force he sits moody and alone and in the position which he always assumes when sweeney todd is from home that is to say with his head resting on his hands and looking the picture of melancholy abstraction what shall i do he said to himself what will become of me i think if i live here any longer i shall go out of my senses sweeney todd is a murderer i am quite certain of it i wish to say so but i dare not for my mother's sake alas alas the end of it will be that he will kill me but that i shall go out of my senses and then I shall die in some madhouse, and no one will care what I say. <sighs> the boy wept bitterly after he had uttered these melancholy reflections, and he felt his tears something of a relief to him, so that he looked up after a little time and glanced around him. What a strange thing, he said, that people should come into this shop, to my certain knowledge, who never go out of it again, and yet what becomes of them I cannot tell. He looked with a shuddering anxiety towards the parlour, the door of which Sweeney Todd took care to always lock when he left the place, and he thought that he should like much to have a thorough examination of that room. "'I have been in it,' he said, "'and it seems full of cupboards and strange holes and corners, such as I never saw before, and there is an odd stench in it that I cannot make out at all.' but it's out of the question thinking of ever being in it above a few minutes at a time 
for Sweeney Todd takes good care of that. The boy rose and opened a cupboard that was in the shop. It was perfectly empty. Now that's strange, he said. There was a walking stick with an ivory top to it here just before he went out. I could swear it belonged to a man who came in to be shaved. More than once. Ah, and more than twice, too. When I've come in suddenly, I've seen people's hats, and Sweeney Todd would try and make me believe that people go away after being shaved and leave their hats behind them. He walked up to the shaving chair, as it was called, which was a large, old-fashioned piece of furniture made of oak and carved, and as the boy threw himself into it, he said, But an odd thing it is that this chair is screwed so tight to the floor. There is a complete fixture, and Sweeney Todd says that it is so because it's in the best possible light, and if he were not to make it fast in such a way, the customers would shift it about from place to place so that he could not conveniently shave them. It may be true, but I don't know. And you have your doubts said the voice of Sweeney Todd, as that individual, with a noiseless step, walked into the shop. You have your doubts, Tobias? I shall have to cut your throat, that is quite clear. No, no, have mercy upon me. I did not mean what I said. Then it's uncommonly imprudent to say it, Tobias. Do you remember our last conversation? Do you remember that I can hang your mother when I please? Because if you do not... I beg to put you in mind of that pleasant little circumstance. I cannot forget. I do not forget. Tis well. And mark me. I will not have you assume such an aspect as you wear when I am not here. You don't look cheerful, Tobias. And notwithstanding your excellent situation, with little to do, and the number of Lovett's pies you eat, you fall away. I cannot help it, said Tobias. Since you told me what you did concerning my mother, I have been so anxious that I cannot help. Why should you be so anxious? Her preservation depends upon yourself, and upon yourself wholly. You have but to keep silent, and she is safe. But if you utter one word that shall be displeasing to me about my affairs, mark me, Tobias. She comes to the scaffold. And if I cannot conveniently place you in the same madhouse where the last boy I had was placed, I shall certainly be under the troublesome necessity of cutting your throat. I will be silent. I will say nothing, Mr. Todd. I know I shall die soon. And then you will get rid of me altogether, and I don't care how soon that may be. For I am weary of my life. I shall be glad when it is over. Very good said the barber. That's all a matter of taste. And now, Tobias, I desire that you look cheerful and smile. For a gentleman is outside feeling his chin with his hand, and thinking he may as well come in and be shaved. I want you, Tobias, to go to Billingsgate, and bring me a pennyworth of shrimps. Yes, thought Tobias with a groan. Yes, while you murder him. End of chapter 14 Chapter 15 of The String of Pearls by Unknown This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The String of Pearls by Unknown Chapter 15 the second interview between Joanna and the Colonel in the Temple Gardens. Now that there was a great object to be gained by a second interview with Colonel Geoffrey, the anxiety of Joanna Oakley to have it became extremely great, and she counted the very hours until the period should arrive when she could again proceed to the Temple Gardens with something like a certainty of finding him. The object, of course, was to ask him for a description of Mr. Thornhill, sufficiently accurate to enable her to come to something like a positive conclusion as to whether she ought to call him to her own mind as Mark Inglestry or not. And Colonel Geoffrey was not a bit the less anxious to see her than she was to look upon him, for, although in diverse lands he had looked upon many a fair face, and heard many a voice that sounded soft and musical to his ears, he had seen none that, to his mind, was so fair 
and heard no voice that he had considered really so musical and charming to listen to as joanna oakley's a man of more admirable and strict sense of honour than colonel jeffrey could not have been found and therefore it was that he allowed himself to admire the beautiful under any circumstances because he knew that his admiration was of no dangerous quality but that on the contrary it was one of those feelings which might exist in a bosom such as his quite undebased by a meaner influence we think it necessary however before he has his second interview with joanna oakley to give such an explanation of his thoughts and feelings as is in our power when he first met her the purity of her mind and the genuine and beautiful candour of all she said struck him most forcibly as well as her great beauty which could not fail to be extremely manifest after that he began to reason with himself as to what ought to be his feelings with regard to her namely what portion of these ought to be suppressed and what ought to be encouraged if mark ingestry were dead there was not a shadow of interference or dishonour in him colonel jeffrey loving the beautiful girl who was surely not to be shut out of the pale of all affections because the first person to whom her heart had warmed with a pure and holy passion was no more it may be he thought that she is incapable of feeling a sentiment which can at all approach that which once she felt but still she may be happy and serene and may pass many joyous hours as the wife of another he did not positively make these reflections as applicable to himself although they had a tendency that way and he was fast verging on a state of mind which might induce him to give them a more actual application he did not tell himself that he loved her no the word admiration took the place of the more powerful term but then can we not doubt that at this time the germ of a very pure and holy affection was lighted up in the heart of colonel jeffrey for the beautiful creature who had suffered the pangs of so much disappointment and who loved one so well who we almost fear if he was living was scarcely the sort of person fully to requite such an affection but we know so little of mark ingestry and there appears to be so much doubt as to whether he be alive or dead that we should not prejudge him upon such very insufficient evidence joanna oakley did think of taking arabella wilmot with her to this meeting with colonel jeffrey but she abandoned the idea because it really looked as if she was either afraid of him or afraid of herself so she resolved to go alone and when the hour of appointment came she was there walking upon that broad gravelled path which had been trodden by some of the best and some of the most eminent as well as some of the worst of human beings it was not likely that with the feelings of colonel jeffrey towards her he should keep her waiting indeed he was there a good hour before the time and his only great dread was that she might not come he had some reason for this dread because it will be readily recollected by the reader that she had not positively promised to come so that all he had was a hope that way tending and nothing further as minute after minute had passed away she came not although the time had not really arrived his apprehension that she would not give him the meeting had grown in his mind almost to a certainty when he saw her timidly advancing along the garden walk he rose to meet her at once and for a few moments after he had greeted her with kind civility she could do nothing but look inquiringly in his face to know if he had any news to tell her of the object of her anxious solicitude i have heard nothing miss oakley he said that can give you any satisfaction concerning the fate of mr thornhill but we have much suspicion i say we because i have taken a friend into my confidence that something serious must have happened to him and that the barber sweeney todd in fleet street at whose door the dog so mysteriously took his post knows something of that circumstance be it what it may he led her to a seat as he spoke and when she had recovered sufficiently the agitation of her feelings to speak she said in a timid hesitating voice had mr thornhill fair hair and large clear grey eyes yes he had such and i think his smile was the most singularly beautiful i ever beheld in a man heaven help me said joanna have you any reason for asking that question regarding thornhill god grant i had not but alas i have indeed 
I feel that, in Thornhill, I must recognize Mark and Jestry himself. You astonish me. It must be so, it must be so. You have described him to me, and I cannot doubt it. Mark and Jestry and Thornhill are one. I knew that he was going to change his name when he went upon that wild adventure to the Indian Sea. I was well aware of that fact. I cannot think, Miss Oakley, that you are correct in that supposition. There are many things which induce me to think otherwise and the first and foremost of them is that the ingenuous character of Mr. Thornhill forbids the likelihood of such a thing occurring. You may depend on it it is not, cannot be, as you suppose. The proofs are too strong for me, and I find I dare not doubt them. It is so, Colonel Jeffrey, as time, perchance, may show. It is sad, very sad, to think that it is so, but I dare not doubt it, now that you have described him to me exactly as he lived." I must own that in giving an opinion on such a point to you I may be accused of arrogance and assumption, for I have had no description of Mark Ingestry, and never saw him, and although you never saw certainly Mr. Thornhill, yet I have described him to you, and therefore you are able to judge from that description something of him. I am indeed, and I cannot, dare not doubt, it is horrible to be positive on this point to me, because I do fare with you that something dreadful has occurred and that the barber in Fleet Street could unravel a frightful secret, if he chose, connected with Mark and Jestry's fate. I do sincerely hope from my heart that you are wrong. I hope it because I tell you frankly, dim and obscure as is the hope that Mark Ingestry may have been picked up from the wreck of his vessel, it is yet stronger than the supposition that Thornhill has escaped the murderous hands of Sweeney Todd the barber. Joanna looked in his face so imploringly, and with such an expression of hopelessness, that it was most sad indeed to see her, and quite involuntarily he exclaimed, "'If the sacrifice of my life would be to you a relief, and save you from the pangs you suffer, believe me, it should be made.' She started as she said, "'No, no, heaven knows, enough has been sacrificed already. More than enough, much more than enough.' But do not suppose that I am ungrateful for the generous interest you have taken in me. Do not suppose that I think any less of the generosity and nobility of soul that would offer a sacrifice, because it is one I would hesitate to accept. No, believe me, Colonel Jeffrey, that among the few names that are enrolled in my breast, and such to me will ever be honoured, remember yours will be found while I live. But that will not be long. But that will not be long. Nay! Do not speak so despairingly. Have I not cause for despair? Cause have you for great grief, but yet scarcely for despair. You are young yet, and let me entertain a hope that even if a feeling of regret may mingle with your future thoughts, time will achieve something in tempering your sorrow, and if not great happiness, you may know great serenity. I dare not hope it, but I know your words are kindly spoken and most kindly meant. You may well assure yourself that they are so. I will ascertain his fate, or perish. You alarm me by those words, as well as by your manner of uttering them. Let me implore you, Miss Oakley, to attempt nothing rash. Remember how weak and inefficient must be the exertions of a young girl like yourself, one who knows so little of the world, and can really understand so little of its wickedness. Affection conquers all obstacles, and the weakest and most inefficient girl that ever stepped, if she have strung within her that love which, in all its sacred intensity, knows no fair, shall indeed accomplish much. I feel that, in such a case, I could shake off all girlish terrors and ordinary alarms, and if there be danger, I would ask, what is life to me without all that could adorn it, and make it beautiful? This, indeed, is the very enthusiasm of affection, when, believe me, it will lead you to some excess, to some romantic exercise of feeling, such as will bring great danger in its train to the unhappiness of those who love you. Those who love me? Who is there to love me now? Joanna Oakley, I dare not and will not utter words that come thronging to my lips, but which I fear might be unwelcome to your ears. I will not say that I can answer the questions you have asked, because it would sound ungenerous at such a time as this, when you have met me to talk of the fate of another. Oh, forgive me that hurried away by the feeling of a moment I have uttered these words, for I meant not to utter them. 
Joanna looked at him in silence, and it might be that there was the slightest possible tinge of reproach in her look, but it was very slight, for one glance at that ingenuous countenance would be sufficient to convince the most sceptical of the truth and single-mindedness of its owner. Of this there could be no doubt whatever, and if anything in the shape of a reproach was upon the point of coming from her lips, she forbore to utter it. "'May I hope,' he added, "'that I have not lowered myself in your esteem, Miss Oakley, by what I have said?' "'I hope,' she said gently, "'you will continue to be my friend.' She laid an emphasis on the word friend, and he fully understood what she meant to imply thereby, and after a moment's pause, said, "'Heaven forbid that ever by word or by action, Joanna, I should do aught to deprive myself of that privilege. Let me be your friend, since—' He left the sentence unfinished, but if he had added the words, "'Since I can do no more—' He could not have made it more evident to Joanna— that those were the words he intended to utter. "'And now,' he added, "'that I hope and trust we understand each other better than we did, and you are willing to call me by the name of friend, let me once more ask you by the privilege of such a title to be careful of yourself, and not to risk much in order that you may perhaps have some remote chance of achieving very little.' "'But can I endure this dreadful suspense?' It is, alas, too common an affliction on human nature, Joanna. Pardon me for addressing you as Joanna. Nay, it requires no excuse. I am accustomed so to be addressed by all who feel a kindly interest for me. Call me Joanna, if you will, and I shall feel a greater assurance of your friendship and your esteem. I will then avail myself of that permission, and again and again I will entreat you to leave to me the task of making what attempts may be made to discover the fate of Mr. Thornhill. There must be danger even in inquiring for him if he has met with any foul play, and therefore I ask you to let that danger be mine. Joanna asked herself if she should or not tell him of the scheme of operations that had been suggested by Arabella Wilmot, but, somehow or another, she shrank most wonderfully from so doing, both on account of the censure which she concluded he would be likely to cast upon it, and the romantic, strange notion of the plan itself. So she said, gently and quickly, "'I shall attempt nothing that shall not have some possibility of success attending it. I will be careful, you may depend, for many considerations. My father, I know, centres all his affections in me, and for his sake I will be careful.' I shall be content then, and now may I hope that this day week I may see you here again, in order that I may tell you if I have made any discovery, and that you may tell me the same, for my interest in Thornhill is that of a sincere friend, to say nothing of the deep interest in your happiness which I feel, and which has now become an element in the transaction of the highest value. I will come, said Joanna, if I can come. You do not doubt? No, no. I will come, and I hope to bring you some news of him in whom you are so much interested. It shall not be fault of mine if I come not. He walked with her from the gardens, and together they passed the shop of Sweeney Todd, but the door was close shut, and they saw nothing of the barber, or of the poor boy, his apprentice, who was so much to be pitied. He parted with Joanna near to her father's house, and he walked slowly away with his mind so fully impressed with the excellence and beauty of the spectacle-maker's daughter, that it was quite clear, as long as he lived, he would not be able to rid himself of the favorable impression she had made upon him. "'I love her,' he said. "'I love her, but she seems in no respect willing to enchain her affections.' Alas, how sad it is for me that the being whom above all others I could wish to call my own, instead of being a joy to me, I have only encountered that she might impart a pang to my heart. Beautiful and excellent Joanna, I love you, but I can see that your own affections are withered for ever. End of chapter 15《ハッピーバースデー》ジョーカーズ・ノーニー・ジョーカーズ・ノーニー・ジョーカーズ・ノーニー・ジョーカーズ・ノーニー・ジョーカーズ・ノーニー・ジョーカーズ・ノーニー・ジョーカーズ・ノーニー・ジョーカーズ・ノーニー・ジョーカーズ・ノーニー・ジョーカーズ・ノーニー・ジョーカーズ・ノーニー・ジョーカーズ・ノー
Chapter 16. The Barber Makes Another Attempt to Sell the String of Pearls. It would seem as if Sweeney Todd, after his adventure in trying to dispose of the string of pearls which he possessed, began to feel a little doubtful about his chances of success in that matter, for he waited patiently for a considerable period before he again made the attempt, and then he made it after a totally different fashion. Towards the close of night, on the same evening when Joanna Oakley had met Colonel Jeffrey for the second time, in the Temple Gardens, and while Tobias sat alone in the shop in his usual deep dejection, a stranger entered the place, with a large blue bag in his hand, and looked inquiringly about him. "'Hello, uh, my lad,' said he. "'Is this Mr. Todd's?' "'Yes,' said Tobias. "'But he is not at home. What do you want?' <laughs> "'Well, I'll be hanged,' said the man. "'If this don't beat everything, you don't mean to tell me he is a barber, do you?' "'Indeed I do, don't you see?' "'Yes, I see, to be sure. But I'll be shot if I thought of it beforehand. What do you think he has been doing?' "'Doing?' said Tobias, with animation. "'Do you think he will be hanged?' "'Why, no. I don't say it is a hanging matter, although you seem as if you wished it was. But I'll just tell you now we are artists at the west end of the town.' "'Artists?' Do you mean to say you draw pictures? No, no. We make clothes, but we call ourselves artists now, because tailors are out of fashion. Oh, that's it, is it? Yes, that's it. And you would scarcely believe it. But he came to our shop, actually, and ordered a suit of clothes, which were to come to no less a sum than thirty pounds, and told us to make them up in such a style that they were to do for any nobleman. And he gave his name and address, as Mr. Todd, at this number in Fleet Street. But I hadn't the least idea that he was a barber. If I had, I am quite certain that the clothes would not have been finished in the style they are, but quite the reverse. Well, said Tobias, I can't think what he wants such clothing for, but I suppose it's all right. Was he a tall, ugly-looking fellow? As ugly as the very devil. I'll just show you the things, as he is not at home. The coat is of the finest velvet, lined with silk and trimmed with lace. Did you ever, in all your life, see such a coat for a barber? Indeed, I never did. But it is some scheme of his, of course. It is a superb coat. Yes, and all the rest of the dress is of the same style. What on earth can he be going to do with it, I can't think, for it's only fit to go to court in. Oh, well, I know nothing about it said Tobias, with a sigh. You can leave it or not as you like. It is all one to me. Well, you seem to be the most melancholy wretch ever I came near. What's the matter with you? The matter with me? Oh, nothing. Of course I am as happy as can be. Ain't I Sweeney Todd's apprentice? And ain't that enough to make anybody sing all day long? It may be, for all I know. But certainly you don't seem to be in a singing humour. But... However, we artists cannot waste our time. So just be so good as to take care of the clothes, and be sure you give them to your master. And so I wash my hands of the transaction. Very good. He shall have them. But do you mean to leave such valuable clothes without getting the money for them? Not exactly, for they are paid for. Oh, that makes all the difference. He shall have them. Scarcely had this tailor left the place when a boy arrived with a parcel and, looking around him with undisguised astonishment, said, "'Isn't there some other Mr. Todd in Fleet Street?' "'Not that I know of,' said Tobias. "'What have you got there?' "'Silk stockings, gloves, lace, cravats, ruffles, and so on.' "'The deuce you have! I dare say it's all right.' "'I shall leave them. They are paid for.' This is the name, and this is the number. Now, stupid! This last exclamation arose from the fact that this boy, in going out, ran up against another who was coming in. Can't you see where you're going? said the new arrival. What's that to you? I have a good mind to punch your head. Do it, and then come down to our court and see what a licking I'll give you. Will you? Why don't you? Only let me catch you, that's all. 
they stood for some moments so close together that their noses very nearly touched and then after mutual assertions of what they would do if they caught each other although in either case to stretch out an arm would have been quite sufficient to have accomplished that object they separated and the last corner said to tobias in a tone of irritation probably consequent upon the misunderstanding he had just had with the hosier's boy you can tell mr todd that the carriage will be ready at half-past seven precisely and then he went away leaving tobias in a state of great bewilderment as to what sweeney todd could possibly be about with such an amount of finery as that which was evidently coming home for him i can't make it out he said it's some villainy of course but i can't make out what it is i wish i knew i might thwart him in it he is a villain and neither could nor would project anything good but what can i do i am quite helpless in this and will just let it take its course i can only wish for a power of action i will never possess alas alas i am very sad and know not what will become of me i wish i was in my grave and there i am sure i shall be soon unless something happens to turn the tide of all this wretched evil fortune that has come upon me it was vain for tobias to think of vexing himself with conjectures as to what sweeney todd was about to do with so much finery for he had not the remotest foundation to go upon in the matter and could not for the life of him imagine any possible contingency or chance which should make it necessary for the barber to deck himself in such gaudy apparel all he could do was to lay down in his own mind a general principle as regarded sweeney todd's conduct and that consisted in the fact that whatever might be his plans and whatever might be his objects they were for no good but on the contrary were most certainly intended for the accomplishment of some great evil which that most villainous person intended to perpetrate i will observe all i can thought tobias to himself and do what i can to put a stop to his mischiefs but i fear it will be very little he will allow me to observe and perhaps still less that he will allow me to do but i can but try and do my best poor tobias's best as regarded achieving anything against sweeney todd we may well suppose would be little indeed for that individual was not the man to give anybody an opportunity of doing much and possessed as he was of the most consummate art as well as the greatest possible amount of unscrupulousness there can be very little doubt but that any attempt poor tobias might make would recoil upon himself in about another half hour the barber returned and his first question was have any things been left for me yes sir said tobias here are two parcels and the boy has been to say that the carriage will be ready at half past seven precisely tis well said the barber that will do and tobias you will be careful whilst i am gone of the shop i shall be back in half an hour mind you and not later and be sure i find you here at your post but you may say if any one comes here on business that there will be neither shaving nor dressing to-night you understand me yes sir certainly sweeney todd then took the bundles which contained the costly apparel and retired into the parlour with them and as it was then seven o'clock tobias correctly enough supposed that he had gone to dress himself and he waited with a considerable amount of curiosity to see what sort of an appearance the barber would cut in his fine apparel tobias had not to control his impatience long for in less than twenty minutes out came sweeney todd attired in the very height of fashion for the period his waistcoat was something positively gorgeous and his fingers were loaded with such costly rings that they quite dazzled the sight of tobias to look upon then moreover he wore a sword with a jewelled hilt but it was one which tobias really thought he had seen before for he had a recollection that a gentleman had come in to have his hair dressed and had taken it off and laid just such a sword across his hat during the operation remember said sweeney todd remember your instructions obey them to the letter and no doubt you will ultimately become happy and independent with these words sweeney todd left the place and poor tobias looked after him with a groan as he repeated the words happy and independent 
Alas, what a mockery it is of this man to speak to me in such a way. I only wish that I were dead. But we will leave Tobias to his own reflections, and follow the more interesting progress of Sweeney Todd, who, for some reason best known to himself, was then playing so grand a part, and casting away so large a sum of money. He made his way to a livery stable in the immediate neighborhood, and there, sure enough, the horses were being placed to a handsome carriage, and all being very soon in readiness, Sweeney Todd gave some whispered directions to the driver, and the vehicle started off westward. At that time Hyde Park Corner was very nearly out of town, and it looked as if you were getting a glimpse of the country, and actually seeing something of the peasantry of England, when you got another couple miles off, and that was the direction in which Sweeney Todd went. And as he goes, we may as well introduce to the reader the sort of individual whom he was going to visit in so much state, and for whom he thought it necessary to go to such great expense. At that period the follies and vices of the nobility were somewhere about as great as they are now, and consequently extravagance induced on many occasions troublesome sacrifice of money, and it was found extremely convenient to apply to a man of the name of John Mundell, an exceedingly wealthy person, a Dutchman by extraction, who was reported to make immense sums of money by lending to the nobility and others what they required on emergencies, at enormous rates of interest. But it must not be supposed that John Mundell was so confiding as to lend his money without security. It was quite the reverse, for he took care to have the jewels, some costly plate, or the title deeds of an estate, perchance, as security, before he would part with a single shilling of his cash. In point of fact, John Mundell was nothing more than a pawnbroker on a very extensive scale, and, although he had an office in town, he usually received his more aristocratic customers at his private residence, which was about two miles off, on the Uxbridge Road. After this explanation, it can very easily be imagined what was the scheme of Sweeney Todd, and that he considered if he borrowed from John Mundell a sum equal in amount to half the real value of the pearls, he should be well rid of a property which he certainly could not sufficiently well account for the possession of to enable him to dispose of it openly to the highest bidder. We give Sweeney Todd great credit for the scheme he proposes. It was eminently calculated to succeed, and one which, in the way he undertook it, was certainly set about in the best possible way. During his ride, he revolved in his mind exactly what he should say to John Mundell, and from what we know of him, we may be well convinced that Sweeney Todd was not likely to fail from any amount of bashfulness in the transaction, but that, on the contrary, he was just the man to succeed in any scheme which required great assurance to carry it through for he was certainly master of great assurance, and possessed a kind of diplomatic skill, which had fortune placed in him a more elevated position of life, would no doubt have made a great man of him, and gained him a great political reputation. John Mundell's villa, which was called, by the way, Mundell House, was a large, handsome, and modern structure, surrounded by a few acres of pleasure gardens, which, however, the money-lender never looked at, for his whole soul was too much engrossed by his love for cash to enable him to do so, and, if he derived any satisfaction at all from it, that satisfaction must have been entirely owing to the fact that he had wrung mansion, grounds, and all the costly furnishings of the former from an improvident debtor, who had been forced to fly the country and leave his property wholly in the hands of the money-lender and usurer. It was but a short drive, with the really handsome horses that Sweeney Todd had succeeded in hiring for the occasion, and he soon found himself opposite the entrance gates of Mundell House. His great object, now, was that the usurer should see the equipage which he had brought down, and he accordingly desired the footman, who had accompanied him, at once to ring the bell at the entrance gate, and to say that a gentleman was waiting in his carriage to see Mr. Mundell. This was done, and when the money-lender's servant reported to him that the equipage was a costly one, and that, in his opinion, the visitor must be some nobleman of great rank, John Mundell made no difficulty about the matter, but walked down to the gate at once, where he immediately mentally subscribed to the opinion of his servant, by admitting to himself that the equipage was faultless, and presumed at once that it did belong to some person of great rank. He was proportionately humble, as such men always are, and advancing to the side of the carriage, he begged to know what commands his lordship, for so he called him at once, had for him. "'I wish to know,' said Sweeney Todd, Mr. Mundell, 
if you are inclined to lay under an obligation a rather illustrious lady by helping her out of a little pecuniary difficulty john mundell glanced again at the equipage and he likewise saw something of the rich dress of his visitor who had not disputed the title which had been applied to him of lord and he made up his mind accordingly that it was just one of the transactions that would suit him provided the security that would be offered was of a tangible nature that was the only point upon which john mundell had the remotest doubt but at all events he urgently pressed his visitor to alight and walk in End of chapter 16chapter seventeen of the string of pearls by unknown this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org chapter seventeen the great change in the prospects of sweeney todd as sweeney todd's object as far as the money-lenders having seen the carriage was fully answered he had no objection to enter the house which he accordingly did at once being preceded by john mundell who became each moment more and more impressed with the fact as he considered it that his guest was some person of very great rank and importance in society he ushered him into a splendidly furnished apartment and after offering him refreshments which sweeney todd politely declined he waited with no small degree of impatience for his visitor to be explicit with regard to the object of his visit i should said sweeney todd have myself accommodated the illustrious lady with the sum of money she requires but as i could not do so without encumbering some estates she positively forbade me to think of it certainly said mr mundell she is a very illustrious lady i presume very illustrious indeed but it must be a condition of this transaction if you at all enter into it that you are not to inquire precisely who she is nor are you to inquire precisely who i am it's not my usual way of conducting business but if everything else be satisfactory i shall not cavil at that very good by everything else being satisfactory i presume you mean the security offered why yes that is of great importance my lord i informed the illustrious lady that as the affair was to be wrapped up in something of a mystery the security must be extremely ample that's a very proper view to take of the matter my lord i wonder thought john mundell if he is a duke i'll call him your grace next time and see if he objects to it therefore continued sweeney todd the illustrious lady placed in my hands security to a third greater amount than she required certainly certainly a very proper arrangement your grace may i ask the nature of the proffered security jewels highly satisfactory and unexceptionable security they go into a small space and do not deteriorate in value and if they do said the barber deteriorate in value it would make no difference to you for the illustrious person's honour will be committed to their redemption i don't doubt that your grace in the least i merely made the remark incidentally quite incidentally of course of course and i trust before going further that you are quite in a position to enter into this subject certainly i am and i am proud to say to any amount show me the money's worth your grace and i will show you the money that's my way of doing business and no one can say that john mundell ever shrunk from a matter that was brought fairly before him and that he considered worth his going into it was by hearing such a character of you that i was induced to come to you what do you think of that sweeney todd took from his pocket with a careless air the string of pearls and cast them down before the eyes of the money-lender who took them up and ran them rapidly through his fingers for a few seconds before he said i thought there was but one string like this in the kingdom and that those belonged to the queen well said sweeney todd i humbly beg your grace's pardon how much money does your grace require on these pearls twelve thousand pounds is their current value if a sale of them was enforced eight thousand are required of you on their security eight thousand is a large sum 
as a general thing i lent but half the value upon anything but in this case to oblige your grace and the illustrious personage i do not of course hesitate for one moment but shall for one month lend the required amount that will do said sweeney todd scarcely concealing the exultation he felt at getting so much more from john mundell than he expected and which he certainly would not have got if the money-lender had not been most fully and completely impressed with the idea that the pearls belonged to the queen and that he had actually at length majesty itself for a customer he did not suppose for one moment that it was the queen who wanted the money but his view of the case was that she had lent the pearls to this nobleman to meet some exigency of his own and that of course they would be redeemed very shortly altogether a more pleasant transaction for john mundell could not have been imagined it was just the sort of thing he would have looked out for and had the greatest satisfaction in bringing to a conclusion and he considered it was opening the door to the highest class of business in his way that he was capable of doing in what name your grace he said shall i draw a check upon my banker in the name of colonel george certainly certainly and if your grace will give me an acknowledgment for eight thousand pounds and please to understand that at the end of a month from this time the transaction will be renewed if necessary i will give you a check for seven thousand five hundred pounds why seventy five hundred pounds only when you mentioned eight thousand pounds the five hundred pounds is a little commission upon the transaction your grace will perceive that i appreciate highly the honour of your grace's custom and consequently charge the lowest possible price i can assure your grace i could get more for my money by a great deal but the pleasure of being able to meet your grace's views is so great that i am willing to make a sacrifice and therefore it is that i say five hundred when really i ought to say a thousand pounds taking into consideration the great scarcity of money at the present juncture and i can assure your grace that peace peace said sweeney todd give me the money and if it be not convenient to redeem the jewels at the end of a month from this time you will hear from me most assuredly i am quite satisfied of that said john mundell and he accordingly drew a check for seventy five hundred pounds which he handed to sweeney todd who put it in his pocket not a little delighted that at last he had got rid of his pearls even at a price so far beneath their real value i need scarcely urge upon you mr mundell he said the propriety of keeping this affair profoundly secret indeed you need not your grace for it is part of my business to be discreet and cautious i should very soon have nothing to do in my line your grace may depend if i were to talk about it no this transaction will forever remain locked up in my own breast and no living soul but your grace and i need know what has occurred with this john mundell showed sweeney todd to his carriage with abundance of respect and in two minutes more he was travelling along towards town with what might be considered a small fortune in his pocket we should have noticed earlier that sweeney todd had upon the occasion of his going to sell the pearls to the lapidary in the city made some great alterations in his appearance so that it was not likely he should be recognized again to a positive certainty for example having no whiskers whatever of his own he had put on a large black pair of false ones as well as mustachios and he had given some colour to his cheeks likewise which had so completely altered his appearance that those who were most intimate with him would not have known him except by his voice and that he took great care to alter in his intercourse with john mundell so that it should not become a future means of detection i thought that this would succeed he muttered to himself as he went towards town and i have not been deceived for three months longer and only three i will carry on the business in fleet street so that any sudden alteration in my fortunes may not give rise to suspicion he was then silent for some minutes during which he appeared to be revolving some very knotty question in his brain and then he said suddenly well well as regards to bias i think it will be safer unquestionably to put him out of the way by taking his life than to try to dispose of him in a madhouse and i think there are one or two more persons whom it will be highly necessary to prevent being mischievous at all events at present i must think 
I must think. When such a man as Sweeney Todd set about thinking, there could be no possible doubt but that some serious mischief was meditated, and any one who could have watched his face during that ride home from the money-lenders would have seen by its expression that the thoughts which agitated him were of a dark and desperate character, and such as anybody but himself would have shrunk from, aghast. But he was not a man to shrink from anything, and, on the contrary, the more a set of circumstances presented themselves in a gloomy and terrific aspect, the better they seemed to suit him, and the peculiar constitution of his mind. There can be no doubt but that the love of money was the predominant feeling in Sweeney Todd's intellectual organization, and that, by the amount it would bring him, or the amount it would deprive him of, he measured everything. With such a man, then, no question of morality or ordinary feeling could arise, and there can be no doubt but that he would quite willingly have sacrificed the whole human race, if, by doing so, he could have achieved any of the objects of his ambition. And so, on his road homeward, he probably made up his mind to plunge still deeper into criminality, and perchance to indulge in acts that a man not already so deeply versed in iniquity would have shrunk from with the most positive terror. And by a strange style of reasoning, such men as Sweeney Todd reconciled themselves to the most heinous crimes upon the ground of what they call policy. That is to say, that having committed some serious offence, they are compelled to commit a great number more for the purpose of endeavouring to avoid the consequences of the first lot, and hence the continuance of criminality becomes a matter necessary to self-defence, and an essential ingredient in their consideration of self-preservation. Probably Sweeney Todd had been, for the greater part of his life, aiming at the possession of extensive pecuniary resources, and, no doubt, by the aid of a superior intellect, and a mind full of craft and design, he had managed to make others subservient to his views, and now that those views were answered, and that his underlings and accomplices were no longer required, they became positively dangerous. He was well aware of that cold-blooded policy which teaches that it is far safer to destroy than to cast away the tools by which a man carves his way to power and fortune. "'They shall die,' said Sweeney Todd. "'Dead men tell no tales, nor women nor boys either. And they shall all die, after which there will, I think, be a serious fire in Fleet Street.' <laughs> It may spread to what mischief it likes, always provided it stops not short of the entire destruction of my house and premises. Rare sport, rare sport it will be to me, for then I will at once commence a new career, in which the barber will be forgotten, and the man of fashion only seen and remembered. For with this last addition to my means, I am fully capable of vying with the highest and the noblest, let them be who they may. This seemed a pleasant train of reflections to Sweeney Todd, and as the coach entered Fleet Street, there sat such a grim smile upon his countenance that he looked like some fiend in human shape who had just completed the destruction of a human soul. When he reached the livery stables to which he directed them to drive, instead of to his own shop, he rewarded all who had gone with him most liberally, so that the coachman and footman, who were both servants out of place, would have had no objection for Sweeney Todd every day to have gone on some such expedition, so that they should receive as liberal wages for the small part they enacted in it as they did upon that occasion. He then walked from the stables towards his own house, but upon reaching there a little disappointment awaited him, for he found to his surprise that no light was burning, and when he placed his hand upon the shop door it opened, but there was no trace of Tobias, although he, Sweeney Todd, called loudly upon him the moment he set foot within the shop. Then a feeling of great approbation crept across the barber, and he groped anxiously about for some matches, by the aid of which he hoped to procure a light, and then an explanation of the mysterious absence of Tobias. But, in order that we may in its proper form relate how it was that Tobias had had the daring, thus in open contradiction of his master, to be away from the shop, we must devote to Tobias a chapter which will plead his extenuation. End of chapter 17 Chapter 18 of The String of Pearls by Unknown 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 18. Tobias's Adventures During the Absence of Sweeney Todd. Tobias guessed, and guessed rightly, too, that when Sweeney Todd said he would be away half an hour, he only mentioned that short period of time in order to keep the lad's vigilance on the alert, and to prevent him from taking advantage of a more protracted absence. The very style and manner in which he had gone out precluded the likelihood of it being for so short a period of time, and that circumstance sent Tobias seriously thinking over a situation which was becoming more intolerable every day. The lad had the sense to feel that he could not go on much longer as he was going on, and that in a short time such a life would destroy him. "'It is beyond endurance,' he said, "'and I know not what to do, and since Sweeney Todd has told me, boy he had before went out of his senses, and is now in the cell of a madhouse, I feel that such will be my fate, and that I too shall come to that dreadful end.' and then no one will believe a word I utter, but consider everything to be mere raving. After a time, as the darkness increased, he lit the lamp which hung in the shop, and which, until it was closed for the night, usually shed a dim ray from the window. Then he sat down to think again, and he said to himself, If I could but summon courage to ask my mother about this robbery which Sweeney Todd imputes to her, she might assure me it was false, and that she never did such a deed. But then it is dreadful for me to ask her such a question, because it may be true, and then how shocking it would be for her to be forced to confess to me her own son such a circumstance. These were the honorable feelings which prevented Tobias from questioning his mother as regarded Todd's accusation of her, an accusation too dreadful to believe implicitly, and yet sufficiently probable for him to have a strong suspicion that it might be true after all. It is to be deeply regretted that Tobias's philosophy did not carry him a little further, and make him see, the moment the charge was made, that he ought unquestionably to investigate it to the very utmost. But still, we could hardly expect from a mere boy that acute reasoning and power of action, which depends so much on the knowledge of the world, and an extensive practice in the usages of society. It was sufficient if he felt correctly, we could scarcely expect him to reason so, but upon this occasion, above all other, he seemed completely overcome by the circumstances which surrounded him, and from his excited manner one might almost have imagined that the insanity he himself predicted at the close of his career was really not far off. He wrung his hands, and he wept, every now and then, in sad speech, bitterly bemoaning his situation, until at length, with a sudden resolution, he sprang to his feet, exclaiming, "'This night shall end it. I can endure it no more. I will fly from this place and seek my fortune elsewhere. Any amount of distress, danger, or death itself, even, is preferable to the dreadful life I lead.' He walked some paces towards the door, and then he paused, as he said to himself in a low tone, Todd will surely not be home yet for a while, and why should I then neglect the only opportunity I may ever have of searching this house to satisfy my mind as regards any of the mysteries it contains? He paused over this thought and considered well its danger, for dangerous indeed it was to no small extent, but he was desperate, and with a resolution that scarcely could have been expected from him, he determined upon taking that first step above all others, which Todd was almost certain to punish with death. He closed the shop door and bolted it upon the inside, so that he could not be suddenly interrupted, and then he looked round him carefully for some weapon by the aid of which he should be able to break his way into the parlour which the barber always kept closed and locked in his absence. A weapon that would answer to the purpose of breaking any lock, if Tobias chose to proceed so roughly to work, was close at hand in the iron bar, which, when the place was closed at night, secured a shutter. Wrought up as he was to almost frenzy, Tobias seized the bar, and, advancing towards the parlour door, he with one blow smashed the lock to atoms, and the door soon yielded. The moment it did so, there was a crash of glass, and when Tobias entered the room, he saw that upon its threshold lay a wine-glass shattered to atoms, 
and he felt certain it had been placed in some artful position by Sweeney Todd as a detector, when he should return, of any attempt that had been made upon the door of the parlour. And now Tobias felt that he was so far committed that he might as well go on with his work, and accordingly he lit a candle, which he found upon the parlour table, and then proceeded to make what discoveries he could. Several of the cupboards in the room yielded at once to his hands, and in them he found nothing remarkable, but there was one that he could not open. So, without a moment's hesitation, he had recourse to the bar of iron again, and broke its lock. When the door swung open, and to his astonishment there tumbled out of the cupboard such a volley of hats of all sorts and descriptions, some loped with silver, some three-cornered, and some square, that they formed quite a museum of that article of attire, and excited the greatest surprise in the mind of Tobias, at the same time that they tended very greatly to confirm some other thoughts and feelings which he had concerning Sweeney Todd. This was the only cupboard which was fast, although there was another door which looked as if it opened into one, but when Tobias broke that down with a bar of iron, he found it was the door which led to the staircase, conducting to the upper part of the house, that upper part which Sweeney Todd, with all his avarice, would never let, and of which the shutters were kept continually closed, so that the opposite neighbors never caught a glimpse into any of the apartments. With cautious and slow steps, which he adopted instantaneously, although he knew that there was no one in the house but himself, Tobias ascended the staircase. I will go to the very top rooms first, he said to himself, and so examine them all as I come down, and then if Todd should return suddenly, I shall have a better chance of hearing him than if I begin below and went upwards. Acting upon this prudent scheme, he went up to the attics, all the doors of which were swinging open, and there was nothing in any one of them whatever. He descended to the second floor, with the like result, and a feeling of great disappointment began to creep over him at the thought that, after all, the barber's house might not repay the trouble of examination. But when he reached the first floor he soon found abundant reason to alter his opinion. The doors were fast, and he had to burst them open, and, when he got in, he found that those rooms were partially furnished, and that they contained a great quantity of miscellaneous property of all kinds and descriptions. In one corner was an enormous quantity of walking sticks, some of which were of a very costly and expensive character, with gold and silver chased tops to them, and in another corner was a great number of umbrellas, in fact at least a hundred of them. Then there were boots and shoes, lying upon the floor, partially covered up, as if to keep them from dirt. There were thirty or forty swords of different styles and patterns, many of them appearing to be very firm blades, and in one or two cases the scabbards were richly ornamented. At one end of the front and larger of the two rooms was an old-fashioned looking bureau of great size, and with as much woodwork in it as seemed required to make at least a couple of such articles of furniture. This was very securely locked, and presented more difficulties in the way of opening it than any of the doors had done, for the lock was of great strength and apparent durability. Moreover, it was not so easily got at, but at length by using the bar as a sort of lever, instead of as a mere machine to strike with, Tobias succeeded in forcing this bureau open, and then his eyes were perfectly dazzled with the amount of jewellery and trinkets of all kinds and descriptions that were exhibited to his gaze. There were a great number of watches, gold chains, silver and gold snuff-boxes, and a large assortment of rings, shoe-buckles, and brooches. These articles must have been of great value, and Tobias could not help exclaiming aloud, "'How could Sweeney Todd come by these articles?' except by the murder of their owners. This, indeed, seemed but too probable a supposition, and the more especially so, as in a further part of this bureau a great quantity of apparel was found by Tobias. He stood with a candle in his hand, looking upon these various objects for more than a quarter of an hour, and then, as a sudden and a natural thought came across him of how completely a few of them would even satisfy his wants and his mother's for a long time to come, he stretched forth his hands toward the glittering mass, but he drew it back again with a shudder, saying, Oh, no, these things are the plunder of the dead. Let Sweeney Todd keep them to himself, and look upon them if he can. With the eyes of enjoyment, I will have none of them. They would bring misfortune along with every guinea that they might be turned into. As he spoke, he heard St. Dunstan's clock strike nine, and he started at the sound, 
for it let him know that already sweeney todd had been away an hour beyond the time he said he would be absent so there was a probability of his quick return now and it would scarcely be safe to linger longer in his home i must be gone i must be gone i should like to look upon my mother's face once more before i leave london forever perhaps i may tell her of the danger she is in from todd's knowledge of her secret no no i cannot speak to her of that i must go and leave her to those chances which i hope and trust will work favourably for her it was a strange and sudden whim that took him rather than a matter of reflection that induced him instead of his own hat to take one of those which were lying so indiscriminately at his feet and he did so by mere accident it turned out to be an exceedingly handsome hat of rich workmanship and material and then tobias feeling terrified lest sweeney todd should return before he could leave the place paid no attention to anything but turned away from the shop merely pulling the door after him and then darting over the road towards the temple like a hunted hare for his great wish was to see his mother and then he had an undefined notion that his best plan for escaping the clutches of sweeney todd would be to go to sea in common with all boys of his age who know nothing whatever of the life of a sailor it presented itself in the most fascinating colours a sailor ashore and a sailor afloat are about as two different things as the world can present but to the imagination of tobias Bragg, a sailor was somebody who was always dancing hornpipes spending money and telling wonderful stories no wonder then that the profession presented itself under such fascinating colours to all such persons as tobias and as it seemed and seems still to be a sort of general understanding that the real condition of a sailor should be mystified in every possible way and shape both by novelist and dramatist it is no wonder that it requires actual experience to enable those parties who are in the habit of being carried away by just what they hear to come to a correct conclusion i will go to sea ejaculated tobias yes i will go to sea as he spoke those words he passed out of the gate of the temple leading into whitefriars in which ancient vicinity his mother dwelt endeavouring to eke out a living as best she might she was very much surprised for she happened to be at home at the unexpected visit of her son tobias and uttered a faint scream as she let fall a flat iron very nearly upon his toe mother he said i cannot stay with sweeney todd any longer so do not ask me not stay with a respectable man a respectable man mother alas alas how little you know of him but what am i saying i dare not speak oh that fatal fatal candlestick but how are you to live and what do you mean by a fatal candlestick forgive me i did not mean to say that farewell mother i am going to see to see what my dear said mrs Ragg, who was much more difficult to talk to than even hamlet's gravedigger you don't know how much i am obliged to sweeney todd yes i do and that's what drives me mad to think of farewell mother perhaps forever if i can of course i will communicate with you but now i dare not say oh what have you done tobias what have you done nothing nothing but sweeney todd is what what no matter uh, no matter nothing nothing and yet at this last moment i am almost tempted to ask you concerning a candlestick don't mention that said mrs Ragg. i don't want to hear anything said about it it is true then yes but did mr todd tell you he did <laughs> he did i have now asked the question i never thought could have passed my lips farewell mother forever farewell tobias rushed out of the place leaving old mrs Ragg astonished at his bearing and with a strong suspicion that some accession of insanity had come over him the lord have mercy upon us she said what shall i do i am astonished at mr todd telling him about the candlestick it's true enough though for all that i recollect it as well as if it were yesterday it was a very hard winter and i was minding a set of chambers when todd came to shave the gentleman and i saw him with my own eyes put a silver candlestick in his pocket 
then i went over to his shop and reasoned with him about it and he gave it me back and i brought it to the chambers and laid it down exactly on the spot where he took it from to be sure said mrs wragg after a pause of a few moments to be sure he has been a good friend to me ever since but that i suppose is for fear i should tell and get him hung or transported but however we must take the good with the bad and when tobias comes to think of it he will go back again to his work i dare say for after all it's a very foolish thing for him to trouble his head whether mr todd stole a silver candlestick or not End of chapter eighteen Chapter Nineteen of *The String of Pearls* by Unknown. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter Nineteen: The Strange Odor in Old Saint Dunstan's Church. About this time, and while these incidents of our most strange and eventful narrative were taking place. The pious frequenters of old St. Dunstan's church began to perceive a strange and most abominable odor throughout that sacred edifice. It was in vain that old women who came to hear the sermons, although they were too deaf to catch a third part of them, brought smelling bottles and other means of stifling their noses. Still that dreadful, carnal-house sort of smell would make itself most painfully and most disagreeably apparent. And the Reverend Joseph Stillingport, who was the regular preacher, smelt it in the pulpit, and had been seen to sneeze in the midst of a most pious discourse indeed, and to hold to his pious nose a handkerchief, in which was some strong and pungent essence, for the purpose of trying to overcome the terrible effluvia. The organ-blower and the organ-player were both nearly stifled, for the horrible odour seemed to ascend to the upper part of the church, although those who sat in what may be called the pit by no means escaped it. The church wardens looked at each other in their pews, with contorted countenances, and were almost afraid to breathe, and the only person who did not complain bitterly of the dreadful odour in St. Dunstan's church was an old woman who had been a pew-opener for many years. But then she had lost the faculties of her nose, which, perhaps, accounted satisfactorily for that circumstance." At length, however, the nuisance became so intolerable that the beadle, whose duty it was in the morning to open the church doors, used to come up to them with the massive key in one hand and a cloth soaked in vinegar in the other, just as the people used to do in the time of the great plague of London, and when he had opened the doors he used to run over to the other side of the way. "'Ah, Mr. Blunt,' he used to say to the bookseller who lived opposite. "'Ah, Mr. Blunt.' I is obligated to cut over here, leastways, till the atmospheric air is mixed along with the stinkification which come from the church. By this it will be seen that the beadle was rather a learned man, and no doubt went to some mechanics institution of those days, where he learned something of everything, but what was calculated to be of some service to him. As might be supposed from the fact that this sort of thing had gone on for a few months, it began to excite some attention with a view to a remedy, for, in the great city of London, a nuisance of any sort of description requires to become venerable by age before any one thinks of removing it, and after that it is quite clear that that becomes a good argument against removing it at all. But at last the church wardens began to have a fear that some pestilential disease would be the result, if they for any longer period of time put up with the horrible stench, and that they might be among its first victims, so they began to ask each other what could be done to obviate it. Probably, if this frightful stench, being suggestive, as it was, of all sorts of horrors, had been graciously pleased to confine itself to some poor locality, nothing would have been heard of it. But when it became actually offensive to a gentleman in a metropolitan pulpit, and when it began to make itself perceptible to the sleepy faculties of the church wardens of St. Dunstan's Church, in Fleet Street, so as to prevent them from even dozing through the afternoon sermon, it became a very serious matter indeed. But what it was, what could it be, and what was to be done to get rid of it, these were the anxious questions that were asked right and left, as regarded the serious nuisance, without the nuisance acceding any reply but yet one thing seemed to be generally agreed, 
and that was that it did come and must come somehow or other out of the vaults from beneath the church but then as the pious and hypocritical mr batterwick who lived opposite said how could that be when it was satisfactorily proved by the present books that nobody had been buried in the vault for some time and therefore it was a very odd thing that dead people after leaving off smelling and being disagreeable should all of a sudden burst out again in that line and be twice as bad as ever they were at first and on wednesdays sometimes too when pious people were not satisfied with the sunday's devotion but began again in the middle of the week the stench was positively horrific indeed so bad was it that some of the congregation were forced to leave and have been seen to slink into bell yard where lovett's pie shop was situated and then and there relieve themselves with a pork or a veal pie in order that their mouths and noses should be full of a delightful and agreeable flavour instead of one most peculiarly and decidedly the reverse at last there was a confirmation to be held at st dunstan's church and so great a concourse of persons assembled for a sermon was to be preached by the bishop after the confirmation and a very great fuss indeed was to be made about really nobody knew what preparations as newspapers say upon an extensive scale and regardless of expense were made for the purpose of adding lustre to the ceremony and surprising the bishop when he came with a good idea that the authorities of st dunstan's church were somebody's and really worth confirming the confirmation was to take place at twelve o'clock and the bells ushered in the morning with their most pious tones for it was not every day that the authorities of st dunstan's succeeded in catching a bishop and when they did so they were determined to make the most of him and the numerous authorities including church wardens and even the very beadle were in an uncommon fluster and running about and impeding each other as authorities always do upon public occasions but of those who only look to the surface of things and those who come to admire what was grand and magnificent in the preparations the beadle certainly carried away the palm for that functionary was attired in a completely new cocked hat and coat and certainly looked very splendid and showy upon the occasion moreover the beadle had been well and judiciously selected and the parish authorities made no secret of it when there was an election for the beadle that they threw all their influence into the scale of that candidate who happened to be the biggest and consequently who was calculated to wear the official costume with an air that no smaller man could possibly have aspired to on any account at half-past eleven o'clock the bishop made his gracious appearance and was duly ushered into the vestry where there was a comfortable fire and on the table in which likewise were certain cold chickens and bottles of rare wines for confirming a number of people and preaching a sermon besides was considered no joke and might for all they knew be provocative of a great appetite in the bishop and with a bland and courtly air the bishop smiled as he ascended the steps of st dunstan's church how affable he was to the churchwardens and he actually smiled upon a poor miserable charity boy who his eyes glaring wide open and his muffin cap in his hand was taking his first stare at a real live bishop to be sure the beadle knocked him down directly the bishop had passed for having the presumption to look at such a great personage but then that was to be expected fully and completely and only proved that the proverb which permits a cat to look at a king is not equally applicable to charity boys and bishops when the bishop got to the vestry some very complimentary words were uttered to him by the usual officiating clergyman but somehow or another the bland smile had left the lips of the great personage and interrupting the vicar in the midst of a fine flowing period he said that's all very well but what a terrible stink there is here the churchwardens gave a groan for they had flattered themselves that perhaps the bishop would not notice the dreadful smell or that if he did he would think it was accidental and say nothing about it but now when he really did mention it they found all their hopes scattered to the winds and that it was necessary to say something is this horrid charnel-house sort of smell always here i am afraid it is said one of the churchwardens afraid said the bishop surely you know you seem to me to have a nose yes said the churchwarden in great confusion 
I have that honour, and I have the pleasure of informing you, my Lord Bishop, I mean, I have the honour of informing you, that this smell is always here. The bishop sniffed several times, and then he said, <laughs> oh, It is very dreadful, and I hope that by the next time I come to St. Dunstan's you will have the pleasure and the honour, both, of informing me that it has gone away. The churchwarden bowed, and got into an extreme corner, saying to himself, this is the bishop's last visit here, and I don't wonder at it, for as if out of pure spite, the smell is ten times worse than ever to-day. And so it was, for it seemed to come up through all the crevices of the flooring of the church with a power and perseverance that was positively dreadful. Isn't it dreadful? Did you ever know the smell in St. Dunstan's so bad before? And everybody agreed that they had never known it anything like so bad, for it was positively awful, and so indeed it was. The anxiety of the bishop to get away was quite manifest, and if he could decently have taken his departure without confirming anybody at all, there was no doubt but that he would have willingly done so, and left all the congregation to die and be something or another but this he could not do. But he could cut it short, and he did so. The people found themselves confirmed before they almost knew where they were, and the bishop would not go into the vestry again on any account, but hurried down the steps of the church and into his carriage, with the greatest precipitation in the world, thus proving that holiness is no proof against a most abominable stench. As may be well supposed, after this, the subject assumed a much more serious aspect, and on the following day a solemn meeting was held of all the church authorities, at which it was determined that men should be employed to make a thorough and searching examination of all the vaults of St. Dunstan's, with the view of discovering, if possible, from whence particularly the abominable stench emanated. And then it was decided that the stench was to be put down, and that the bishop was to be appraised it was put down, and that he might visit the church in perfect safety. End of chapter 19 Chapter Twenty of *The String of Pearls* by Unknown. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter Twenty: Sweeney Todd's Proceedings Consequent Upon the Departure of Tobias. We left the barber in his own shop, much wondering that Tobias had not responded to the call which he had made upon him, but yet scarcely believing it possible that he could have ventured upon the height of iniquity which we know Tobias had really been guilty of. He paused for a few moments, and held up the light which he had procured, and gazed around him with inquiring eyes, for he could, indeed, scarcely believe it possible that Tobias had sufficiently cast off his dread of him, Sweeney Todd, to be enabled to achieve any act for his liberation. But when he saw that the lock of the parlour door was open, positive rage obtained precedence over every other feeling. "'The villain!' he cried. Has he dared, really, to consummate an act I thought he could not have dreamt of for a moment? Is it possible that he can have presumed so far as to have searched the house? That Tobias, however, had presumed so far, the barber soon discovered, and when he went into his parlour and saw what had actually occurred, and that likewise the door which led to the staircase and the upper part of the house had not escaped, he got perfectly furious and it was some time before he could sufficiently calm himself to reflect upon the probable and possible amount of danger he might run in consequence of these proceedings. When he did, his active mind at once told him that there was not much to be dreaded immediately, for that, most probably, Tobias, still having the fear before his eyes of what he might do as regarded his mother, had actually run away, and— "'In all likelihood,' muttered the barber, he has taken with him something which would allow me to fix upon him the stigma of robbery. But that I must see to. Having fastened the shop door securely, he took the light in his hands and ascended to the upper part of his house, that is to say, to the first floor, where alone anything was to be found. He saw at once the open bureau, with all its glittering display of jewels, and as he gazed upon the heap he muttered, I have not so accurate a knowledge of what is here. 
as to be able to say if anything be extracted or not. But I know the amount of money, if I do not know the precise number of jewels which this bureau contains. He opened a small drawer, which had entirely evaded the scrutiny of Tobias, and proceeded to count a large number of guineas which were there. These are correct, he said, when he had finished his examination. These are correct, and he has touched none of them. He then opened another drawer, in which were a great many packets of silver done up in paper, and these likewise he carefully counted, and was satisfied they were right. It is strange, he said, that he has taken nothing. But yet perhaps it is better that it should be so, inasmuch as it shows a wholesome fear of me. The slightest examination would have shown him these hordes of money, and since he has not made that slight examination, nor discovered any of them, it seems to my mind decisive upon the subject that he has taken nothing, and perchance I shall discover him easier than I imagine. He repaired to the parlour again, and carefully divested himself of everything which had enabled him so successfully to impose upon John Mundell, and replaced them by his ordinary costume, after which he fastened up his house and sallied forth, taking his way directly to Mrs. Wragg's humble home, in the expectation that there he would hear something of Tobias, which would give him a clue where to search for him, for to search for him he fully intended. But what were his precise intentions perhaps he could hardly have told himself, until he actually found him. When he reached Mrs. Wragg's house, and made his appearance abruptly before that lady, who seemed somehow or another always to be ironing, and always to drop the iron when any one came in very near their toes, he said, "'Where did your son Tobias go after he left you to-night?' "'Law, Mr. Todd, is it you? You are as good as a conjurer, sir, for he was here. But bless you, sir, I no more know where he is gone to than the man in the moon. He said he was going to see, but I am sure I should not have thought it that I should not.' "'To see?' then the probability is that he would go down to the docks. But surely not to-night. Do you not expect him back here to sleep? Well, sir, that's a very good thought of yours, and he may come back here to sleep, for all I know to the contrary. But you do not know it for a fact. He didn't say so, but he may come, you know, sir, for all that. Did he tell you his reason for leaving me? Indeed, no, sir, he really did not, and he seemed to me to be a little bit out of his senses. "'Ah, Mrs. Wragg," said Sweeney Todd. "'There you have it. "'From the first moment that he came into my service, "'I knew and felt confident that he was out of his senses. "'There was a strangeness of behaviour about him, "'which soon convinced me of that fact, "'and I am only anxious about him, "'in order that some effort may be made to cure him of such a malady, "'for it is a serious and a dreadful one, "'and one which, unless taken in time, will yet be the death of Tobias. These words were spoken with such solemn seriousness that they had a wonderful effect upon Mrs. Wragg, who, like most ignorant persons, began immediately to confirm that which she most dreaded. Oh, it's too true, she said. It's too true. He did say some extraordinary things tonight, Mr. Todd, and he said he had something to tell which was too horrid to speak of. Now, the idea, you know, Mr. Todd, of anybody having anything at all to tell, and not telling it at once, is quite singular. It is, and I am sure that his conduct is such as you would never be guilty of, Mrs. Wragg. But hark, what's that? It's a knock, Mr. Todd. Hush, stop a moment. What if it be Tobias? Goodness gracious, it can't be him, for he would have come in at once. No, I slipped the bolt of the door because I wish to talk to you without observation. So it may be Tobias, you perceive, after all. But let me hide somewhere, so that I may hear what he says, and be able to judge how his mind is affected. I will not hesitate to do something for him, let it cost me what it may. There's the cupboard, Mr. Todd. To be sure, there is some dirty saucepans and a frying pan in it, and of course it ain't a fit place to ask you to go into. Never mind that, never mind that, only you be careful for the sake of Tobias's very life, to keep secret that I am here. The knocking at the door increased each moment in vehemence, and just as Sweeney Todd had succeeded in getting into the cupboard along with Mrs. Wragg's pots and pans, and thoroughly concealing himself, she opened the door, and, sure enough, Tobias, heated, tired, 
and looking ghastly pale staggered into the room mother he said i have taken a new thought and have come back to you well i thought you would tobias and a very good thing it is that you have listen to me i thought of flying from england for ever and of never setting foot upon its shores but i have altered that determination completely and i feel now that it is my duty to do something else to do what tobias to tell all i know to make a clean breast mother and let the consequences be what they may to let george just take its course what do you mean tobias mother i have come to a conclusion what i have to tell is of such vast importance compared with any consequences that might arrive from the petty robbery of the candlestick which you know of that i ought not to hesitate a moment in revealing everything but my dear tobias remember that is a dreadful secret and one that must be kept it cannot matter it cannot matter and besides it is more than probable that by revealing what i actually know which is of such great magnitude i may mother in a manner of speaking perchance completely exonerate you from the consequences of that transaction besides it was so long ago and the prosecutor may have mercy but be that how it may and be the consequences what they may i must and will tell what i now know but what is it tobias that you know something too dreadful for me to utter to you alone go into the temple mother to some of the gentlemen whose chambers you attend to and ask them to come to me and listen to what i have got to say they will be amply repaid for their trouble for they will hear that which may perhaps save their own lives he is quite gone thought mrs Ragg and mr todd is correct poor tobias is as mad as he can be alas alas tobias why don't you try to reason yourself into a better state of mind you don't know a bit what you are saying any more than the man in the moon <sighs> i know i am half mad mother but yet i know what i am saying well so do not fancy that it is not to be relied upon but go and fetch someone at once to listen to what i have to relate perhaps thought mrs Ragg, if i were to pretend to humour him it would be as well and while i am gone mr todd can speak to him it was a bright idea of mrs Ragg's, and she forthwith proceeded to carry it into execution saying well my dear if it must be it must be and i will go but i hope while i have gone somebody will speak to you and convince you that you ought to try to quiet yourself these words mrs Ragg uttered aloud for the special benefit of sweeney todd who she considered would have been there to take the hint accordingly it is needless to say he did hear them and how far he profited by them we shall quickly perceive as for poor tobias he had not the remotest idea of the close proximity of his arch-enemy if he had he would quickly have left that spot where he ought well to conjecture so much danger awaited him for although Sweeney Todd, under the circumstances probably felt, that he dare not take Tobias's life, still he might exchange something that could place it in his power to do so shortly, without the least personal danger to himself. The door closed after the retreating form of Mrs. Ragg, and as considering the mission she was gone upon, it was very clear some minutes must elapse before she could return, Sweeney Todd did not feel there was any particular hurry in the transaction what shall i do he said to himself shall i await his mother's coming again and get her to aid me or shall i of myself adopt some means which will put an end to trouble on this boy's account sweeney todd was a man tolerably rapid in thought and he contrived to make up his mind that the best plan unquestionably would be to lay hold on poor tobias at once and so prevent the possibility of any appeal to his mother becoming effective Tobias, when his mother left the place, as he imagined, for the purpose of procuring someone to listen to what he considered to be Sweeney Todd's delinquencies, rested his face upon his hands, and gave himself up to painful and deep thought. He felt that he had arrived at quite a crisis in his history, and that the next hours cannot but surely be very important to him in their results, and so they were indeed, but not certainly exactly in the way that he had all along anticipated for he thought of nothing but of the arrest and discomfiture of todd little expecting how close was his proximity to that formidable personage surely 
thought tobias i shall by disclosing all that i know about todd gain some consideration for my mother and after all she may not be prosecuted for the robbery of the candlestick how very trifling is that affair compared to the much more dreadful things which i more than suspect sweeney todd to be guilty of he is and must be from all that i have seen and heard a murderer though how he disposes of his victims is involved in the most complete mystery and is to me a matter past all human power of comprehension i have no idea even upon what subjects whatever this indeed was a great mystery for even admitting that sweeney todd was a murderer and it must be allowed that as yet we have only circumstantial evidence of that fact we can form no conclusion from such evidence as to how he perpetrated the deed or how afterwards he disposed of the body of his victim this great and principal difficulty in the way of committing murder with impunity namely the disposal of a corpse certainly did not seem at all to have any effect on sweeney todd for if he made corpses he had some means of getting rid of them with the most wonderful expedition as well as secrecy he is a murderer thought tobias i know he is although i have never seen him do the deed or seen any appearance in the shop of a deed of blood having been committed yet why is it that occasionally when a better dressed person than usual comes into the shop he sends me out on some errand to a distant part of the town tobias did not forget too that on more than one occasion he had come back quicker doubtless than he had been expected and that he had caught sweeney todd in some little confusion and seen the hat the stick or perhaps the umbrella of the last customer quietly waiting there although the customer had gone and even if the glaring improbability of a man leaving his hat behind him in a barber's shop was got over why did he not come back for it this was a circumstance which was entitled to all the weight which tobias during his mental cogitation could give to it and there could be but one possible explanation of a man not coming back for his hat and that was that he had not the power to do so his house will be searched thought tobias and all those things which must of course have belonged to so many different people will be found and then they will be identified and he will be required to say how he came by them which i think will be a difficult task indeed for sweeney todd to accomplish what a relief it will be to me to be sure when he is hanged as i think he is tolerably sure to be what a relief muttered sweeney todd as he slowly opened the cupboard door unseen by tobias what a relief it will be to me when this boy is in his grave as he really will be soon or else i have forgotten all my moral learning and turned chicken-hearted neither of them very likely circumstances End of chapter 20chapter twenty one of the string of pearls by unknown this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org chapter twenty one the misadventure of tobias the madhouse on peckham rye sweeney todd paused for a moment at the cupboard door before he made up his mind as to whether he should pounce on poor tobias at once or adopt a more creeping cautious mode of operation the latter course was by far the more congenial to him and so he adopted it in another moment or so and stole quietly from his place of concealment and with so little noise that tobias could not have the least suspicion any one was in the room but himself treading as if each step might involve some fearful consequences he thus at length got completely behind the chair on which tobias was sitting and stood with folded arms and such a hideous smile upon his face that they together formed no inept representation of the mistopheles of the german drama i shall at length murmured tobias be free from my present dreadful state of mind by thus accusing todd he is a murderer of that i have no doubt it is but a duty of mine to stand forward as his accuser sweeney todd stretched out his two brawny hands and clutched tobias by the head which he turned round till the boy could see him and then he said indeed tobias and did it never strike you that todd was not so easily to be overcome as you would wish him eh tobias 
the shock of this astonishing and sudden appearance of sweeney todd was so great that for a few moments tobias was deprived of all power of speech or action and with his head so strangely twisted as to seem to threaten the destruction of his neck he glared in the triumphant and malignant countenance of his persecutor as he would into that of the arch-enemy of all mankind which probably he now began to think the barber really was if aught more than another was calculated to delight such a man as todd it certainly was to perceive what a dreadful effect his presence had upon tobias who remained about a minute and a half in this state before he ventured upon uttering a shriek which however when it did come almost frightened todd himself it was one of those cries which can only come from a heart in its utmost agony a cry which might have heralded the spirit to another world and proclaimed as it very nearly did the destruction of the intellect for ever the barber staggered back a pace or two as he heard it for it was too terrific even for him but it was for a very brief period that it had that stunning effect upon him and then with a full consciousness of the danger to which it subjected him he sprang upon poor tobias as a tiger might be supposed to do upon a lamb and clutched him by the throat exclaiming such another cry and it is the last you ever live to utter although it cover me with difficulties to escape the charge of killing you peace i say peace this exhortation was quite needless for tobias could not have uttered a word had he been ever so much inclined to do so the barber held his throat with such an iron clutch as if it had been in a vice villain growled todd villain so this is the way in which you have dared to disregard my injunctions but no matter no matter you shall have plenty of leisure to reflect upon what you have done for yourself fool to think that you could cope with me sweeney todd <laughs> he burst into a laugh so much more hideous more than his ordinary efforts in that way that had tobias heard it which he did not for his head had dropped upon his breast and he had become insensible it would have terrified him almost as much as sweeney todd's sudden appearance had done so muttered the barber he has fainted has he dull child that is all the better for once in a way tobias i will carry you not to oblige you but to oblige myself by all that's damnable it was a lively thought that brought me here to-night or else i might by the dawn of the morning have had some very troublesome inquiries made of me he took tobias up as easily as if he had been an infant and strode from the chambers with him leaving mrs Wragg to draw whatever inference she chose from his absence but feeling convinced that she was too much under his control to take any steps of a nature to give him the smallest amount of uneasiness the woman he muttered to himself is a double distilled ass and can be made to believe anything so that i have no fear whatever of her i dare not kill tobias because it is necessary in case of the matter being at any other period mentioned that his mother shall be in a position to swear that she saw him after this night alive and well the barber strode through the temple carrying the boy who seemed not at all in a hurry to recover from the nervous and partial state of suffocation into which he had fallen as they passed through the gate opening into fleet street the porter who knew the barber well by sight said hello mr todd is that you why who are you carrying yes it's i said todd and i am carrying my apprentice boy tobias rag poor fellow poor fellow why what's the matter with him i can hardly tell you but he seems to me and to his mother to have gone out of his senses good night to you good night i am looking for a coach good night mr todd i don't think you'll get one nearer than the market what a kind thing now of him to carry the boy it ain't every master would do that but we must not judge of people by their looks and even sweeney todd though he has a face that one would not like to meet in a lonely place on a dark night may be a kind-hearted person sweeney todd walked rapidly down fleet street towards old fleet market which was then in all its glory if that could be called glory which consisted in all sorts of filth enough to produce a pestilence within the city of london when there he addressed a large bundle of great coats 
in the middle of which was supposed to be a hackney coachman of the regular old school and who was lounging over his vehicle which was as long and lumbering as a city barge jarvey he said what will you take me to peckham rye for peckham rye you and the boy there ain't any more you waitin round the corner are there cause you know that won't be fair no 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 well don't be in a passion master i only asked as you know so you need not be put out about it i will take you for twelve shillings and that's what i call remarkable cheap all things considered i'll give you half the amount said sweeney todd and you may consider yourself well paid half master that is cutting it low but howsoever i suppose i must put up with it and take you get in i must try and make it up by some better fare out of somebody else the barber paid no heed to these renewed remonstrances of the coachman but got into the vehicle carrying tobias with him apparently with great care and consideration but when the coach door closed and no one was observing him he flung him down among the straw that was at the bottom of the vehicle and resting his immense feet upon him he gave one of his disagreeable laughs as he said well i think i have you now master tobias your troubles will soon be over i am really very much afraid that you will die suddenly and then there will be an end of you altogether which will be a very sad thing although i don't think i shall go into mourning because i have an opinion that that only keeps alive the bitterness of regret, and that it's a great deal better done without, Master Tobias. The hackney coach swung about from side to side in the proper approved manner of hackney coaches in the olden times, when they used to be called bone shakers, and to be thought wonderful if they made a progress of three miles and a half an hour. This was the sort of vehicle, then, in which poor Tobias, still perfectly insensible, was rumbling over Blackfriars Bridge, and so on towards Peckham Rye, and any one acquainted with that locality is well aware that there are two roads, one to the left and the other to the right, both of which are pleasantly enough studded with villa residences. Sweeney Todd directed the coachman to take the road to the left, which he accordingly did, and they pursued it for a distance of about a mile and a half. It must not be supposed that this pleasant district of country was then in the state it is now, as regards inhabitants or cultivation. On the contrary, it was rather a wild spot, on which now and then a serious robbery had been committed, and which had witnessed some of the exploits of those highwaymen, whose adventures, in the present day, if one may judge from the public patronage they may receive, are viewed with a great amount of interest." There was a lonely, large, rambling, old-looking house by the wayside, on the left. A high wall surrounded it, which only allowed the topmost portion of it to be visible, and that presented great symptoms of decay, in the dilapidated character of the chimney-pots, and the general appearance of discomfort which pervaded it. Then Sweeney Todd directed the coachman to stop, and when the vehicle, after swinging to and fro for several minutes, did indeed at last resolve itself into a state of repose, Sweeney Todd got out himself and rang a bell, the handle of which hung invitingly at the gate. He had to wait several minutes before an answer was given to this summons, but at length a noise proceeded from within, as if several bars and bolts were being withdrawn, and presently the door was opened, and a huge, rough-looking man made his appearance on the threshold. "'Well, what is it now?' he cried. I have a patient for Mr. Fogg, said Sweeney Todd. I want to see him immediately. Oh, well, the more the merrier. It don't matter to me a bit. Have you got him with you, and is he tolerably quiet? It's a mere boy, and he is not violently mad, but very decidedly so as regards what he says. Oh, that's it, is it? He can say what he likes here. It can make no difference in the world to us. Bring him in. Mr. Fogg is in his own room. I know the way. You take charge of the lad, and I will go and speak to Mr. Fogg about him. But stay. Give the coachman these six shillings, and discharge him. The doorkeeper of the lunatic asylum, for such it was, went out to obey the injunctions of Sweeney Todd, 
while that rascally individual himself walked along a wide passage to a door which was at the further extremity of it. End of chapter 21「Chapter twenty two of the String of Pearls by Unknown. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter twenty two The Madhouse Cell. When the porter of the madhouse went out to the coach, his first impression was that the boy, who was said to be insane, was dead for not even the jolting ride to Peckham had been sufficient to arouse him to a consciousness of how he was situated, and there he lay still at the bottom of the coach alike insensible to joy or sorrow. "'Is he dead?' said the man to the coachman. "'How should I know?' was the reply. "'He may be, or he may not, but I want to know how long I am to wait here for my fare.' "'There is your money. Be off with you.' I can see now that the boy is all right, for he breathes, though it's after an odd fashion that he does so. I should rather think he has had a knock on the head or something of that kind. As he spoke, he conveyed Tobias within the building, and the coachman, since he had no further interest in the matter, drove away at once, and paid no more attention to it whatever. When Sweeney Todd reached the door at the end of the passage, he tapped at it with his knuckles, and a voice cried, Who knocks? Who knocks? Curses on you all! Who knocks? Sweeney Todd did not make any verbal reply to this polite request, but opening the door he walked into the apartment, which is one that really deserves some description. It was a large room with a vaulted roof, and in the centre was a superior oaken table, at which sat a man considerably advanced in years, as was proclaimed by his grizzled locks that graced the sides of his head but whose Herculean frame and robust constitution had otherwise successfully resisted the assaults of time. A lamp swung from the ceiling, which had a shade over the top of it, so that it kept a tolerably bright glow upon the table below, which was covered with books and papers, as well as glasses and bottles of different kinds, which showed that the madhouse keeper was, at all events, as far as he himself was concerned, not at all indifferent to personal comfort." The walls, however, presented the most curious aspect, for they were hung with a variety of tools and implements, which would have puzzled any one not initiated into the matter even to guess at their nature. These were, however, in point of fact, specimens of the different kinds of machinery which were used for the purpose of coercing the unhappy persons whose evil destiny made them members of that establishment. Those were what is called the good old times, when all sorts of abuses flourished in perfection, and when the unhappy insane were actually punished, as if they were guilty of some great offence. Yes, and worse than that were they punished. For a criminal who might have injustice done to him by any one who were in authority over him could complain, and if he got hold of a person of higher power, his complaints might be listened to. But no one heeded what was said by the poor maniac, whose bitterest accusations of his keepers, let their conduct have been to him what it might, was only listened to and set down as a further proof of his mental disorder. This was indeed a most awful and sad state of things, and, to the disgrace of this country, it was a social evil allowed until very late years to continue in full force. Mr. Fogg, the madhouse keeper, fixed his keen eyes, from beneath his shaggy brows, upon Sweeney Todd, as the latter entered his apartment, and then he said, Mr. Todd, I think, unless my memory deceives me. The same, said the barber, making a hideous face. I believe I am not easily forgotten. True, said Mr. Fogg, as he reached for a book, the edges of which were cut into a lot of tiny slips, on each of which was a capital letter, in the order of the alphabet. True, you are not easily forgotten, Mr. Todd. He then opened the book at the letter T, and read from it. Mr. Sweeney Todd, Fleet Street, London, paid one year's keep and burial of Thomas Simpkins, aged thirteen, found dead in his bed after a residence in the asylum of fourteen months and four days. I think, Mr. Todd, that was our last little transaction. What can I do for you now, sir? I am rather unfortunate, said Todd, with my boys. I have got another here who has shown such decided symptoms of insanity 
that it has become absolutely necessary to place him under your care. Indeed. Does he rave? Why, yes, he does. And it's the most absurd nonsense in the world he raves about. For, to hear him, one would really think that, instead of being one of the most humane of men, I was in point of fact an absolute murderer. A murderer, Mr. Todd? Yes, a murderer. A murderer to all intents and purposes. Could anything be more absurd than such an accusation? I, that have the milk of human kindness flowing in every vein, and whose very appearance ought to be sufficient to convince anybody at once of my kindness of disposition. Sweeney Todd finished his speech by making such a hideous face that the madhouse keeper could not for the life of him tell what to say to it, and then there came one of those short, disagreeable laughs which Todd was such an adept in, and which, somehow or another, never appeared exactly to come from his mouth, but always made people look up at the walls and ceiling of the apartment in which they were, in great doubt as to whence the remarkable sound came. "'For how long?' said the madhouse keeper. "'Do you think this malady will continue?' "'I will pay,' said Sweeney Todd, as he leaned over the table and looked into the face of his questioner. "'I will pay for twelve months. But I don't think, between you and I, that the case will last anything like so long. I think he will die suddenly.' "'I shouldn't wonder if he did.' Some of our patients do die very suddenly, and somehow or another we never know exactly how it happens. But it must be some sort of fit, for they are found dead in the morning in their beds, and then we bury them privately and quietly, without troubling anybody about it at all, which is decidedly the best way, because it saves a great annoyance to friends and relations, as well as prevents any extra expenses which otherwise might be foolishly gone to. You are wonderfully correct and considerate, said Todd and it's no more than what I expected from you, or what anybody might expect from a person of your great experience, knowledge, and acquirements. I must confess I am quite delighted to hear you talk in so elevated a strain. Why? said Mr. Fogg, with a strange leer upon his face. We are forced to make ourselves useful, like the rest of the community, and we could not expect people to send their mad friends and relatives here unless we took good care that their ends and views were answered by doing so. We make no remarks and we ask no questions. Those are the principles upon which we have conducted business so successfully and so long. Those are the principles upon which we shall continue to conduct it, and to merit, we hope, the patronage of the British public. Unquestionably, most unquestionably. You may as well introduce me to your patient at once, Mr. Todd. For I suppose, by this time, he has been brought into the house. Certainly, certainly. I shall have great pleasure in showing him to you. The madhouse keeper rose, and so did Mr. Todd, and the former, pointing to the bottles and glasses on the table, said, When this business is settled, we can have a friendly glass together. To this proposition Sweeney Todd assented with a nod, and then they both proceeded to what was called a reception room in the asylum, and where poor Tobias had been conveyed and laid upon a table, where he showed slight symptoms of recovering from the state of insensibility into which he had fallen, and a man was sluicing water on his face by the assistance of a hearth-broom, occasionally dipped into a pailful of that fluid. "'Quite young,' said the madhouse keeper, as he looked upon the pale and interesting face of Tobias. "'Yes,' said Sweeney Todd. "'He is young, more's the pity.' And, of course, we deeply regret his present situation. Oh, of course, of course. But see, he opens his eyes and will speak directly. Rave, you mean, rave, said Todd. Don't call it speaking. It is not entitled to the name. Hush, listen to him. Where am I? said Tobias. Where am I? Todd is a murderer. I denounce him. You hear? You hear? said Todd. "'Mad indeed,' said the keeper. "'Oh, save me from him, save me from him,' said Tobias, fixing his eyes upon Mr. Fogg. "'Save me from him. It is my life he seeks, because I know his secrets. He is a murderer. Many a person comes into his shop, never leaves it again in life, if at all.' "'You hear him?' said Todd. "'Was there anybody so mad?' "'Desperately mad,' said the keeper.' Come, come, young fellow, 
We shall be under the necessity of putting you in a straight waistcoat if you go on in that way. We must do it, for there is no hope in such cases if we don't. Todd slunk back into the darkness of the apartment, so that he was not seen, and Tobias continued, in an imploring tone. I do not know who you are, sir, or where I am, but let me beg of you to cause the house of Sweeney Todd, the barber in Fleet Street, near St. Dustin's Church, to be searched, and there you will find that he is a murderer. There are at least a hundred hats, quantities of um, walking sticks, umbrellas, watches and rings, all belonging to unfortunate persons who, time to time, have met with their deaths through him. How uncommonly mad, said Fogg. No, no, said Tobias. I am not mad. Why call me mad when the truth or falsehood of what I can say can be ascertained so easily? Search his house, and if those things be not found there, say that I am mad, and have dr but dreamed of them. I do not know how he kills the people. That is a great mystery to me yet. But that he does kill them, I have no doubt. I cannot have a doubt. Watson? cried the madhouse keeper. Hello, here, Watson. I am here, sir, said the man, who had been dashing water upon poor Tobias's face. You will take this lad, Watson, as he seems extremely feverish and unsettled. You will take him and shave his head, Watson, and put a straight waistcoat upon him, and let him be put in one of the dark, damp cells. We must be careful of him, and too much light encourages delirium and fever. Oh, no, no! cried Tobias. What have I done that I should be subjected to such cruel treatment? What have I done that I should be placed in a cell? If this be a madhouse, I am not mad. Oh, have mercy upon me, have mercy upon me. You will give him nothing but bread and water, Watson. And the first symptoms of his recovery, which will produce better treatment, will be his exonerating his master from what he has said about him for he must be mad so long as he continues to accuse such a gentleman as Mr. Todd of such things. Nobody but a madman or a mad boy would think of it. Then, said Tobias, I shall continue mad, for it be madness to know and to aver that Sweeney Todd, the barber of Fleet Street, is a murderer. Mad am I, for I know it, aver it. It is true, it is true. Take him away, Watson, and do as I desired you. I begin to find that the boy is a very dangerous character, and more viciously mad than anybody we have had here for a considerable time. The man named Watson seized upon Tobias, who again uttered a shriek, something similar to the one which had come from his lips when Sweeney Todd clutched hold of him in his mother's room. But they were used to such things at that madhouse, and cared little for them, so no one heeded the cry in the least but poor Tobias was carried to the door half maddened in reality by the horrors that surrounded him. Just as he was being conveyed out, Sweeney Todd stepped up to him, and putting his mouth close to his ear, he whispered, <laughs> Tobias, how do you feel now? Do you think Sweeney Todd will be hung, or will you die in the cell of a madhouse? End of chapter 22 Chapter 23 of The String of Pearls by Unknown. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 23 The New Cook of Mrs. Lovett Gets Tired of His Situation. From what we have already had occasion to record about Mrs. Lovett's new cook, who ate so voraciously in the cellar, our readers will no doubt be induced to believe that he was a gentleman likely enough soon to tire of his situation. To a starving man, and one who seemed completely abandoned even by hope, Lovett's bakehouse, with an unlimited leave to eat as much as possible, must of course present itself in the most desirable and lively colours, and no wonder, therefore, that banishing all scruple, a man so pleased, would take the situation with very little inquiry. But people will tire of good things, and it is a remarkably well-authenticated fact that human nature is prone to be discontented. And those persons who are well acquainted with the human mind, and who know well how little value people soon set upon things which they possess, while those which they are pursuing, 
and which seem to be beyond their reach, assume the liveliest colors imaginable, adopt various means of turning this to account. Napoleon took good care that the meanest of his soldiers should see in perspective the possibility of grasping a marshal's baton. Confectioners at the present day, when they take a new apprentice, tell him to eat as much as he likes of those tempting tarts and sweetmeats, one or two of which before had been a most delicious treat. The soldier goes on fighting away and never gets the marshal's baton. The confectioner's boy crams himself with Banbury cakes, gets dreadfully sick, and never touches one afterwards. And now, to revert to our friend in Mrs. Lovett's bakehouse. At first everything was delightful, and, by the aid of the machinery, he found that it was no difficult matter to keep up the supply of pies by really a very small amount of manual labor. And that labor was such a labor of love, for the pies were delicious. There could be no mistake about that. He tasted them half-cooked, he tasted them wholly cooked, and he tasted them overdone, hot and cold, pork and veal with seasoning, and without seasoning, until at last he had had them in every possible way and shape, and when the fourth day came after his arrival in the cellar, he might have been seen sitting in a rather contemplative attitude with a pie before him. It was twelve o'clock. He heard that sound come from the shop. Yes, it was twelve o'clock, and he had eaten nothing yet, but he kept his eyes fixed upon the pie that lay untouched before him. The pies are all very well, he said. In fact, of course, they are capital pies, and now that I know how they are made and that there is nothing wrong in them, I, of course, relish them more than ever. One cannot live always upon pies. It is quite impossible. One can subsist upon pies from one end of the year to the other. If they were the finest pies the world ever saw or ever will see, I don't say anything against the pies. I know they are made of the finest flour, the best possible butter, and that meat which comes from God knows where is the most delicate-looking and tender I ever ate in my life. He stretched out his hand and broke a small portion of the crust from the pie that was before him, and he tried to eat it. He certainly did succeed, but it was a great effort, and when he had done, he shook his head, saying, No, no, damn it, I cannot eat it, and that's the fact. One cannot be continually eating pie. It is out of the question, quite out of the question, and all I have to remark is damn the pies. I really don't think I shall be able to let another one pass my lips. He rose and paced with rapid strides the place in which he was, and then suddenly he heard a noise, and, looking up, he saw a trap-door in the roof open, and a sack of flour begin gradually to come down. Helloa! Helloa! he cried. Mrs. Lovett! Mrs. Lovett! Down came the flower, and the trap-door was closed. Oh, I can't stand this sort of thing, he exclaimed. I cannot be made into a mere machine for the manufacture of pies. I cannot and will not endure it. It is past all bearing. For the first time almost since his incarceration, for such it really was, he began to think that he would take an accurate survey of the place where this tempting manufacture was carried on. The fact was, his mind had been so intensively occupied during the time he had been there in providing merely for his physical wants that he had scarcely had time to think or reason upon the probabilities of an uncomfortable termination of his career. But now, when he had become quite surfeited with the pies, and tired of the darkness and gloom of the place, many unknown fears began to creep across him, and he really trembled, as he asked himself what was to be the end of all. It was with such a feeling as this that he now set about taking a careful and accurate survey of the place, and, taking a little lamp in his hand, he resolved to peer into every corner of it, with a hope that surely he should find some means by which he should effect an escape from what otherwise threatened to be an intolerable imprisonment. The vault, in which the ovens were situated, was the largest, and although a number of smaller ones communicated with it, containing the different mechanical contrivances for the pie-making, he could not from any one of them discover an outlet. But it was to the vault where the meat was deposited upon stone shelves that he paid the greatest share of attention, for to that vault he felt convinced there must be some hidden and secret means of ingress, and therefore of egress likewise, or else how came the shelves always so well stocked with meat as they were? 
this vault was larger than any of the other subsidiary ones and the roof was very high and come into it when he would it always happened that he found meat enough upon the shelves cut into large lumps and sometimes into slices to make a batch of pies with when it got there was not so much a mystery to him as how it got there for of course as he must sleep sometimes he concluded naturally enough that it was brought in by some means during the period that he devoted to repose he stood in the centre of this vault with the lamp in his hand and he turned slowly round surveying the walls and the ceiling with the most critical and marked attention but not the smallest appearance of an outlet was observable in fact the walls were so entirely filled up with the stone shelves that there was no space left for a door and as for the ceiling it seemed to be perfectly entire then the floor was of earth so that the idea of a trap-door opening in it was out of the question because there was no one on his side of it to place the earth again over it and give it its compact and usual appearance this is most mysterious he said and if ever i could have been brought to believe that any one had the assistance of the devil himself in conducting human affairs i would say that by some means mrs lovett had made it worth the while of that elderly individual to assist her for unless the meat gets here by some supernatural agency i really cannot see how it can get here at all and yet here it is so fresh and pure and white-looking although i never could tell the pork from the veal myself for they seem to me both alike he now made a still narrower examination of this vault but he gained nothing by that he found that the walls at the backs of the shelves were composed of flat pieces of stone which no doubt were necessary for the support of the shelves themselves but beyond that he made no further discovery and he was about leaving the place when he fancied he saw some writing on the inner side of the door a closer inspection convinced him that there were a number of lines written with lead pencil and after some difficulty he deciphered them as follows whatever unhappy wretch reads these lines may bid adieu to the world and all hope for he is a doomed man he will never emerge from these vaults with life for there is a hideous secret connected with them so awful and so hideous that to write it makes one's blood curdle and the flesh to creep upon my bones that secret is this and you may be assured whoever is reading these lines that i write the truth and that it is impossible to make that awful truth worse by any exaggeration as it would be by a candle at midday to attempt to add lustre to the sunbeams here most unfortunately the writing broke off and our friend who up to this point had perused the lines with the most intense interest felt great bitterness of disappointment from the fact that enough should have been written to stimulate his curiosity to the highest possible point but not enough to gratify it this is indeed most provoking he exclaimed what can this most dreadful secret be which it is impossible to exaggerate i cannot for a moment divine what it can elude in vain he searched over the door for some more writing there was none to be found and from the long straggling pencil mark which followed the last word it seemed as if he who had been then writing had been interrupted and possibly met the fate that he had predicted and was about to explain the reason of this is worse than no information i had better remained in ignorance than to have so indistinct a warning but they shall not find me an easy victim and besides what power on earth can force me to make pies unless i like i should wish to know as he stepped out of the place in which the meat was kept into the large vault where the ovens were he trod upon a piece of paper that was lying upon the ground and which he was quite certain he had not observed before it was fresh and white and clean too so that it could not have been long there and he picked it up with some curiosity that curiosity was however soon turned to dismay when he saw what was written upon it which was to the following effect and well calculated to produce a considerable amount of alarm in the breast of any one situated as he was so entirely friendless and so entirely hopeless of any extraneous aid in those dismal vaults which he began with a shudder to suspect would be his tomb you are getting dissatisfied and therefore it becomes necessary to explain to you your real position which is simply this you are a prisoner and were such from the first moment that you set foot where you now are and you will find that unless you are resolved upon sacrificing your life 
your best plan will be to quietly give in to the circumstances in which you find yourself placed without going into any argument or details upon the subject it is sufficient to inform you that so long as you continue to make the pies you will be safe but if you refuse then the first time you are caught sleeping your throat will be cut this document was so much to the purpose and really had so little of verbosity about it that it was extremely difficult to doubt its sincerity it dropped from the half-paralyzed hands of that man who in the depth of his distress and urged on by great necessity had accepted a situation that he would have given worlds to escape from had he been possessed of them gracious heavens he exclaimed am i then indeed condemned to such a slavery is it possible that even in the very heart of london i am a prisoner and without means of resisting the most frightful threats that are uttered against me surely surely this must all be a dream it is too terrific to be true he sat down upon that low stool where his predecessor had sat before receiving his death wound from the assassin who had glided in behind him and dealt him that terrific crashing blow whose only mercy was that it at once deprived the victim of existence he could have wept bitterly wept as he sat there for he thought over days long passed away of opportunities let go by with the heedless laugh of youth he thought over all the chances and misfortunes of his life and now to find himself the miserable inhabitant of a cellar condemned to a mean and troublesome employment without even the liberty of leaving that to starve if he chose upon pain of death a frightful death which had been threatened him was indeed torment no wonder that at times he felt himself unnerved and that a child might have conquered him while at other moments such a feeling of despair would come across him that he called aloud to his enemies to make their appearance and give him at least the chance of a struggle for his life if i am to die he cried let me die with some weapon in my hand as a brave man ought and i will not complain for there is little in life now which should induce me to cling to it but i will not be murdered in the dark he sprang to his feet and running up to the door which opened from the house into the vaults he made a violent and desperate effort to shake it but such a contingency as this had surely been looked forward to and provided against for the door was of amazing strength and most effectually resisted all his efforts so that the result of his endeavours was but to exhaust himself and he staggered back panting and despairing to the seat he had so recently left then he heard a voice and upon looking up he saw that the small square opening in the upper part of the door through which he had been before addressed was open and a face there appeared but it was not the face of mrs lovett on the contrary it was a large and hideous male physiognomy and the voice that came from it was croaking and harsh sounding most unmusically upon the ears of the unfortunate man who was then made a victim to mrs lovett's pie's popularity continue at your work said the voice or death will be your portion as soon as sleep overcomes you and you sink exhausted to that repose which you will never awaken from except to feel the pangs of death and to be conscious that you are weltering in your blood continue at your work and you will escape all this neglect it and your doom is sealed what have i done that i should be made such a victim of let me go and i swear never to divulge the fact that i have been in these vaults so i cannot disclose any of their secrets even if i knew them make pies said the voice eat them and be happy how many a man would envy your position withdrawn from all the struggles of existence amply provided with board and lodging and engaged in a pleasant and delightful occupation it is astonishing how you can be dissatisfied bang went the little square orifice at the top of the door and the voice was heard no more the jeering mockery of those tones however still lingered upon the ear of the unhappy prisoner and he clasped his head in his hands with a fearful impression upon his brain that he surely must be going mad you will drive me to insanity he cried already i feel a sort of slumber stealing over me for want of exercise and the confined air of these vaults hinders me from taking regular repose but now if i close an eye i shall expect to find the assassin's knife at my throat he sat for some time longer and not even the dread he had of sleep could prevent a drowsiness creeping over his faculties and this weariness could not be shaken off by any ordinary means 
until at length he sprang to his feet, and shaking himself roughly like one determined to be wide awake, he said to himself mournfully, I must do their bidding or die. Hope may be a delusion here, but I cannot altogether abandon it, and not until its faintest image has departed from my breast can I lay down to sleep and say, Let death come in any shape it may. It is welcome. With a desperate and despairing energy, he set about replenishing the furnaces of the oven, and when he had got them all in good state, he commenced manufacturing a batch of one hundred pies, which, when he had finished and placed them upon the tray, and set the machine in motion which conducted them up to the shop, he considered to be a sort of price paid for his continued existence, and flinging himself upon the ground, he fell into a deep slumber. End of chapter 23